Chapter One of Book One of Dark Hollow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording in a Dutch accent by Ernst Patinama. Dark Hollow by Anna Catherine Green. Book One The Woman in Purple. Chapter One Where is Bella? A high and narrow gate of carefully joined boards, standing ajar in a fence of the same construction. What is there in this to rouse a whole neighborhood and collect before it a group of eager, anxious, hesitating people? I will tell you. This fence is no ordinary fence, and this gate no ordinary gate nor is the fact of the latter standing a trifle open one to be lightly regarded or taken an inconsiderate advantage of for this is judge ostrander's place and any one who knows shelby or the gossip of its suburbs knows that this house of his has not opened its doors to any outsider man or woman for over a dozen years nor have his gates in saying which i include the great one in front been seen in all that time to gape at any one's instance or to stand unclosed to public intrusion no not for a moment the seclusion sort was absolute the men and women who passed and repassed this corner many times a day were as ignorant as the townspeople in general of what lay behind the grey monotonous exterior of the weather-beaten boards they so frequently brushed against the house was there of course they all knew the house or did once but there were rumours no one ever knew how they originated of another fence a second barrier standing a few feet inside the first and similar to it in all respects even to the gates which corresponded exactly with these outer and visible ones and probably were just as fully provided with bolts and bars to be sure these were reports rather than acknowledged facts but the possibility of their truth roused endless wonder and gave to the eccentricities of this well-known man a mysterious significance which lost little or nothing in the slow passage of years and now in the freshness of this summer morning without warning or any seeming reason for the change the strict habit of years has been broken into and this gate of gates is not only standing unlocked before their eyes but a woman a stranger to the town as her very act shows has been seen to enter there to enter but not come out which means that she must still be inside and possibly in the very presence of the judge where is bela why does he allow his errands but it was bela or so they have been told who left this gate ajar he the awe and terror of the town the enormous redoubtable close-mouthed negro trusted as man is seldom trusted and faithful to his trust yes up to this very hour as all must acknowledge in spite of every temptation and there had been many and alluring to disclose the secret of this home of which he was not the least interesting factor what has made him thus suddenly careless he who has never been careless before money a bribe from the woman who had entered there impossible to believe his virtue has always been so impeccable his devotion to his strange and dominating master so sturdy and so seemingly unaffected by time and chance yet what else was there to believe there stood the gate with the pebble holding it away from the post and here stood half the neighbourhood staring at that pebble and at the all but invisible crack it made where an opening had never been seen before in a fascination which had for its motif not so much the knowledge that these forbidden precincts had been invaded by a stranger as that they were open to any intruding foot that they themselves if they had courage enough might go in just as this woman had gone in and see 
why what she is seeing now the unknown unguessed reason for all these mysteries the hidden treasure or the hidden sorrow which would explain why he their first citizen the respected even revered judge of their highest court should make use of such precautions and show such unvarying determination to bar out all comers from the place he called his home it had not always been so within the memory of many there it had been an abode of cheer and good fellowship not a few of the men and women now hesitating before its portals could boast of meals taken at the judge's ample board and of evenings spent in animated conversation in the great room where he kept his books and did his writing but that was before his son left him in so unaccountable a manner before yes all were agreed on this point before that other bitter ordeal of his middle age the trial and condemnation of the man who had waylaid and murdered his best friend though the effect of these combined sorrows had not seemed to be immediate one month had been seen both though a half-year had elapsed before all sociability was lost in extreme self-absorption and a full one before he took down the picket fence which had hitherto been considered a sufficient protection to his simple grounds and put up these boards which had so completely isolated him from the rest of the world it was evident enough to the friends who recalled his look and step as he walked the streets with Algernon Etheridge on one side and his brilliant ever successful son on the other that the change now observable in him was due to the violent sundering of these two ties affections so centred wreck the lives from which they are torn and time which reconciles most men to their losses had failed to reconcile him to his grief slowly settled into confirmed melancholy and melancholy into the eccentricities of which i have spoken and upon which i must now enlarge a trifle further in order that the curiosity and subsequent action of the small group of people in whom we are interested may be fully understood and possibly in some degree pardoned judge ostrander was as i have certainly made you see a recluse of the most uncompromising type but he was such for only half his time from ten in the morning till five in the afternoon he came and went like any other citizen fulfilling his judicial duties with the same scrupulous care as formerly and with more affability indeed he showed at times and often when it was least expected a mellowness of temper quite foreign to him in his early days the admiration awakened by his fine appearance on the bench was never marred now by those quick and rasping tones of an easily disturbed temper which had given edge to his invective when he stood as pleader in the very court where he now presided as judge but away from the bench once quit of the courthouse and the town the man who attempted to accost him on his way to his carriage or sought to waylay him at his own gate had need of all his courage to sustain the rebuff his presumption incurred one more detail and i will proceed with my story the son a man of great ability who was making his way as a journalist in another city had no explanation to give of his father's peculiarities though he never came to shelby the rupture between the two if rupture it were seeming to be complete there were many who had visited him in his own place of business and put such questions concerning the judge and his eccentric manner of living as must have provoked response had the young man had any response to give but he appeared to have none either he was as ignorant as themselves of the causes which had led to his father's habit of extreme isolation or he showed powers of dissimulation hardly in accordance with the other traits of his admirable character all of which closed inquiry in this direction but left the maw of curiosity unsatisfied and unsatisfied it had remained up to this hour when through accident or was it treachery the barrier to knowledge was down 
and the question of years seemed at last upon the point of being answered end of chapter one of book one of dark hollow recording by ernst patinama chapter two of dark hollow this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org Recording by Nigel Boydell Dark Hollow by Anna Catherine Green Chapter 2 Was He Living? Was He Dead? Meantime, a fussy, talkative man was endeavouring to impress the rapidly collecting crowd with the advisability of their entering altogether and approaching the judge in a body. We can say that we felt it was our duty to follow this woman in, he argued. We don't know who she is, or what her errand is. She may mean harm. I've heard of such things. And are we going to see the judge in danger and do nothing? Oh, the woman's all right, spoke up another voice. She has a child with her. Didn't you say she had a child with her, Miss Weeks? Yes, and tell us the whole story, Miss Weeks. Some of us haven't heard it. Then if it seems our duty, as his neighbours and well wishes to go in, we'll just go in. The little woman towards whom this appeal, or shall I say command, was directed, flushed a fine colour under so many eyes. But immediately it began her ingenuous tale. She had already related it half a dozen times into as many sympathising ears. But she was not one to shirk publicity for all her retiring manners and meekness of disposition. It was to this effect. She was sitting in her front window, sewing. Everybody knew that this window faced the end of the lane in which they were then standing. The blinds were drawn, but not quite, being held in just the desired position by a string. Naturally, she could see out without being very plainly seen herself, and quite naturally too, since she had watched the same proceeding for years. She had her eyes on the gate when Bella, prompt to the minute as he always was, issued forth on his morning walk to town for the day's supplies. Always exact, always in a hurry, knowing as he did that the judge would not leave for court till his return, he had never, in all the eight years she had been sitting in that window making buttonholes, shown any hesitation in his methodical relocking of the gate and subsequent quick departure. But this morning he had neither borne himself with his usual spirit nor moved with his usual promptitude. Instead of stepping at once into the lane, he had lingered in the gateway, peering to right and left and pushing the gravel aside with his foot in a way so unlike himself that the moment he was out of sight she could not help running down the lane to see if her suspicions were correct. And they were. Not only had he left the gate unlocked, but he had done so purposely. The movement he had made with his foot had been done for the purpose of pushing into place a small pebble, which, as all could see, lay where it would best prevent the gate from closing. What could such treachery mean? And what was her neighbourly duty under circumstances so unparalleled? Should she go away, or stop to take one peep just to see that there really was another and similar fence inside this one? She had about decided that it was only proper for her to enter and make sure that all was right with the judge when she experienced that peculiar sense of being watched with which all of us are familiar, and turning quickly round saw a woman looking at her from the road, a woman all in purple, even to the veil which hid her features. A little child was with her, and the two must have stepped into the road from behind some bushes, as neither of them were anywhere in sight when she herself came running down from the corner. It was enough to startle anyone, especially as the woman did not speak, but just stood silent and watchful till Miss Weeks, in her embarrassment, began to edge away towards home, in the hope that the other would follow her example 
and so leave the place free for her return and take the little peep she had promised herself. But before she had gone far, she realized that the other was not following her, but was still standing in the same spot, watching her through a veil the like of which is not to be found in Shelby, and which in itself was enough to rouse a decent woman's suspicions. She was so amazed at this that she stepped back and attempted to address the stranger, but before she had got much further than a timid and hesitating madam, the woman, roused into action possibly by her interference, made a quick gesture suggestive of impatience, if not rebuke, and moving resolutely towards the gate Miss Weeks had so indiscreetly left unguarded, pushed it open and disappeared within, dragging the little child after her. The audacity of this act, perpetrated without apology before Miss Weeks' very eyes, was too much for that lady's equanimity. She stopped stock still, and, as she did so, beheld the gate swing heavily to, and stop an inch from the post, hindered as we know by the intervening pebble. She had scarcely got over the shock of this, when plainly from the space beyond she heard a second creaking noise, then the swinging to of another gate, followed, after a breathless moment of intense listening, by a series of more distant sounds, which could only be explained by the supposition that the house door had been reached, opened, and passed. "'And you didn't follow? I didn't dare. And she's in there still. I haven't seen her come out. Then what's the matter with you?' called a burly high-strung woman, stepping hastily from the group and laying her hand upon the gate, still standing temptingly ajar. "'It's no time for nonsense,' she announced, as she pushed it open and stepped promptly in, followed by the motley group of men and women who, if they lacked courage to lead, certainly showed willingness enough to follow. One glance, and they felt their courage rewarded. Rumour, which so often deceives, proved itself correct in this case. A second gate confronted them exactly like the first, even to the point of being held open by a pebble placed against the post, and a second fence also, built upon the same pattern as the one they had just passed through, the two forming a double barrier as mysterious to contemplate in fact as it had been in fancy. In gazing at these fences, and the canyon-like walk stretching between them, the band of curious invaders forgot their prime errand. Many were for entering this path, whose terminus they could not see for the sharp turns it took in rounding either corner. Among them was a couple of girls who had but one thought, as was evinced in their hurried whispers. "'If it looks like this in the daytime, what must it be at night?' To which the quick retort, "'I've heard that the judge walks here. Imagine it under the moon.' But whatever the mysteries of the place, a greater one awaited them beyond, and presently, realising this, they burst with one accord through the second gate into the mass of greenery, which, either from neglect or intention, masked this side of Ostrander homestead. Never before had they beheld so lawless a growth or a house so completely lost amid vines and shrubbery. So unchecked had been the spread of verdure from base to chimney that the impression made by the indistinguishable mass was one of studied secrecy and concealment. Not a window remained in view, and had it not been for some chance glimmers here and there where some small, unguarded portion of the enshrouded panes caught and reflected the sunbeams, they could not have told where they were located in these once well-known walls. Two solemn fir trees, which were all that remained of an old-time and famous group, kept guard over the untended lawn, adding their suggestion of age and brooding melancholy to the air of desolation infecting the whole place. One might be approaching a tomb, for all token that appeared of human presence. Even sound was lacking. It was like a painted scene a dream of human extinction. Instinctively, the women faltered and the men drew back. Then the very silence caused a sudden reaction, 
and with one simultaneous rush they made for the only entrance they saw and burst without further ceremony into the house a common hall and common furnishings confronted them they had entered at the side and were evidently close upon the kitchen more they could not gather for blocked as the doorway was by their crowding figures the little light which sifted in over their heads was not enough to show up detail but it was even darker in the room towards which their determined leader now piloted them here there was no light at all or if some stray glimmer forced its way through the network of leaves swathing the outer walls it was far too faint a character to reach the corners or even to make the furniture about them distinguishable halting with one accord in what seemed to be the middle of an uncarpeted floor they waited for some indication of a clear passageway to the great room where the judge would undoubtedly be found in conversation with his strange guest unless forewarned by their noisy entrance he should have risen already to meet them in that case they might expect at any minute to see his tall form emerging in anger upon them through some door at present unseen this possibility new to some but recognized from the first by others fluttered the breasts of such as were not quite impervious to a sense of their own presumption and as they stood in a close group swaying from side to side in a vain endeavour to see their way through the gloom before them the whimper of a child and the muttered ejaculations of the men testified that the general feeling was one of discontent which might very easily end in an outburst of vociferous expression but the demon of curiosity holds fast and as soon as their eyes had become sufficiently used to the darkness to notice the faint line of light marking the sill of a door directly in front of them they all plunged forward in spite of the fear i have mentioned the woman of the harsh voice and self-satisfied demeanour who had started them upon this adventure was still ahead but even she quailed when upon laying her hand upon the panel of the door she was the first to reach she felt it to be cold and knew it to be made not of wood but of iron how great must be the treasure or terrible the secret to make necessary such extraordinary precautions was it for her to push open this door and so come upon discoveries which but here her doubts were cut short by finding herself face to face with a heavy curtain instead of a yielding door the pressure of the crowd behind had precipitated her past the latter into a small vestibule which acted as an antechamber to the very room they were in search of the shock restored her self-possession bracing herself she held her place for a moment while she looked back with a finger laid on her lip the light was much better here and they could all see both the move she made and the expression which accompanied it look at this she whispered pushing the curtain inward with a quick movement her hand had encountered no resistance there was nothing between them and the room beyond but a bit of drapery now hark all of you fell almost soundlessly from her lips as she laid her own ear against the curtain and they hearkened not a murmur came from within not so much as the faintest rustle of clothing or the flutter of a withheld breath all was perfectly still too still as the full force of this fact impressed itself upon them a blankness settled over their features the significance of this undisturbed quiet was making itself felt if the two were there or if he were there alone they would certainly hear some movement voluntary or involuntary and they could hear nothing was the woman gone had she found her way out while they approached from the rear and the judge was he gone also this man of inalterable habits gone before bella's return a thing he had not been known to do in the last twelve years no this could not be yet even this supposition was not so incredible as that he should still be here and silent men like him do not hold their peace under provocation so great as the intrusion of a mob of strangers into a spot where he never anticipated seeing anybody 
nor had seen anybody but his man Bella for years. Soon they would hear his voice. It was not in nature for him to be as quiet as this in face of such audacity. Yet who could count upon the actions of an Ostrander, or reckon with the imperious whims of a man mysterious beyond all precedent? He may be there, but silent, or... A single glance would settle all. The woman drew the curtain. Sunshine, a stream of it, dazzling them almost to blindness and sending them one and all pell-mell back upon each other. However dismal the approach, here all was in brilliant light, with every evidence before them of busy life. The room was not only filled but crammed with furniture. This was the first thing they noticed. Then, as their blinking eyes became accustomed to the glare and to the unexpected confusion of tables and chairs and screens and standing receptacles for books and pamphlets and boxes labelled and padlocked, they beheld something else, something which, once seen, held the eye from further wandering and made apprehensions from which they had suffered sink into insignificance before a real and only too present terror. The judge was there, but in what a condition! From the end of the forty-foot room his seated figure confronted them, silent, staring and unmoving, with clenched fingers gripping the arms of the great chair, and head held forward, he looked like one frozen at the moment of doom. Such the expression of features usually so noble, and now almost unrecognisable, were it not for the snow of his locks and his unmistakable brow. Frozen! Not an eyelash quivered, nor was there any perceptible movement in his sturdy chest. His eyes were on their eyes, but he saw no one and down upon his head and over his whole form the sunshine poured from a large window let into the ceiling directly above him, lighting up the strained and unnatural aspect of his remarkable countenance and bringing into sharp prominence the commonplace objects cluttering the table at his elbow, such as his hat and gloves and the bundle of papers he had doubtless made ready for court. Was he living? Was he dead? stricken by the sight of so many faces in a doorway considered sacred from all intrusion? No. The emotion capable of thus transforming the features of so strong a man must have a deeper source than that. The woman was to blame for this. The audacious, the unknown, the mysteriously clad woman. Let her be found. Let her be made to explain herself and the condition into which she had thrown this good man. Indignation burst into words, and pity was beginning to voice itself in inarticulate murmurs which swelled and ebbed. No louder, no more faintly as the crowd surged forward or drew back, appalled by that moveless, breathless, or compelling figure. Indignation and pity were at their height, when the strain which held them all in one common leash was loosed by the movement of a little child. Attracted possibly by what it did not understand, or simply made fearless because of its non-comprehension of the mystery before him, a curly-haired boy suddenly escaped its mother's clutches, and, toddling up by a pathway of his own to the awesome form in the great chair, laid his little hand on the judge's rigid arm, and, looking up into his face, babbled out, "'Why don't you get up, man? I like you better up!' A breathless moment, then the horrified murmur rose here, there, and everywhere. He's dead! He's dead! And the mother, with a rush, caught the child back, and confusion began its reign, when quietly and convincingly a bluff and masculine voice spoke from the doorway behind them, and they heard, You needn't be frightened. In an hour, or a half hour, he will be the same as ever. My aunt had such attacks. They call it catalepsy. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 
of Dark Hollow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nigel Boydell. Dark Hollow by Anna Catherine Green. Chapter 3 Bella the Redoubtable. Catalepsy. A dread word to the ignorant. Imperceptibly the crowd dwindled. The most discreet among them quite content to leave the house. Others, with their curiosity inflamed anew, to poke about and peer into corners and curtained recesses while the opportunity remained theirs, and the man of whom they stood in fear sat lapsed in helpless unconsciousness. A few, and these the most thoughtful, devoted all their energies to a serious quest for the woman and child whom they continued to believe to be in hiding somewhere inside the walls she had so audaciously entered. Among these was Miss Weeks, whose importance none felt more than herself, and it was at her insistence and under her advice, for she only of all who remained had ever had a previous acquaintance with the house, that the small party decided to start their search by a hasty inspection of the front hall. As this could not be reached from the room where its owner's motionless figure sat at its grim watch, they were sidling hastily out, with eyes still turned back in awful fascination upon those other eyes which seemed to follow all their movements and yet gave no token of life, when a shout and a scramble in the passages beyond cut short their intention and held them panting and eager, each to his place. They've seen her, they found her, ran in quick whispered suggestion from lip to lip and some were for rushing to see. But Miss Weeks' trim and precise figure blocked the doorway, and she did not move. Hark! she murmured in quick admonishment. What is that other sound? Something is happening, something dreadful. What is it? It does not seem to be near here yet, but it is coming, coming. Frightened in spite of themselves, both by her manner and tone, they drew their gaze from the rigid figure in the chair, and, with bated breaths and rapidly paling cheeks, listened to the distant murmur on the far-off road, plainly to be heard, pulsing through the nearer sounds of rushing feet and chattering voices in the rooms about. What was it? They could not guess, and it was with unbounded relief they pressed forward to greet the shadowy form of a young girl hurrying towards them from the rear, with news in her face. She spoke quickly, and before Miss Weeks could frame her question, "'The woman is gone. Harry Doan saw her sliding out behind us just after we came in. She was hiding in some of the corners here, and slipped out by the kitchen way when we were not looking. He's gone to see.' But interesting as this was, the wonder of the now rapidly increasing hubbub was more so. A mob was at the gates, men, women and children, shouting, panting and making loud calls. Breathlessly, Miss Weeks cut the girl's story short. Breathlessly, she ran to the nearest window and, helped by willing hands, succeeded in forcing it up and tearing a hole in the vines, through which they, one and all, could look out in eager excitement. A motley throng of people were crowding in through the double gateway. Some one was in their grasp. Was it the woman? No. It was Bella, Bella the giant, Bella the terror of the town. But no longer a terror now, but a struggling, half-fainting figure, fighting to free itself and get in advance, despite some awful hurt which blanks his cold black features into an indescribable hue and made his great limbs falter and his gasping mouth writhe in anguish while still keeping his own and making his way by sheer force of will up the path and the two steps of entrance his body alternately sinking back or plunging forward as those in the rear or those in front got the upper hand it was an awful and terrifying sight to little miss weeks 
and, screaming loudly, she left her window and ran, scattering her small party before her like sheep, not into the near refuge of the front hall and its quiet parlours, but into the very spot towards which this mob seemed headed, the great library pulsing with its own terror, in the shape of the yet speechless and unconscious man to whom the loudest noise and the most utter silence was yet as one, and the worst struggle of human passion a blank lost in unmeaning chaos. Why this instinctive move? She could not tell. Impulse prevailed, and without a thought she flew into Judge Ostrander's presence, and, gazing wildly about, wormed her way towards a heavily carved screen guarding a distant corner, and cowered down behind it. What awaited her? What awaited the judge? As the little woman shook with terror in her secret hiding place, she felt that she had played him false, that she had no right to save herself by the violation of a privacy she could have held in awe. She was paying for her temerity now, paying for it with every terrible movement that her suspense endured. The gasping, struggling men, the frantic negro, were in the next room now. She could catch the sound of the latter's panting breath, rising above the clamour of strange entreaties and excited cries with which the air was full. Then a quick hoarse shout of, Judge! Judge! rose in the doorway, and she became conscious of the presence of a headlong, rushing force stuck midway into silence as the frozen figure of his master flashed upon the negro's eyes. Then a growl of concentrated emotion uttered almost in each ear, and the screen, which had been her refuge, was violently thrust away from before her, and in its place she held a terrible being standing over her in whose eyes, dilating under this fresh surprise, she beheld her doom, even while recognising that if she must suffer it would be simply as an obstacle to some goal at her back which she must reach, now, before he fell in his blood and died. What was his goal, as she felt herself lifted, nay, almost hurled aside? She turned to see, and found it to be a door before which the devoted Bella had now thrown himself, guarding it with every inch of his powerful but rapidly sinking body, and chattering defiance with his bloodless, quivering lips, a figure terrible in anger, sublime in purpose, and piteous in its failing energies. "'Back all of you!' he cried, and stopped, clutching at the door casing on either side to hold himself erect. "'You cannot come in here. This is the judges!' Not even his iron resolve or once unequalled physique could stand the sapping of the terrible gash which disfigured his forehead. He had been run over by an automobile in a moment of blind abstraction, and his hurt was mortal." but though his tongue refused to finish, his eye still possessed its power to awe and restrain. Though the crowd had followed him almost into the centre of the room, they felt themselves held back by the spirit of this man, who as long as he lived and breathed would hold himself a determined barrier between them and what he had been set to guard. As long as he lived and breathed, alas, that would be a little while now. Already his head, held erect by the passion of his purpose, was sinking on his breast. Already his glazing eye was losing its power of concentration, when with a final rally of his decaying strength, he started erect again, and cried out in terrible appeal, I have disobeyed the judge, and, as you see, it has killed him. Do not make me guilty of giving away his secret. Swear that you will leave this door unpassed. Swear that no one but his son shall ever turn this lock, or I will haunt you, I, Bella, man by man, till you sink in terror to your graves. Swear, swear. The last adjuration ended in a moan. His head fell forward again, and in that intense moment of complete silence they could hear the splash of his life-blood as it dropped from his forehead onto the polished boards beneath. 
Then he threw up his arms and fell in a heap to the floor. They had not been driven to answer. Wherever that great soul had gone, his ears were no longer open to mortal promise. Nor would any oath from the lip of man avail to smooth his way into the shadowy unknown. Dead! broke from little Miss Weeks as she flung herself down in reckless abandonment at his side. She had never known an agitation beyond some fluttering woman's hope she had stifled as soon as born, and now she knelt in blood. Dead! she again repeated, and there was no one this time to cry. You need not be frightened. In a few minutes he will be himself again. The master might reawaken to life, but never more the man. A solemn hush, then a mighty sigh of accumulated emotion swept from lip to lip, and the crowd of later invaders, already abashed if not terrified by the unexpected spectacle of suspended animation which confronted them from the judge's chair, shrank tumultuously back as little Miss Weeks advanced upon them, holding out her meagre arms in late defiance of the secret to save which she had just seen a man die. Let us do as he wished, she prayed. I feel myself much to blame. What right had we to come in here? The fellow was hurt. We were just bringing him home, spoke up a voice, rough with the surprise of unaccustomed feeling. If he had let us carry him, he might have been alive this minute. But he would run and struggle to keep us back. He says he killed his master. If so, his death is retribution. Don't you say so, fellows? The judge was a good man. Hush, hush, the judge is all right, admonished one of the party. He'll be waking up soon. And then, as every eye flew in fresh wonder towards the chair and its impassive occupant, the low whisper was heard. No one ever could tell from whose lips it fell. If we are ever to know this wonderful secret, now is the time before he wakes and turns us out of the house. No one in authority was present, no one representing the law, not even a doctor. Only haphazard persons from the street and a few neighbours who had not been on social terms with the judge for years and never expected to be so again. His secret, always a source of wonder to every inhabitant of Shelby, but lifted now into a matter of vital importance by the events of the day and the tragic death of the Negro. Were they to miss its solution when only a door lay between it and them, a door which they might not even have to unlock? If the judge should rouse, if from a source of superstitious terror he became an active one, how pat their excuses might be. They were but seeking a proper place, a couch, a bed on which to lay the dead man. They had been witness to his hurt, they had been witness to his death, and were they to leave him lying in his blood, to shock the eyes of his master when he came out of his long swoon? No tongue spoke these words, but the cunning visible in many an eye, and the slight start made by more than one eager foot in the direction of the forbidden door gave Miss Weeks sufficient warning of what she might expect in another moment. Making the most of her diminutive figure, such a startling contrast to the one which had just dominated there, she was about to utter an impassioned appeal to their honour, when the current of her and her thoughts, as well as the direction of her looks, was changed by a sudden sense common to all of some strange influence at work in the room, and turning, they beheld the judge upon his feet, his mind awakened, but his eyes still fixed, an awesome figure. Some thought more awesome than before, for the terror which still held him, removed from all about, was no longer passive but active, and had to do with what no man there could understand or alleviate. Death was present with them, he saw it not. Strangers were making havoc with his solitude. He was as oblivious of their presence as he had been unconscious of it before. His faculties and all his attentions were absorbed by the thought which had filled his brain when the cogs of that supple mechanism had slipped and his faculties paused inert. 
This was shown by his first question. Where is the woman? It was a cry of fear, not of mastery. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of Dark Hollow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Monica Canupi. Dark Hollows by Anna Catherine Green. Chapter Four. And where was I when all this happened? The intensity of the question, the compelling, self-forgetful passion of the man, had a startling effect on the crowd of the people huddled before him. With one accord, and without stopping to pick their way, they made for the open doorway, knocking the smaller pieces of furniture about and creating havoc generally. Some fled the house. Others stopped to peer in again from behind the folds of the curtains which had only been partially torn from its fastenings. Mrs. Weeks was the only one to stand her ground. When the room was quite cleared and the noise abated, it was a frightful experience to see how little the judge had been affected by all this hubbub of combined movement and sound. She stepped within the line of his vision and lifted her feeble and ineffectual hand in an effort to attract his attention to herself. But he did not notice her, any more than he had noticed the others. Still, looking in one direction, he cried aloud in troubled tones. She stood there! The woman stood there and I saw her! Where is she now? She is no longer in the house came a gentle reply from the only one in or out of the room courageous enough to speak. She went out when she saw us coming. We knew that she had no right to be there. That is why we intruded ourselves, sir. We did not like the looks of her, and so followed her in to prevent mischief. Ah! This expletive fell unconsciously. He seemed to be trying to adjust himself to some mental experience he could neither share with others nor explain to himself. She was here, then? A woman with a little child? It was an illusion. A... Memory was coming back, and with it a realization of his position. Stopping short, he gazed down from his great height upon the trembling little body of whose identity he had but a vague idea, and thundered out in great indignation. How dared you! How dared she! Then his mind regained its full poise. And how, even if you had the termidity to venture an entrance here, did you manage to pass my gates? They are never open. Bella sees to that. Bella. He may have observed the pallor which blanched her small, tense features at this name fell so naturally from his lips or some instinct of his own may have led him to suspect tragedy where all was so abnormally still. For, as she watched, she saw his eyes fixed up to now upon her face, leave it and pass furtively and with many hesitations from object to object toward that spot behind him where lay the source of her great terror, if not his. So lingeringly and with such dread was this done, that she could barely hold back her weak woman's screams in the intensity of her suspense. She knew just where his glances fell without following them with her own. She saw them pass the door where so many faces yet peered in. He saw them not, and creep along the wall behind, inch by inch, breathlessly and with dread, till finally, with fatal precision, they reached the point where the screen had stood, and not finding it, flew in open terror to the door it was set there to conceal, when that something else, huddled in oozing blood on the floor beneath, drew them unto itself with the irresistibleness of grim reality, and he forgot all else in the horror of the sight for which his fears, however great, had failed to prepare him. Dead. Bella dead, and lying in his own blood. The rest may have been no dream, but this was surely one, or his eyes, used to the inner visions, were playing him false. Grasping the table at his side to steady his failing limbs, he pulled himself along by its curving edge until he came almost abreast of the helpless figure which for so many years had been the embodiment of faith and unwearied service. Then, and only then, did the truth of his great misfortune burst upon his bewildered soul, 
and with a cry which tore the ears of all hearers and was never forgotten by any one there he flung himself down beside the dead negro and turning him hastily over gazed into his face was that a sob yes thus much the heart gave but the next moment the piteous fact of loss was swallowed up in the recognition of its manner and bounding to his feet with a cry killed killed at his post he confronted the one witness of his anguish of whose presence he was aware and fiercely demanded where are the wretches that have done this no single arm could have knocked down bella he has been set upon and beaten with clubs and here his thought was caught up by another and that one so fearsome and unsettling that bewilderment again followed rage and with the look of a haunted spirit he demanded in a voice made low by awe and dread of its own sound and where was i when all this happened you you were seated there murmured the little woman pointing at the great chair you were not quite quite yourself she softly explained wondering at her own composure then quickly as she saw his thoughts revert to the dead friend at his feet bella was not hurt here he was downtown when it happened but he managed to struggle home and gain this place which he tried to hold against the men who followed him he thought you were dead you sat there so rigid and so white and before he quite gave up he asked us all to promise not to let any one enter this room till your son oliver came understanding partly but not yet clear in his mind the judge sighed and stooping again straightened the faithful negro's limbs then with the sidelong look in her direction he felt in one of the pockets of the dead negro's coat and drawing out a small key held it in one hand while he fumbled in his own for another which found he became on the instance his own man again miss weeks seeing the difference in him and seeing too that the doorway was now clear of the wondering awestruck group which had previously blocked it bowed her slight body and proceeded to withdraw but the judge staying her with a gesture she waited patiently near one of the book racks against which she had stumbled to hear what he had to say i must have had an attack of some kind he calmly remarked will you be good enough to explain exactly what occurred here that i might more fully comprehend my own misfortune and the death of this faithful friend then she saw that his faculties were now fully restored and came a step forward but before she could begin her story he added this searching question was it he who let you in you and the others i think you said others was it he who unlocked my gates miss weeks sighed and betrayed fluster it was not easy to relate her story beside it was woefully incomplete she knew nothing of what had happened downtown she could only tell what had passed before her eyes but there was one thing she could make clear to him and that was how the seemingly impassable gates had been made ready for the woman's entrance and afterward taken such advantage of by herself and others a pebble had done it all a pebble placed in the gateway by bella's hands as she described this and insisted on the fact in the face of the judge's almost frenzied disclaimer she thought she saw the hair move on his forehead bella a traitor and in the interest of this woman who had fronted him from the other end of the room at the moment consciousness had left him evidently this intrusive little body did not know bella or his story or why should interruption come then why was he stopped when in the passion of the moment he might have let fall some word of enlightenment which would have eased the agitated curiosity of the whole town miss weeks often asked herself this question and bewailed the sudden access of sounds in the rooms without which proclaimed the entrance of the police and put a new strain upon the judge's faculty of self-control and attention to one matter in hand the commonplaces of the official inquiry were about to supersede the play of a startled spirit struggling with problem of whose complexity he had received but a glimpse end of chapter four dark hollows by anna katherine green chapter five of dark hollow this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Monica Canupi. Dark Hollows by Anne Catherine Green. Chapter 5. The library again, but how changed! Evening light now instead of blazing sunshine, and evening light so shaded that the corners seemed far and the many articles of furniture, cumbering the spaces between, larger for the shadows in which they stood hidden. Perhaps the man who sat there in company with the judge regretted this. Perhaps he would have preferred to see more perfectly the portion of the room where Bella had taken his stand and finally fallen. It would have been interesting to note whether the screen had been replaced before the mysterious door which this most devoted servant had protected to his last gasp. Curiosity is admissible, even in a man, when the cause is really great. But from the place where he sat there were no getting any possible view of that part of the wall or anything connected with it, and so, with every appearance of satisfaction at being allowed in the room at all, Sergeant Doolittle, from headquarters, drank the judge's wine and listened for the judge's command. These were slow in coming, and they were unexpected when they came. Sergeant, I have lost a faithful servant under circumstances which have called an unfortunate attention to my house. I should like to have this place guarded, carefully guarded, you understand, from any and all intrusions till I can look about me and secure protection of my own. May I rely upon the police to do this, beginning to-night at an early hour? There are loiterers already at the corner and in front of the two gates. I am not accustomed to these attentions, and I ask to have my fence cleared. Two men are already detailed for the job, Your Honor. I heard the order given just as I left headquarters. The judge showed small satisfaction. Indeed, in his silence there was a hint of something like displeasure. This surprised Sergeant Doolittle, and led him to attempt to read its cause in his host's countenance. But the shade of the lamp intervened too completely, and he had to be content to wait till the judge chose to speak, which he presently did, though not in the exact tones the sergeant expected. Two men! Couldn't I have three one for each gate, and one to patrol the fence separating these grounds from the adjoining lot. The sergeant hesitated. He felt an emotion of wonder, a sense of something more nearly approaching the uncanny than was usual to his matter-of-fact mind. He had heard, often enough, what store the judge set on his privacy, and of the extraordinary measures he had taken to ensure it, but that a man, even if he aped the hermit, should consider three men necessary to hold the public away from a two hundred and fifty foot lot argued apprehensions of a character verging on the ridiculous but he refrained from expressing his surprise and replied after a minute of thought if two men are not enough to ensure you a quiet sleep you shall have three or four or even more judge ostrander do you want one of them to stay inside that might do the business better than a dozen out no why bella lies above ground we want no third here when he is buried i may call upon you for a special to watch my room door but it's outside protection we're talking now only who is to protect me against your men what do you mean by that your honor they are human are they not they have instincts of curiosity like the rest of us how can I be made sure that they won't yield to the temptation of their position and climb the fences they are detailed to guard? And would that be so fatal to your peace, Judge? A smile tempered the suggestion. It would be a breach of trust which would greatly disturb me. I want nobody on my grounds, nobody at all. Has not my long life of solitude within these walls sufficiently proved this? I want to feel that these men of yours would no more climb my fence than they would burst into my house without a warrant. Judge, I will be one of the men. You can trust me. Thank you, Sergeant. I appreciate the favor. I shall rest now as quietly as any man can who has met with great loss. The coroner's inquiry has decided that the injuries which Bella received in the street were of the fatal character and would have killed him within an hour. 
even if he had not exhausted his strength in the effort he made to return home and die in my presence but i shall always suffer from regret that i was not in a condition to receive his last sigh he was a man in a thousand one seldom sees his like white or black he was a very powerfully built man it took a sixty horsepower racing machine going at a high rate of speed to kill him a spasm of grief or unavailing regret crossed the judge's face as his head sank back again against the high back of his chair enough said he tread softly when you go by the sofa on which he lies will you fill your glass again sergeant the sergeant declined not if my watch is to be effective to-night he smiled and rose to depart the judge grown suddenly thoughtful rapped with his fingertips on the table edge he had not yet risen to show his visitor out i should like to ask a question he finally observed motioning the other to reseat himself you are not at the inquiry this afternoon and may not know that just as bella and the crowd about him turned this corner they ran into a woman leading a small child who stopped the whole throng in order to address him no one heard what she said and no one could give any information as to who she was or in what direction she vanished but i saw that woman myself earlier she was in this house she was in this room she came as far as that open space just inside the doorway i can describe her and will if you will consent to look for her it is to be a money transaction sergeant and if she is found and no stir made and no talk started among the force i will pay all that you think it right to demand let me hear her description your honor the judge who had withdrawn into the shadow considered for a moment then said i cannot describe her features for she was heavily veiled neither can i describe her figure except to say that she is tall and slender but her dress i remember to the last detail though i am not usually so observant she wore purple not an old woman's purple but a soft shade which did not take from her youth there was something floating around her shoulders of the same color and on her arms were long gloves such as you see our young ladies wear the child did not seem to belong to her though she held her tightly by the hand i mean by that that its clothes were of a coarser material than hers and perhaps a little soiled the child wore a hat i do not remember it in age it appeared to be about six or that was the impression i received before the sergeant who had been watching the speaker closely leaned forward with hasty inquiring glance expressive of something like consternation was the judge falling into a con unconsciousness was he destined to witness in this solitary meeting a return of the phenomena which had so startled the intruding populace that morning no or if he had been witness to something of the kind it was for a moment only for the eyes which had gone blank had turned his way again and only a disconnected expression which fell from the judge's lips showed that his mind had been wandering it's not the same but another one that's all inconsequent words but the sergeant meant to remember them for with their utterance a change passed over the judge and his manner which had been constrained and hurried during his attempted description became at once more natural and therefore more courteous do you think you can find her with such insufficient data a woman dressed in purple leading a little child without any hat judge i not only feel sure i can find her but i think she is found already do you remember the old tavern on the rushville road i believe they called it an inn now or some such fancy name the judge sat quiet but the sergeant who dared not peer too closely noticed a sudden constriction in the fingers of the hand with which his host fingered a paper cutter lying on the table between them the one where i respect your hesitation judge yes the one run by the man you sentenced a gesture had stopped him he waited respectfully for the judge's next words they came quickly and with stern and solemn emphasis for a hideous and wholly unprovoked crime why do you mention it and and his tavern because of something i have lately heard in its connection 
you know that the old house has been all made over since that time and run as a place of resort for the automobilist in search of a light refreshment the proprietor's name is yardley we have nothing against him the place is highly respectable but it harbors a boarder a permanent one i believe who has occasioned no little comment no one has ever seen her face unless it is the landlord's wife she has all her meals served in her room, and when she goes out she wears the purple dress and purple veil that you've been talking about. Perhaps she's your visitor of today. Hadn't I better find out? Has she a child? Is she a mother? I haven't heard of any child, but Mrs. Yardley has seven. The judge's hand withdrew from the table, and for an instant the room was so quiet that you could hear some far-off clock ticking out the minutes. Then Judge Ostender rose and in a peremptory tone said to-morrow after you hear from me again make no move to-night let me feel that all your energies are devoted to securing my privacy the sergeant who had sprung to his feet at the same instant as the judge cast a last look about him curiosity burning in his heart and a sort of desperate desire to get all he could out of his present opportunity for he felt absolutely sure that he would never be allowed to enter this room again. But the arrangement of light was such as to hold in shadow all but the central portion of the room, and this central portion held nothing out of the common, nothing to explain the mysteries of the dwelling or the apprehensions of its suspicious owner. With a sigh, the sergeant dropped his eyes from the walls he could barely distinguish, and following Judge Ostrander's lead, passed with him under the torn folds of the curtain and through the narrow vestibule whose door was made of iron into the room where in a stronger blaze of light than they had left lay the body of the dead negro awaiting the last rites would the judge pass this body or turn away from it toward a door leading front the sergeant had come in at the rear but he greatly desired to go out the front as this would give him so much more additional knowledge of the house unexpectedly to himself the judge's intentions were in the direction of his own wishes he was led front and entering an old-fashioned hall dimly lighted passed a staircase and two closed doors both of which gave him the impression of having been shut upon a past it had pleasured no one to revive in many years beyond them was the great front door of the colonial style and workmanship a fine specimen once but greatly disfigured now by the bolts and bars that had been added to it in satisfaction of the judge's idea of security. Many years had passed since Judge Ostrander had played the host, but he had not lost a sense of its obligations. It was for him to shoot the bolts and lift the bars, but he went about it so clumsily and with such evident aversion to the task that the sergeant instinctively sprang to help him. "'I shall miss Bella at every turn,' remarked the judge, turning with a sad smile as he finally pulled the door open. This is an unaccustomed effort for me. Excuse my awkwardness. Something in his attitude, something in the way he lifted his hand to push back a fallen lock from his forehead, impressed itself upon the sergeant's mind so vividly that he always remembered the judge as he appeared to him at that minute. Certainly there were few men like him in the country, and none in his own town of a commanding personality by reason of his height his features were cast to express his mental attributes and enforce attention and the incongruity between his dominating figure and the apprehensions which he displayed in these multiplied and extraordinary arrangements for personal security was forcible enough to arouse any man's interest the sergeant was so occupied by the mystery of the man and the mystery of the house that they had passed through the first gate which the judge had unlocked without much difficulty before he realized that there still remained something of interest for him to see and to talk about later the two dark openings on either side raised questions which the most unimaginative mind would feel glad to have here explained ere the second gate swung open and he found himself again in the street he had built up more than one theory in explanation of this freak of parallel fences with the strip of gloom between would he have felt the suggestion of the spot still more deeply had it been given him to see the anxious and hesitating figure which immediately upon his departure entered this dark maze and with feeling hands and cautious step wound its way from corner to corner 
now stopping abruptly to listen, now shrinking from some imaginary presence, a shadow among shadows, till it stood again between the gates from which it had started. Possibly, even the hardiest of men respond to the unusual, and prove themselves not ungifted with imagination when brought face to face with that for which their experience furnishes no precedence. End of chapter 5 Recorded by Monica Canupi Chapter 6 of Dark Hollow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dark Hollow by Anna Catherine Green. Chapter 6 Across the Bridge. It was ten o'clock, not later, when the judge re entered his front door. He was alone absolutely alone as he had never been since that night of long ago when with the inner fence completed and the gates all locked he turned to the great negro at his side and quietly said we are done with the world bella are you satisfied to share this solitude with me and bella had replied night and day your honor and when you're not here when you are at court to bear it alone and now this faithful friend was dead and it was he who must bear it alone alone how could he face it he sought for no answer nor did he allow himself to dwell for one minute on the thought there was something else he must do first do this very night if possible taking down his hat from the rack he turned and went out again this time carefully locking the door behind him also the first gate but he stopped to listen before lifting his hand to the second one a sound of steady breathing accompanied by a few impatient movements came from the other side a man was posted there within a foot of the gate noiselessly the judge recoiled and made his way around to the other set of gates here all was quiet enough and sliding quickly out he cast a hasty glance up and down the lane and seeing nothing more alarming than the back of a second officer lounging at the corner pulled the gate quietly to and locked it he was well down the road toward the ravine before the officer turned the time has now come for giving you a clearer idea of this especial neighborhood judge ostrander's house situated as you all know at the juncture of an unimportant road with the main highway had in its rear three small houses two of them let and one still unrented Farther on, but on the opposite side of the way, stood a very old dwelling in which there lived and presumably worked a solitary woman, the sole and final survivor of a large family. Beyond was the ravine, cutting across the road and terminating it. This ravine merits some description. It was a picturesque addition to the town through which it cut at the point of greatest activity, with the various bridges connecting the residence portion with the lower business streets we have nothing to do but there was a nearer one of which the demands of my story necessitate a clear presentation this bridge was called long and spanned the ravine and its shallow stream of water not a quarter of a mile below the short road or lane we have just seen judge ostrander enter between it and this lane a narrow path ran amid the trees and bushes bordering the ravine this path was seldom used but when it was it acted as a shortcut to a certain part of the town mostly given over to factories indeed the road of which this bridge formed a part was called factory on this account starting from the main highway a half mile or so below ostrander lane it ran diagonally back to the bridge where it received a turn which sent it south and then east again toward the lower town a high bluff rose at this point which made the farther side of the ravine much more imposing than the one on the near side where the slope was gradual this path and even the bridge itself were almost wholly unlighted they were seldom used at night seldom used at any time but it was by this route the judge elected to go into town not for the pleasure of the walk 
as was very apparent from the extreme depression of his manner, but from some inward necessity which drove him on, against his wishes, possibly against his secret misgivings. He had met no one in his short walk down the lane, but for all that he paused before entering the path just mentioned to glance back and see if he were being watched or followed. When, satisfied that he was not, he looked up, from the solitary waste where he stood, to the cheerless heavens, and sighed, and then forward into the mass of impenetrable shadow that he must yet traverse, and shuddered as many another had shuddered ere beginning this walk. For it was near the end of this path, in full sight of the bridge he must cross, that his friend, Algernon Etheridge, had been set upon and murdered so many years before, and the shadow of this ancient crime still lingered over this spot, deepening its natural gloom even for minds much less sympathetic and responsive to spiritual influences than Judge Ostrander. But this shudder, whether premonitory or just the involuntary tribute of friend to friend, did not prevent his entering the path or following its line of shadow as it rose and dipped in its course down the gorge. I have spoken of the cheerlessness of the heavens. It was one of those nights when the sky, piled thick with hurrying clouds, hangs above one like a pall, but the moon hidden behind those rushing masses was at its full, and the judge soon found that he could see his way better than he had anticipated better than was desirable perhaps he had been on the descent of the path for some little time now and could not be far from the more level ground which marked the approach to long bridge determined not to stop or to cast one faltering look to right or left he hurried on with his eyes fixed upon the ground and every nerve braced to resist the influence of the place and its undying memories but with the striking of his foot against the boards of the bridge, nature was too much for him, and his resolve vanished. Instead of hastening on, he stopped, and having stopped, paused long enough to take in all the features of the scene and any changes which time might have wrought. He even forced his shrinking eyes to turn and gaze upon the exact spot where his beloved Algernon had been found, with his sightless eyes turned to the sky. This latter place, singular in that it lay open to the opposite bank without the mask of bush or tree to hide it, was an immediate proximity to the end of the bridge he had attempted to cross. It bore the name of Dark Hollow, and hollow and dark it looked in the universal gloom. But the power of its associations was upon him, and before he knew it, he was retracing his steps as though drawn by a magnetism he could not resist, till he stood within this hollow, and possibly on the very foot of ground where the mere memory of which he had recoiled for years. A moment of contemplation, a sigh, such as only escapes the bursting heart in moments of extreme grief or desolation, and he tore his eyes from the ground to raise them slowly but with deep meaning to where the high line of trees on the opposite side of the ravine met the grey vault of the sky. Darkness piled itself against darkness, but with a difference to one who knew all the undulations of this bluff and just where it ended in the sheer fall which gave a turn to the road at the farther end of the bridge. But it was not upon the mass of undistinguishable treetops or the line they made against the sky that his gaze lingered. It was on something more material, something which rose from the brow of the hill in stark and curious outline, not explainable in itself, but clear enough to one who had seen its shape by daylight. Judge Ostrander had thus seen it many times in the past, and knew just where to look for the one remaining chimney and solitary gable of a house, struck many years before by lightning and left a grinning shell to mock the eye of all who walked this path or crossed this bridge. Black amid blackness, with just the contrast of its straight lines to the curve of natural objects about it, it commanded the bluff, 
summoning up memories of an evil race cut short in a moment by an outraged providence and judge ostrander marking it found himself muttering aloud as he dragged himself slowly away why should time so destructive elsewhere leave one stone upon another of this accursed ruin alas heaven has no answer for such questions when he reached the middle of the bridge he stopped short to look back at dark hollow and utter in a smothered groan which would not be repressed a name by which all the rights of the spot should have been algernon's but was not the utterance of this name seemed to startle him for with a shuddering look around he hastily traversed the rest of the bridge and took the turn about the hill to where factory road branched off towards the town here he stopped again and for the first time revealed the true nature of his destination for when he moved on again it was to take the road along the bluff and not the one leading directly into town this meant a speedy passing by the lightning-struck house he knew this of course and evidently shrunk from the ordeal for once up the hill and on the level stretch above he resolutely forbore to cast a glance at its dilapidated fence and decayed gate-posts had he not done this had his eyes followed the long line of the path leading from these toppling posts to the face of the ruin he would have been witness to a strange sight for gleaming through the demolished heart of it between the chimney on the one side and the broken line of the gable on the other could be seen the half circle of the moon suddenly released from the clouds which had hitherto enshrouded it a weird sight to be seen only when all conditions favored it was to be seen here to-night but the judge's eye was bent another way and he passed on unnoting the ground was high along this bluff almost fifty feet above the level of the city upon which he had just turned his back of stony formation and much exposed to the elements it had been considered an undesirable site by builders and not a house was to be seen between the broken shell of the one he had just left and the long low brilliantly illuminated structure ahead for which he was evidently making the sight of these lights and of the trees by which the house was surrounded suggested festival and caused a qualm of indecision to momentarily disturb him in his purpose but this purpose was too strong and the circumstances too urgent for him to be deterred by anything less potent than a stroke of lightning he rather increased his pace than slackened it and was rewarded by seeing lamp after lamp go out as he approached the pant of a dozen motors the shouting of various farewells and then the sudden rushing forth of a long line of automobiles proclaimed that the fate of the day was about over and that peace and order would soon prevail again in claymore inn without waiting for the final one to pass the judge slid around to the rear and peered in at the kitchen door if mrs yardley were the woman he supposed her to be from the sergeant's description she would be just then in the thick of the dishwashing, and it was Mrs. Yardley he wished to see. Three women were at work in this busiest of scenes, and deciding at a glance which was the able mistress of the house, he approached the large, pleasant, and commanding figure, piling plates at the farther end of the room, and courteously remarked, Mrs. Yardley, I believe. The answer came quickly, and not without a curious smile of constraint. Oh, no mrs yardley is in the entry behind bowing his thanks he stepped in the direction named just as the three women's heads came simultaneously together there was reason for their whispers his figure his head his face were all unusual and at that moment highly expressive and coming as he did out of the darkness his presence had an uncanny effect upon their simple minds they had been laughing before they ceased to laugh now why meanwhile george ostrander was looking about him for mrs yardley the quiet figure of a squat little body blocked up a certain doorway i am looking for mrs yardley he ventured the little figure turned he was conscious of two very piercing eyes being raised to his and heard in shaking accents which yet were not the accents of weakness the surprised ejaculation judge ostrander 
Next minute they were together in a small room with the door shut behind them. The energy and decision of this might of a woman were surprising. I was going to you in the morning, she panted in her excitement, to apologize, she respectfully finished. Then said he, it was your child who visited my house today. She nodded. Her large head was somewhat disproportioned to her short and stocky body, but her glance and manner were not unpleasing. There was a moment of silence, which she hastened to break. Peggy is very young. It was not her fault. She is so young she doesn't even know where she went. She was found loitering around the bridge, a dangerous place for a child. But we've been very busy all day, and she was found there and taken along by, by the other person. I hope that you will excuse it, sir. Was she giving the judge an opportunity to recover from his embarrassment, or was she simply making good her own cause? Whatever impulse animated her, the result was favorable to both. Judge Ostrander lost something of his strained look, and it was no longer difficult for her to meet his eye. Nevertheless, what he had to say came with a decided abruptness. Who is the woman, Mrs. Yardley? That's what I've come to learn, and not to complain of your child. The answer struck him very strangely, although he saw nothing to lead him to distrust her candor. I don't know Judge Ostrander. She calls herself Averill, but that doesn't make me sure of her. You wonder that I should keep a lodger, about whom I have any doubts, but there are times when Mr. Yardley uses his own judgment, and this is one of the times. The woman pays well and promptly, she added in a lower tone. Her status, is she maid, wife, or widow? Oh, she says she is a widow, and I see every reason to believe her. A slight grimness in her manner, the smallest possible edge to her voice, led the judge to remark, she's good-looking, I suppose. A laugh, short and unmusical, but not without a biting humor, broke unexpectedly from the landlady's lips. If she is, he doesn't know it. He hasn't seen her. Not seen her? No. Her veil was very thick the night she came, and she did not lift it as long as he was by. If she had, well, what? I'm afraid that he wouldn't have exacted as much from her as he did. She's one of those women. Don't hesitate, Mrs. Yardley. I'm thinking how to put it. Who has her will of your sex, I might say? Now I'm not. Pretty? Not like a girl, sir. She's old enough to show fade, but I don't believe that a man would mind that. She has a look, a way, that even women feel. You may judge, sir, if we old stagers at the business have been willing to take her in and keep her at any price. A woman who won't show her face, except to me, and who will not leave her room without her veil, and then only go for walks in places where no one else wants to go. She must have some queer sort of charm to overcome all scruples. But she's gone too far today. She shall leave the inn tomorrow. I promise you that, sir, whatever Samuel says. But sit down, sit down. You look tired, Judge. Is there anything you would like? Shall I call Samuel? No, I'm not much used to walking. Besides, I have had a great loss today. My man, Bella. Then, with his former abruptness, have you no idea who this Mrs. Averill is, or why she broke into my house? There's but one explanation, sir. I've been thinking about it ever since I got wind of where she took my Peggy. The woman is not responsible. She has some sort of mania. Why else should she go into a strange gate? just because she saw it open. She hasn't confided in you? No, sir. I haven't seen her since she brought Peggy back. We've had this big automobile party, and I thought my reckoning with her would keep. I heard about what had happened at your place from the man who brought us fruit. Mrs. Yardley, you've seen this woman's face. Yes, I've seen her. Describe it more particularly. I can't. She has brown hair, brown eyes, and a skin as white as milk but that don't describe her. Lots of women have all that. No, it doesn't describe her. His manner seemed to pray for further details, but she stared back unresponsive. In fact, she felt quite helpless. With a sigh of impatience, he resorted again to question. You speak of her as a stranger. 
are you quite sure that she is a stranger to shelby you've not been so very many years here and her constant wearing of a veil indoors and out is very suspicious so i'm beginning to think and there is something else judge which makes me suspect you may be quite correct about her not being an entire stranger here she knows this house too well the judge started the strength of his self-control had relaxed a bit and he showed in the look he cast about him what it had cost him to enter these doors it is not the same of course continued mrs yardley affected in a peculiar way by the glimpse she had caught of the other's emotion unnatural and incomprehensible as it appeared to her the place has been greatly changed but there is a certain portion of the old house left which only a person who knew it as it originally was would be apt to find and yesterday on going into one of these remote rooms i came upon her sitting in one of the windows looking out how she got there or why she went i cannot tell you she didn't choose to tell me and i didn't ask but i've not felt real easy about her since excuse me mrs yardley it may be a matter of no moment but do you mind telling me where this room is it's on the top floor sir and it looks out over the ravine perhaps she was spying out the path to your house the judge's face hardened he felt baffled and greatly disturbed but he spoke kindly enough when he again addressed mrs yardley i am as ignorant as you of this woman's personality and of her reasons for intruding into my presence this morning but there is something so peculiar about this presumptuous attempt of hers at an interview that i feel impelled to inquire into it more fully even if i have to approach the only source of information capable of giving me what i want that is herself mrs yardley will you procure me an immediate interview with this woman i am sure that you can be relied upon to do this and to do it with caution you have the countenance of a woman unusually discreet the subtle flattery did its work she was not as blind to the fact that he had introduced it for that very purpose but it was not in her nature to withstand any appeal from so exalted a source however made lifting her eyes fearlessly to his she responded earnestly i am proud to serve you i will see what i can do will you wait here for just a few minutes he bowed quietly enough but he was very restless when once he found himself alone those few minutes of waiting seemed interminable to him would this woman come was she as anxious to see him now as she had been in the early morning much depended on her mood but more on the nature of the errand which had taken her into his house if that errand were a vital one he would soon hear her steps indeed he was hearing her steps now and he was sure of it those of mrs yardley were quicker shorter more businesslike these now advancing through the corridor lingered as if held back by dread or a fateful indecision he would fain hasten them but discretion forbade they faltered turned then in an instant all hesitation was lost in purpose and they again advanced this time to the threshold judge ostrander had just time to brace himself to meet the unknown when the door fell back and the woman of the morning appeared in the opening end of chapter six chapter seven of dark hollow this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Dark Hollow by Anna Catherine Green Chapter 7 With Her Veil Down On the instant he recognized that no common interview lay before him. She was still the mysterious stranger, and she still wore her veil, a fact all the more impressive that it was no longer the accompaniment of a hat, but flung freely over her bare head. He frowned as he met her eyes through this disguising gauze. This attempt at an incognito for which there seemed to be no adequate reason had a theatrical look wholly out of keeping with the situation. But he made no allusion to it, nor was the bow with which he acknowledged her presence and ushered her into the room other than courteous. Nevertheless, 
She was the first to speak. Oh, "'This is very good of you, Judge Ostrander,' she remarked, in a voice both cultured and pleasant. "'I could hardly have hoped for this honour. After what happened this morning at your house, I feared that my wish for an interview would not only be disregarded by you, but that you would utterly refuse me the privilege of seeing you. I own to feeling greatly relieved. Such consideration shown to a stranger argues a spirit of unusual kindliness. A tirade. He simply bowed. Or perhaps I am mistaken in my supposition, she suggested, advancing a step, but no more. Perhaps I am no stranger to you. Perhaps you know my name. Averill? No. She paused, showing her disappointment quite openly. Then, drawing up a chair, she leaned heavily on its back, saying in low, monotonous tones from which the former eager thrill had departed, I see that the intended marriage of your son has made very little impression upon you. Aghast for the moment, this was such a different topic from the one he expected, the judge regarded her in silence before remarking, I have known nothing of it. My son's concerns are no longer mine. If you have broken into my course of life for no other purpose than to discuss the affairs of Oliver Ostrander, I must beg you to excuse me. I have nothing to say in his connection to you, or to anyone. Is the breach between you so deep as that? This she said in a low tone, and more as if to herself than to him. Then, with a renewal of courage indicated by the steadying of her form and a spirited uplift of her head, she observed with a touch of command in her voice, "'There are some things which must be discussed whatever our wishes or preconceived resolves. The separation between you and Mr. Oliver Ostrander cannot be so absolute, since whatever your cause of complaint, you are still his father, and he your son, that you will allow his whole life's happiness to be destroyed for the lack of a few words between yourself and me.' He had made his bow, and he now proceeded to depart severity in his face and an implacable resolution in his eye but some impulse made him stop some secret call from deeply hidden possibly unrecognized affections gave him the will to say a plea uttered through a veil is like an unsigned message it partakes too much of the indefinite will you lift your veil madam in a minute she reassured him the voice can convey truth as certainly as the features I will not deny you a glimpse of the latter after you have heard my story. Will you hear it, Judge? Issues of no common importance hang upon your decision. I entreat, but no. You are a just man. I will rely upon your sense of right. If your son's happiness fails to appeal to you, let that of a young and innocent girl, lovely as few are lovely, either in body or mind. Yourself, madam? No. My daughter, Oliver Ostrander, has done us that honour, sir. He had every wish and had made every preparation to marry my child when— Shall I go on? You may. It was shortly said, but a burden seemed to fall from her shoulders at its utterance. Her whole graceful form relaxed swiftly into its natural curves, and an atmosphere of charm from this moment enveloped her, which justified the description of Mrs. Yardley— even without a sight of the features, she still kept hidden. "'I am a widow, sir,' thus she began with studied simplicity. "'With my one child I have been living in Detroit these many years, ever since my husband's death, in fact. We are not unliked there, nor have we lacked respect. When some six months ago your son, who stands high in everyone's regard, as befits his parentage and his varied talents, met my daughter and fell seriously in love with her. No one, so far as I know, criticized his taste or found fault with his choice. I was happy after many years of anxiety, for I idolized my child, and I had suffered from many apprehensions as to her future. Not that I had the right to be happy. I see that now. A woman with a secret and my heart held a woeful and desperate one, should never feel that that secret lacks power to destroy her, because it is long laid quiescent. 
I thought my child safe, and rejoiced as any woman might rejoice. And as I would rejoice now, if fate were to obliterate that secret, and emancipate us all from the horror of it. She paused, waiting for some acknowledgment of his interest, but not getting it, and went on bitterly enough, for his stolidity was a very great mystery to her. And she was safe, to all appearance, up to the very morning of her marriage, the marriage of which you say you had received no intimation, though Oliver seems a very dutiful son. Madam, the hoarseness of his tone possibly increased its peremptory character, I really must ask you to lay aside your veil. It was a rebuke, and she felt it to be so, but though she blushed behind her veil, she did not remove it. Pardon me, she begged, and very humbly, but I cannot yet. You will see why later. Let me reveal my secret first. I am coming to it, Judge Ostrander. I cannot keep it back much longer. He was too much of a gentleman to insist upon his wishes, but she saw by the gloom of his eye and a certain nervous twitching of his hands that it was not from mere impassiveness that his features had acquired their rigidity. Smitten with compunction, she altered her tone into one more deprecatory. "'My story will best be told,' she now said, "'if I keep all personal element out of it. "'You must imagine Ruther, dressed in her wedding finery, "'waiting for her bridegroom to take her to church. "'We were sitting, she and I, in our little parlour, "'watching the clock, for it was very near the hour. "'At times her face turned toward me for a brief moment, "'and I felt all the pang of motherhood again.' for her loveliness was not of this earth, but of a land where there is no sin. No. There. The memory was a little too much for me, sir. But I'll not transgress again. The future holds too many possibilities of suffering for me to dwell upon the past. She was lovely, and her loveliness sprang from a pure hope. We will let that suffice and what I dreaded was not what happened, inexcusable as such blindness and presumption may appear in a woman who has had her troubles and seen the desperate side of life. A carriage had driven up, and we heard his step, but it was not the step of a bridegroom, Judge Ostrander, nor was the gentleman he left behind him at the curb the friend who was to stand up with him. To Ruther, innocent of all deception, this occasioned only surprise, but to me... It meant the end of Ruther's marriage and of my own hopes. I shrank from the ordeal and stood with my back half turned when, dashed by his own emotions, he bounded into our presence. One look my way, and his question was answered before he put it. Judge Ostrander, the name under which I had lived in Detroit was not my real one. I had let him court and all but marry my daughter, without warning him in any way of what this deception on my part covered. But others, one other I have reason now to believe, had detected my identity under the altered circumstances of my new life, and surprised him with the news at this late hour. We are, Judge Ostrander, you know who we are. This is not the first time you and I have seen each other face to face. And lifting up a hand, trembling with emotion, she put aside her veil. End of chapter 7「Eight of Dark Hollow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dark Hollow by Anna Catherine Green. Chapter Eight With Her Veil Lifted. Mrs. You recognize me. Too well. The tone was deep with meaning, but there was no accusation in it, nor was there any note of relief. It was more as if some hope, deeply and perhaps unconsciously cherished, had suffered a sudden and complete extinction. The change this made in him was too perceptible for her not to observe it. The shadow lying deep in her eyes now darkened her whole face. 
She had tried to prepare him for this moment, tried to prepare herself. But who can prepare the soul for the return of old troubles, or make other than startling the resurrection of a ghost laid, as men thought, forever? "'You see that it was no fault of my own I was trying to hide,' she finally remarked in her rich and sympathetic voice. "'Put back your veil.' It was all he said. Trembling, she complied, murmuring as she fumbled with its folds. "'Disgrace to an Ostrander. I know that I was mad to risk it for a moment. Forgive me for the attempt, and listen to my errand. Oliver was willing to marry my child, even after he knew the shame it would entail. But Reuther would not accept the sacrifice. When she learned, as she was obliged to now, that her father had not only been sentenced to death for the worst crime in the calendar, but had suffered the full penalty, leaving only a legacy of eternal disgrace to his wife and innocent child, she showed a spirit becoming a better parentage. In his presence, and in spite of his dissuasions, for he acted with all the nobility one might expect, she took off her veil with her own hands, and laid it aside with a look expressive of eternal renunciation. She loves him, sir, and there is no selfishness in her heart, and never has been. For all her frail appearance and the mildness of her temper, she is like flint, where principle is involved, or the welfare of those she loves is at stake. My daughter may die from shock or shame, but she will never cloud your son's prospects with the obloquy which has settled over her own. Judge Ostrander, I am not worthy of such a child, but such she is. If John— We will not speak his name, broke in Judge Ostrander, assuming a peremptory bearing quite unlike his former one of dignified reserve. I should like to hear instead your explanation of how my son became inveigled into an engagement of which you, if no one else, knew the preposterous nature. Judge Ostrander, you do right to blame me. I should never have given my consent, never. But I thought our past so completely hidden, our identity so entirely lost under the accepted name of Averill. You thought, he towered over her in his anger. He looked and acted as in the old days when witnesses cowered under his eye and voice. Say that you knew, madam, that you planned this unholy trap for my son. You had a pretty daughter, and you saw to it that she came under his notice. Nay, more, ignoring the claims of decency, you allowed the folly to proceed, if you did not help it on, in your misguided ambition to marry your daughter well. Judge Ostrander, I did not plan their meeting, nor did I at first encourage his addresses. Not till I saw the extent of their mutual attachment did I yield to the event and accept the consequences. But I was wrong, wholly wrong, to allow him to visit her a second time. But now the mischief is done. Judge Ostrander was not listening. I have a question to put you, said he when he realized that she had ceased speaking. Oliver was never a fool. When he was told who your daughter was, what did he say of the coincidence which made him the lover of the woman against whose father his father had uttered a sentence of death? Didn't he marvel and call it extraordinary? A work of the devil? Possibly. But if he did, it was not in any conversation he had with me. Detroit is a large city, and must possess hundreds of sweet young girls within its borders. Could he contemplate without wonder the fact that he had been led to the door of the one above all others between whom and himself fate had set such an insurmountable barrier? He must have been struck deeply by the coincidence. He must have been, madam. Astonished at his manner, at the emphasis he placed upon this point, which seemed to her so much less serious than many others, she regarded him doubtfully, before saying, I was, if he was not. From the very first I wondered, but I got used to the fact during the five months of his courtship, and I got used to another fact, too, that my secret was safe so far as it ran the risk of being endangered by a meeting with yourself. 
Mr. Ostrander made it very plain to us that we need never expect to see you in Detroit. He did. Did he offer any explanation for this lack of, uh, of sympathy between us? Never. It was a topic he forbore to enter into, and I think he only said that he did to prevent any expectations on our part of ever seeing you. And your daughter? Was he as close-mouthed in speaking of me to her as he was to you? I have no doubt of it. Reuther betrays no knowledge of you or of your habits, and has never expressed but one curiosity in your regard. As you can imagine what that is, I will not mention it. You are at liberty to. I have listened to much, and can well listen to a little more. Judge, she is of a very affectionate nature, and her appreciation of your son's virtues is very great. Though her conception of yourself is naturally a very vague one, it is only to be expected that she should wonder how you could live so long without a visit from Oliver. Expectant as he was of this reply, and resolved as he was to hear it unmoved, he had miscalculated his strength or his power of concealment, for he turned aside immediately upon hearing it, and walked away from her toward the further extremity of the room. Covertly she watched him, first through her veil, and then with it partly removed. She did not understand his mood, and she hardly understood her own. When she entered upon this interview her mind had been so intent upon one purpose that it seemed to absorb all her faculties and reach every corner of her heart. Yet here she was, after the exchange of many words between them, with her purpose uncommunicated and her heart unrelieved, staring at him, not in the interest of her own griefs, but in commiseration of his. Yet when he faced her once more every thought vanished from her mind, save the one which had sustained her through the extraordinary measures she had taken to secure herself this opportunity of presenting her lost cause to the judgment of the only man from whom she could expect aid. But her impulse was stayed, and her thoughts went wandering again by the penetrating look he gave her before she let her veil fall again. "'How long have you been in Detroit?' he asked. Ever since. And how old is Reuther? Eighteen, but... Twelve years ago, then. He paused and glanced around him before adding. She was about the age of the child you brought to my house today. Yes, sir. Very nearly. His lips took a strange twist. There was self-contempt in it, and some other very peculiar and contradictory emotion. But when this semblance of a smile had passed, it was no longer Oliver's father she saw before her, but the county's judge. Even his tone partook of the change, as he dryly remarked, "'What you have told me concerning your daughter and my son is very interesting. But it was not for the simple purpose of informing me that this untoward engagement was at an end that you came to Shelby. You have another purpose. What is it?' I can remain with you uh, just five minutes longer. Five minutes? It only takes one to kill a hope, but five are far too few for the reconstruction of one. But she gave no sign of her secret doubts, as she plunged at once into her subject. I will be brief, said she, as brief as any mother can be who is pleading for her daughter's life as well as happiness. Reuther has no real ailment, but her constitution is abnormally weak, and she will die of this grief if some miracle does not save her. Strong as her will is, determined as she is to do her duty at all cost, she has very little physical stamina. See, here is her photograph taken but a short time ago. Look at it, I beg. See what she was like when life was full of hope, and then imagine her with all hope eliminated. Excuse me. What use? I can do nothing. I am very sorry for the child, but... His attitude showed his disinclination to look at the picture. But she would not be denied. She thrust it upon him, and once his eyes had fallen upon it, they clung there, though evidently against his will. Ah, she knew that Reuther's exquisite countenance would plead for itself. God seldom grants to such beauty so lovely a spirit. 
If the features themselves failed to appeal, certainly he must feel the charm of an expression which had already netted so many hearts. Breathlessly she watched him, and as she watched, she noted the heavy lines carved in his face by thought, and possibly by sorrow, slowly relax, and his eyes fill with a wistful tenderness. In the egotism of her relief she thought to deepen the impression she had made by one vivid picture of her daughter as she was now, mistaking his temperament or his story, classing him in with other strong men, the well of whose feeling once roused overflows in sympathetic emotion, she observed very gently, but as she soon saw unwisely, "'Such delicacy can withstand a blow, but not a steady heartbreak. When on that dreadful night I crept in from my sleepless bed to see how my darling was bearing her long watch, this was what I saw. She had not moved, no, not an inch in the long hours, which had passed since I left her. She had not even stirred the hand from which, at her request, I had myself drawn her engagement ring. I doubt even if her lids had shut once over her strained and wide-staring eyes. It was as if she were laid out for her grave. Madam! The harsh tone recalled her to herself. She took back the picture he was holding toward her, and was hardly surprised when he said, "'Parents must learn to endure bitterness. I have not been exempt myself from such. Your child will not die. You have years of mutual companionship before you, while I have nothing. And now let us end this interview so painful to both. You have said—' "'No!' she broke in with a sudden vehemence, all the more startling from the restraint— in which she had held herself up to this moment. I have not said, I have not begun to say what seethes like a consuming fire in my breast, Judge Ostrander. I do not know what has estranged you from Oliver. It must be something serious, for you are both good men. But whatever it is, of this I am certain, you would not willfully deliver an innocent child like mine to a wretched fate which a well-directed effort might avert. I spoke of a miracle. Will you not listen, Judge? I am not wild. I am not unconscious of presumption. I am only in earnest, in deadly earnest. A miracle is possible. The gulf between these two may yet be spanned. I see a way. What change was this to which she had suddenly become witness? The face which had not lost all its underlying benignancy, even when it looked its coldest, had now become settled and hard. His manner was absolutely repellent as he broke in with a quick disclaimer, "'But there is no way. What miracle could ever make your daughter, lovely as she undoubtedly is, a fitting match for my son? None, madam, absolutely none. Such an alliance would be monstrous, unnatural.' "'Why?' the word came out boldly. If she was intimidated by this unexpected attack from a man accustomed to deference and altogether able to exact it, she did not show it. "'Because her father died the death of a criminal?' she asked. The answer was equally blunt. "'Yes, a criminal over whose trial his father presided as judge.' Was she daunted? No. Quick as a flash came the retort. "'A judge, however, who showed him every consideration possible.' I was told at the time, and I have been assured by many since, that you were more than just to him in your rulings. Such a memory creates a bond of gratitude, not hate. Judge Ostrander, he had taken a step toward the hall door, but he paused at the utterance of his name, answer me this one question. Why did you do this? As his widow, as the mother of his child, I implore you to tell me why you showed him this leniency. You must have hated him deeply. Yes, I have never hated any one more. The slayer of your dearest friend, of your inseparable companion, of the one person who stood next to your son in your affections and regard. He put up his hand. The gesture, the way he turned his face aside, showed that she had touched the raw of a wound still unhealed. Insensibly, the woman in her responded to this evidence of an undying sorrow. 
and modulating her voice she went on with just a touch of the subtle fascination which made her always listen to your feeling for mr etheridge was well known then why so much magnanimity toward the man who stood on trial for killing him unaccustomed to be questioned though living in an atmosphere of continual yes and no he stared at the veiled features of one who so dared as if he found it hard to excuse such presumption but he answered her nevertheless and with decided emphasis possibly because his victim was my friend and lifelong companion a judge fears his own prejudices possibly but you had another reason judge a reason which justified you in your own eyes at the time and which justifies you in mine now and always am i not right this is no courtroom the case is one of the past it can never be reopened the prisoner is dead answer me then as one sorrowing mortal replies to another hadn't you another reason the judge panoplied though he was or thought he was against all conceivable attack winced at this repetition of a question he had hoped to ignore and in his anxiety to hide this involuntary betrayal of weakness allowed his anger to have full vent as he cried out in no measured terms what is the meaning of all this what are you after why are you raking up these bygones which only make the present condition of affairs darker and more hopeless you say that you know some way of making the match between your daughter and my son feasible and proper i say that nothing can do this fact the sternest of facts is against it if you found a way i shouldn't accept it oliver ostrander under no circumstances and by no means of no sophistries can ever marry the daughter of john scoville i should think you would see that for yourself but if john should be proved to have suffered wrongly if he should be shown to have been innocent innocent yes i have always had doubts of his guilt even when circumstances bore most heavily against him and now as i look back upon the trial and remember certain things i feel sure that you had doubts of it yourself his rebuke was quick instant with a force and earnestness which recalled the courtroom he replied madam your hopes and wishes have misled you your husband was a guilty man as guilty a man as ever judge ever passed sentence upon oh she wailed forth reeling heavily back and almost succumbing to the shock she had so thoroughly convinced herself that what she said was true but hers was a courageous soul she rallied instantly and approaching him again with face uncovered and her whole potent personality alive with magnetism she retorted you say that i to my eye hand on my hand heart beating with my heart above the grave of our children's mutual happiness i do convinced for there was no wavering in his eye no trembling in the hand she had clasped convinced but ready notwithstanding to repudiate her own convictions so much of the mother passion if not the wife's tugged at her heart she remained immovable for a moment waiting for the impossible hoping against hope for a withdrawal of his words and the reillumination of hope then her hand fell away from his she gave a great sob and lowering her head muttered john scoville smote down algernon etheridge oh god oh god what horror a sigh from her one auditor welled up in the silence holding a note which startled her erect and brought back a memory which drove her again into passionate speech but he swore the day i last visited him in the prison with his arms pressed tight about me and his eye looking straight into mine as you are looking now that he never struck that blow i did not believe him then there were too many dark spots in my memory of old lies premeditated and destructive of my happiness but i believed him later and i believe him now madam this is quite unprofitable a jury of his peers condemned him as guilty and the law compelled me to pass sentence upon him 
that his innocent child should be forced by the inexorable decrees of fate to suffer for a father's misdoing i regret as much perhaps more than you do for my son beloved though irreconcilably separated from me suffers with her you say but i see no remedy no remedy i repeat were oliver to forget himself so far as to ignore the past and marry reuther scoville a stigma would fall upon them both for which no amount of domestic happiness could ever compensate indeed there can be no domestic happiness for a man and a woman so situated the inevitable must be accepted madam i have said my last word but not heard mine she panted for me to acknowledge the inevitable where my daughter's life and happiness are concerned would make me seem a coward in my own eyes helped or unhelped with the sympathy or without the sympathy of one who i hoped would show himself my friend i shall proceed with the task to which i have dedicated myself you will forgive me judge you see that john's last declaration of innocence goes farther with me than your belief backed as it is by the full weight of the law gazing at her as at one gone suddenly demented he said i fail to understand you mrs i will call you mrs averill you speak of a task what task the only one i have heart for the proving that reuther is not the child of a wilful murderer that another man did the deed for which he suffered i can do it i feel confident that i can do it and if you will not help me help you <laughs> after what i have said and reiterated that he is guilty 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 advancing upon her with each repetition of the word he towered before her an imposing almost formidable figure where was her courage now in what pit of despair had it finally gone down she eyed him fascinated feeling her inconsequence and all the madness of her romantic ill-digested effort when from somewhere in the maze of confused memories there came to her a cry not of the disappointed heart but of a daughter's shame and she saw again the desperate haunted look with which the stricken child had said in answer to some plea a criminal's daughter has no place in this world but with the suffering and the lost and nerved anew she faced again his anger which might well be righteous and with almost preternaturally insight boldly declared you are too vehement to quite convince me judge ostrander acknowledge it or not there is more doubt than certainty in your mind a doubt which ultimately will lead you to help me you are too honest not to when you see that i have some reason for the hopes i express your sense of justice will prevail and you will confide to me the point untouched or the fact unmet which has left this rankling dissatisfaction to fester in your mind that known my way should broaden a way at the end of which i see a united couple my daughter and your son oh she is worthy of him the woman broke forth as he made another repellent and imperative gesture ask any one in the town where we have lived abruptly and without apology for his rudeness judge ostrander again turned his back and walked away from her to an old-fashioned bookcase which stood in one corner of the room halting mechanically before it he let his eyes roam up and down over the shelves seeing nothing as she was well aware but weighing as she hoped the merits of the problem she had propounded him she was therefore unduly startled when with a quick whirl about which brought him face to face with her once and more he impetuously asked madam you were in my house this morning you came in through a gate which bela had left unlocked will you explain how you came to do this did you know that he was going down street leaving the way open behind him was there collusion between you her eyes looked up clearly into his she felt that she had nothing to disguise or conceal i had urged him to do this judge ostrander i had met him more than once in the street when he went out to do your errands and i used all my persuasion to induce him to give me this one opportunity of pleading my cause with you he was your devoted servant he showed it in his death 
but he never got over his affection for Oliver. He told me that he would wake oftentimes in the night, feeling about for the boy he used to carry in his arms. When I told him— Enough! He knew who you were, then. He remembered me when I lifted my veil. Oh, I, I know very well that I had not the right to influence your own man to disobey your orders. But my cause was so pressing, and your seclusion seemingly so arbitrary, how could I dream that your nerves could not bear any sudden shock? Or that Bela, that giant among negroes, would be so affected by his emotions that he would not see or hear an approaching automobile? You must not blame me for these tragedies, and you must not blame Bela. He was torn by conflicting duties, and only yielded because of his great love for the absent. I do not blame Bela. Startled, she looked at him with wondering eyes. There was a brooding despair in his tone which caught at her heart, and for an instant made her feel the full extent of her temerity. In a vain endeavor to regain her confidence, she falteringly remarked, I had listened to what folks said. I had heard that you would receive nobody, talk to nobody. Bela was my only resource. Madam, I do not blame you. He was scrutinizing her keenly, and for the first time understandingly. Whatever her station, past or present, she was certainly no ordinary woman. Nor was her face without beauty, lit as it was by passion and every ardor of which a loving woman is capable. No man would be likely to resist it unless his armor were thrice forged. Would he himself be able to? He began to experience a cold fear, a dread which drew a black veil over the future, a blacker veil than that which had hitherto rested upon it. But his face showed nothing. He was master of that yet. Only his tone, that silenced her. She was therefore scarcely surprised when, with a slight change of attitude which brought their faces more closely together, he proceeded with a piercing intensity not to be withstood. When you entered my house this morning, did you come directly to my room? Yes. Bella told me just how to reach it. And when you saw me, indisposed, unable in fact to greet you, what did you do then? With the force and meaning of one who takes an oath, she brought her hand palm downward on the table before her, as she steadily replied, I flew back into the room through which I had come, undecided whether to fly the house or wait for what might happen to you. I had never seen anyone in such an attack before, and almost expected to hear you fall forward to the floor. But when you did not, and the silence which seemed so awful, remained unbroken, I pulled the curtain aside and looked in again. There was no change in your posture, and alarmed now for your sake rather than my own, I did not dare to go till Bela came back. So I stayed, watching. Stayed where? In a dark corner of that same room. I never left it till the crowd came in, then I slid out behind them. Was a child with you? At your side, I mean, all this time. I never let go her hand. Woman, are you keeping nothing back? Nothing but my terror at the sight of Bela running in, all bloody, to escape the people pressing after him. I thought then that I had been the death of servant as well as master. You can imagine my relief when I heard that yours was but a passing attack. Sincerity was in her manner and in her voice. The judge breathed more easily and made the remark. No one with hearing unimpaired can realize the suspicion of the deaf. Nor can anyone who is not subject to attacks like mine conceive the doubts with which a man so cursed views those who have been active about him while the world to him was blank. Thus he dismissed the present subject, to surprise her by a renewal of the old one. "'What are your reasons,' said he, "'for the hopes that you have just expressed?' I think it's your duty to tell me before we go any further. It was an acknowledgment, uttered after his own fashion, of the truth of her plea and the correctness of her woman's insight. She contemplated his face anew, and wondered that the dart she had so inconsiderately launched should have found the one weak joint in this strong man's armor. 
But she made no immediate reply, rather stopped to ponder, finally saying with drooped head and nervously working fingers, "'Excuse me for tonight. What I have to tell, or rather what I have to show you, requires daylight.' Then, as she became conscious of his astonishment, added falteringly, have have you any objection to meeting me tomorrow on the bluff overlooking dark the voice of the clock and that only tick 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 that only why then had she felt it impossible to finish her sentence the judge was looking at her he had not moved nor had an eyelash stirred but the rest of that sentence had stuck in her throat and she found herself standing as immovably quiet as he. Then she remembered. He had loved Algernon Etheridge. Memory still lived. The spot she had mentioned was a horror to him. Weakly she strove to apologize. I am sorry, she began, but he cut her short at once. Why there? he asked. Because her words came slowly, haltingly, as she tremulously, almost fearfully, felt her way with him. Because there is no other place where I can make uh, my point. He smiled. It was his first smile in years, and naturally was a little constrained, and to her eyes at least almost more terrifying than his frown. "'You have a point, then, to make.' "'A good one.' He started as if to approach her, and then stood stock-still. "'Why have you waited until now?' he called out, forgetful that they were not alone in the house, forgetful apparently of everything but his surprise and repulsion. "'Why have you not made use of this point before it was too late? You were at your husband's trial. You were even on the witness-stand.' She nodded, thoroughly cowed at last, both by his indignation and the revelation contained in this question of the judicial mind. Why now, when the time was then? Happily, she had an answer. Judge Ostrander, I had a reason for that, too. And like my point, it was a good one. But do not ask me for it tonight. Tomorrow I will tell you everything. But it will have to be in the place I have mentioned. Will you come to the bluff where the ruins are? one half hour before sunset please be exact as to the time you will see why if you come he leaned across the table they were on opposite sides of it and plunging his eyes into hers stood so while the clock ticked out one slow minute more then he drew back and remarking with an aspect of gloom but with much less appearance of distrust a very odd request madam I hope you have good reason for it, adding, I bury Bela tomorrow, and the cemetery is in this direction. I will meet you where you say, and at the hour you name. And regarding him closely as she spoke, she saw that for all the correctness of his manner, and the bow of respectful courtesy with which he instantly withdrew, that deep would be his anger, and unquestionable the results to her, if she failed to satisfy him at this meeting of the value of her point in reawakening justice and changing public opinion. End of chapter 8「Chapter 9 of Dark Hollow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dark Hollow by Anna Catherine Green. Chapter 9. Excerpts. One of the lodgers at the Claymore Inn had great cause for complaint the next morning. A restless tramping over his head had kept him awake all night. That it was intermittent, had made it all the more intolerable. Just when he thought it had stopped, it would start up again, to and fro, to and fro, as regular as clockwork, and much more disturbing. But the complaint never reached Mrs. Averill. 
the landlady had been restless herself indeed the night had been one of thought and feeling to more than one person in whom we are interested the feeling we can understand the thought that is mrs averill's thought we should do well to follow the one great question which had agitated her was this should she trust the judge ever since the discovery which had changed reuther's prospects she had instinctively looked to this one source for aid and sympathy her reasons she had already given his bearing during the trial the compunction he showed in uttering her husband's sentence were sufficient proof to her that for all his natural revulsion against the crime which had robbed him of his dearest friend he was the victim of an undercurrent of sympathy for the accused which could mean but one thing a doubt of the prisoner's actual guilt but her faith had been sorely shaken in the interview just related he was not the friend she had hoped to find he had insisted upon her husband's guilt when she had expected consideration and a thoughtful recapitulation of the evidence and he had remained unmoved or but very little moved by the disappointment of his son his only remaining link to life why was the alienation between these two so complete as to block out natural sympathy had the separation of years rendered them callous to every mutual impression she dwelt in tenderness upon the bond uniting herself and reuther and could not believe in such unresponsiveness no parent could carry resentment or even righteous anger so far as that judge ostrander might seem cold both manner and temper would naturally be much affected by his unique and solitary mode of life but at heart he must love oliver it was not in nature for it to be otherwise and yet it was at this point in her musing that there came one of the breaks in her restless pacing she was always of an impulsive temperament and always giving way to it sitting down before paper and ink she wrote the following lines my darling if unhappy child i know that this sudden journey on my part must strike you as cruel when if ever you need your mother's presence and care but the love i feel for you my reuther is deep enough to cause you momentary pain for the sake of the great good i hope to bring you out of this shadowy quest i believe what i said to you on leaving that a great injustice was done your father feeling so shall i remain quiescent and see youth and love slip from you without any effort on my part to set this matter straight i cannot i have done you the wrong of silence when knowledge would have saved you shock and bitter disillusion but i will not add to my fault the inertia of a cowardly soul have patience with me then and continue to cherish those treasures of truth and affection which you may one day feel free to bestow once more upon one who has a right to each and all of them this is your mother's prayer deborah scoville it was not easy for her to sign herself thus it was a name which she had tried her best to forget for twelve long preoccupied years but how could she use any other in addressing her daughter who had already declared her intention of resuming her father's name despite the opprobrium it carried and the everlasting bar it must in itself raise between herself and oliver ostrander deborah scoville a groan broke from her lips as she rapidly folded that name in and hid it out of sight in the envelope she as rapidly addressed but her purpose had been accomplished or would be when once this letter reached reuther with these words in declaration against her she could not retreat from the stand she had therein taken it was another instance of burning one's ships upon disembarking and the effect made upon the writer showed itself at once in her altered manner henceforth the question should be not what awaited her but how she should show her strength in face of the opposition she now expected to meet from this clear-minded amply equipped lawyer and judge she had called to her aid a task for his equal not for an ignorant untried woman like myself she thought and following another of her impulses she leaped from her seat at the table and rushed across to her dresser on which she placed two candles one at her right and another at her left 
Then she sat down between them, and in the stillness of midnight surveyed herself in the glass, as she might survey the face of a stranger. What did she see? A countenance no longer young, and yet with some of the charm of youth still lingering in the brooding eyes, and in the dangerous curves of a mobile and expressive mouth. But it was not for charm she was looking, but for some signs of power quite apart from that of sex. Did her face express intellect, persistence, and above all courage? The brow was good. She would so characterize it in another. Surely a woman with such a forehead might do something even against odds. Nor was her chin weak. Sometimes she had thought it too pronounced for beauty. But what had she to do with beauty now? And the neck so proudly erect, the heaving breast, the heart all aflame? Defeat is not for such, or only such defeat as bears within it the germ of future victory. Is her reading correct? Time will prove. Meanwhile she will have confidence in herself, and that this confidence might be well founded, she decided to spend the rest of the night in formulating her plans and laying out her imaginary campaign. Leaving the dresser, she recommenced that rapid walking to and fro which was working such havoc in the nerves of the man in the room below her. When she paused, it was to ransack a trunk and bring out a flat wallet filled with newspaper clippings, many of them discolored by time, and all of them showing marks of frequent handling. A handling now to be repeated, for after a few moments spent in arranging them, she deliberately set about their complete re-perusal, a task in which it has now become necessary for us to join her. The first was black, with old headlines, Crime in Dark Hollow. Algernon Etheridge, one of our most esteemed citizens, waylaid and murdered at Long Bridge. A direct clue to the murderer. The stick with which the crime was committed, easily traced to its owner. The landlord of Claymore Tavern in the toils. He denies his guilt, but submits sullenly to arrest. Particulars followed. Last evening, Shelby's clean record was blackened by outrageous crime. Some time after nightfall, a carter was driving home by Factory Road, when just as he was nearing Longbridge, one of his horses shied so violently that he barely escaped being thrown from his seat. As he had never known the animal to shy like this before, he was curious enough to get down and look about him for the cause. Dark hollow is never light, but it is impenetrable after dark and not being able to see anything, he knelt down in the road and began to feel about with his hand. This brought results. In a few moments he came upon the body of a man lying without movement and seemingly without life. Longbridge is not a favorite spot at night, and knowing that in all probability an hour might elapse before assistance would arrive in the shape of another passerby, he decided to carry his story straight to Claymore Tavern. Afterwards he was heard to declare that it was fortunate his horses were headed that way instead of the other, or he might have missed seeing the skulking figure which slipped down into the ravine as he made the turn at the far end of the bridge. A figure which had no other response to his loud hola than a short cough, hurriedly choked back. He could not see the face or identify the figure, but he knew the cough. He had heard it a hundred times, and saying to himself, I'll find fellas enough at the tavern, but there's one I won't find, and that's John Scoville. He whipped his horse up the hill and took the road to Claymore. And he was right. A dozen fellows started up at his call, but Scoville was not among them. He had been out for two hours, which the carter, having heard, he looked down but said nothing except, Come along, boys, I'll drive you to the turn of the bridge. But just as they were starting, Scoville appeared. He was hatless and disheveled and reeled heavily with liquor. He also tried to smile, which made the carter lean quickly down and with very little ceremony drag him up into the cart. So with Scoville amongst them, they rode quickly back to the bridge, the landlord coughing, the men all grimly silent. In crossing the bridge, he made more than one effort to escape. 
but the men were determined and when they finally stooped over the man lying in dark hollow he was in their midst and was forced to stoop also one flash of the lantern told the dismal tale the man was not only dead but murdered his forehead had been battered in with a knotted stick all his pockets hung out empty and from the general disorder of his dress it was evident that his watch had been torn away by a ruthless hand but the face they failed to recognize till some people running down from the upper town where the alarm had by this time spread sent up the shout of it's mr etheridge judge ostrander's great friend let someone run and notify the judge but the fact was settled long before the judge came upon the scene and another fact too in beating the bushes they had lighted on a heavy stick when it was brought forward and held under the strong light made by a circle of lanterns a big movement took place in the crowd the stick had been recognized indeed it was well known to all the claymore men they had seen it in scoville's hands a dozen times even he could not deny its ownership explaining or trying to that he had been in the ravine looking for this stick only a little while before and adding as he met their eyes i lost it in these woods this afternoon i hadn't anything to do with this killing he had not been accused but he found it impossible to escape after this and when at the insistence of coroner haynes he was carefully looked over and a small red ribbon found in one of his pockets he was immediately put under arrest and taken to the city lockup, for the ribbon had been identified as well as the stick oliver ostrander who had accompanied his father to the scene of the crime declared that he had observed it that very afternoon dangling from one end of mr etheridge's watch chain where it had been used to fasten temporarily a broken link as we go to press we hear that judge ostrander has been prostrated by this blow the deceased had been playing chess up at his house and in taking the short cut home had met with his death long bridge should be provided with lights it is a dangerous place for foot passengers on a dark night a later paragraph the detectives were busy this morning going over the whole ground in the vicinity of the bridge they were rewarded by two important discoveries the impression of a foot in a certain soft place halfway up the bluff and a small heap of fresh earth nearby which on being dug into revealed the watch of the murdered man the broken chain lay with it the footprint has been measured it coincides exactly with the shoe worn that night by the suspect the case will be laid before the grand jury next week the prisoner continues to deny his guilt the story he gives out is to the effect that he left the tavern some few minutes before seven o'clock to look for his child who had wandered into the ravine that he entered the woods from the road running by his house and was searching the bushes skirting the stream when he heard little reuther's shout from somewhere up on the bluff he had his stick with him for he never went out without it but finding it in his way he leaned it against a tree and went plunging up the bluff without it why he didn't call out the child's name he doesn't know he guessed he thought he would surprise her and why when he got to the top of the bluff and didn't find her he should turn about for his stick instead of hunting for her on the road he also fails to explain saying again he doesn't know what circumstances force him to tell and what he declares to be true is this that instead of going back diagonally through the woods to the lone chestnut where he had left his stick he crossed the bridge and took the path running along the edge of the ravine that in doing this he came upon the body of a man in the black recesses of the hollow a man so evidently beyond all help that he would have hurried by without a second look if it had not been for the watch he saw lying on the ground close to the dead man's side it was a very fine watch and it seemed like tempting providence to leave it lying there exposed to the view of any chance tramp who might come along it seemed better for him to take it into his own charge till he found some responsible person willing to carry it to police headquarters 
so without stopping to consider what the consequences might be to himself he tore it away by the chain from the hold it had on the dead man's coat and put it in his pocket he also took some of the little things after which he fled away into town where the sight of a saloon was too much for him and he went in to have a drink to take the horrors out of him since then the detectives have followed all of his movements and know just how much liquor he drank and to whom in tipsy bravado he showed the contents of his pockets but he wasn't so far gone as not to have moments of apprehension when he thought of the dead man lying with his feet in dark hollow and of the hue and cry which would soon be raised and what folks might think if that accursed watch he had taken so innocently should be found in his pocket finally his fears overcame his scruples and starting for home he stopped at the bluff meaning to run down over the bridge and drop the watch as near as possible to the spot where he had found it but as he turned to descend he heard a team approaching from the other side and terrified still more he dashed into the woods and tearing up the ground with his hands buried his booty in the loose soil and made for home even then he had no intention of appropriating the watch only of safeguarding himself nor did he have any hand at all in the murder of mr etheridge this he would swear to also to the leaving of the stick where he said it is understood that in case of his indictment his lawyer will follow the line of defense thus indicated today john scoville was taken to the tree where he insists he left his stick it is a big chestnut some hundred and fifty feet beyond the point where the ravine turns west it has a big enough trunk for a stick to stand upright against it as was shown by inspector snow who had charge of this affair but we are told after demonstrating this fact with the same bludgeon which had done its bloody work in the hollow the prisoner showed a sudden interest in this weapon and begged to see it closer this being granted he pointed out where a splinter or two had been freshly whittled from the handle and declared that no knife had touched it while it remained in his hands but as he had no evidence to support this statement a knife having been found amongst the other effects taken from his pocket at the time of his arrest the impression made by this declaration is not likely to go far towards influencing public opinion in his favor a true bill was found today against john scoville for the murder of algernon etheridge a third clipping we feel it our duty as the one independent paper of this city to insist upon the right of a man to the consideration of the public till a jury of his peers has pronounced upon his guilt and thus rendered him a criminal before the law the way our hitherto sufficiently respected citizen john scoville has been maligned and his every fault and failing magnified for the delectation of a greedy public is unworthy of a christian community no man saw him kill algernon etheridge and he himself denies most strenuously that he did so yet from the first moment of his arrest till now not a voice has been raised in his favor or the least account taken of his defense yet he is the husband of an estimable wife and the father of a child of such exceptional loveliness that she has been the petted darling of high and low ever since john scoville became the proprietor of claymore tavern give the man a chance it is our wish to see justice vindicated and the guilty punished but not before the jury has pronounced its verdict the star was his only friend sighed deborah scoville as she laid this clipping aside and took up another headed by a picture of her husband this picture she subjected to the same scrutiny she had just given to her own reflection in the glass seeing him anew as she said to herself after all these years of determined forgetfulness it was not an unhandsome face indeed it was his good looks which had prevailed over her judgment in the early days of their courtship reuther had inherited her harmony of feature from him the chiselled nose the well-modelled chin and all the other physical graces which had made him a fine figure behind his bar but even with the softening of her feelings towards him since she had thus set herself up in his defence deborah could not fail to perceive under all these surface attractions 
an expression of unreliability, or, as some would say, of actual cruelty. Ruddy-haired and fair of skin, he should have had an optimistic temperament, but on the contrary, he was of a gloomy nature, and only infrequently social. No company was better for his being in it. Never had she seen any man sit out the evening with him without effort. And yet the house had prospered. How often had she said to herself in noting these facts, yet the house prospers. There was always money in the till, even when the patronage was small. Their difficulties were never financial ones. She was still living on the proceeds of what they had laid by in those old days. Her mind continued to plunge back. He had had no business worries, yet his temper was always uncertain. She had not often suffered from it herself, for her ascendancy over men extended even to him. But Reuther had shrunk before it more than once. The gentle Reuther, who was the refined, the etherealized picture of himself, and he had loved the child as well as he could love anybody. Great gusts of fondness would come over him at times, and then he would pet and cajole the child almost beyond a parent's prerogative. But he was capable of striking her, too, had struck her frequently, and for nothing. An innocent look, a shrinking movement, a smile when he wasn't in the mood for smiles. It was for this Deborah had hated him, and it was for this the mother in her now held him responsible for the doubts which had shadowed their final parting. Was not the man who could bring his hand down upon so frail and exquisite a creature as Reuther was in those days capable of any act of violence? Yes, but in this case he had been guiltless. She could not but concede this even while yielding to extreme revulsion as she laid his picture aside. The next slip she took up contained an eulogy of the victim. The sudden death of Algernon Etheridge has been in more than one sense a great shock to the community. Though a man of passive rather than active qualities, his scholarly figure, long, lean, and bowed, has been seen too often in our streets not to be missed when thus suddenly withdrawn. His method of living, the rigid habits of an almost ascetic life, such an hour for this thing, such an hour for that, his smile which made you soon forget his irascibility and pride of learning, made up of a character unique in our town and one that we can ill afford to spare. The closed doors of the little cottage so associated with his name that it will be hard to imagine it occupied by any one else, possess a pathos of their own which is felt by young and old alike. The gate that would never latch, the garden where at a stated hour in the morning his bowed figure would always be seen hoeing or weeding or raking, the windows without curtains showing the stacks of books within are eloquent of a presence gone which can never be duplicated. Alone on its desolate corner it seems to mourn the child, the boy, the man who gave it life, and made it, in its simplicity, more noted and more frequently pointed at than any other house in town. Why he should have become the target of fate is one of the mysteries of life. His watch, which aside from his books was his most valuable possession, was the gift of Judge Ostrander. That it should be associated in any way with the tragic circumstances of his death is a source of the deepest regret to the unhappy donor. This excerpt she hardly looked at, but the following she studied carefully. Judge Ostrander has from the first expressed a strong desire that some associate judge should be called upon to preside over the trial of John Scoville for the murder of Algernon Etheridge. But Judge Saunders' sudden illness and Judge Dole's departure for Europe have put an end to these hopes. Judge Ostrander will take his seat on the bench as usual next Monday. Fortunately for the accused, his well-known judicial mind will prevent any unfair treatment of the defense. The prosecution, in the able hands of District Attorney Foss, made all its points this morning. Unless the defense has some very strong plea in the background, the verdict seems foredoomed. A dogged look has replaced the callous and indifferent sneer on the prisoner's face, and sympathy, 
if sympathy there is, is centered entirely upon the wife, the able, agreeable, and bitterly humiliated landlady of Claymore Tavern. She it is who has attracted the most attention during this trial, little as she seems to court it. Only one new detail of evidence was laid before the jury today. Scoville has been known for some time to have a great hankering after a repeating watch. He had once seen that of Algernon Etheridge, and was never tired of talking about it. Several witnesses testified to his various remarks on this subject. Thus the motive for his dastardly assault upon an unoffending citizen, which to many minds has seemed lacking, has been supplied. The full particulars of this day's proceedings will be found below. We omit these to save repetition, but they were very carefully conned by Deborah Scoville. Also the following. The defense is in a line with the statement already given out. The prisoner acknowledges taking the watch, but from motives quite opposed to those of thievery. Unfortunately, he can produce no witness to substantiate his declaration that he had heard voices in the direction of the bridge while he was wandering the woods in search of his lost child. No evidence of any other presence there is promised or likely to be produced. It was thought that when his wife was called to the stand she might have something to say helpful to his case. She had been the one to ultimately find and lead home the child, and, silent as she has been up to this time, it has been thought possible that she might swear to having heard those voices also. But her testimony was very disappointing. She had seen nobody, heard nobody but the child, whom she had found playing with stones in the old ruin, though by a close calculation of time she could not have been far from Dark Hollow at the instant of the crime, yet neither on direct or cross-examination could anything more be elicited from her other than what has been mentioned above. Nevertheless we feel obliged to state that irreproachable as her conduct was on the stand, the impression she made was, on the whole, whether intentionally or unintentionally, unfavorable to her husband. Some anxiety was felt during the morning session that an adjournment would have to be called, owing to some slight signs of indisposition on the part of the presiding judge. But he rallied very speedily, and the proceedings continued without interruption. Ah! The exclamation escaped the lips of Deborah Scoville as she laid this clipping aside. I remember his appearance well. He had the ghost of one of those attacks, the full force of which I was a witness to this morning. I am sure of this now, though nobody thought of it then. I happened to glance his way as I left the stand, and he was certainly for one minute without consciousness of himself or his surroundings, but it passed so quickly it drew little attention. Not so the attack of today. What a misfortune rests upon this man! Will they let him continue on the bench when his full condition is known? These were her thoughts, as she recalled that day and compared it with the present. There were other slips which she read, but which we may pass by. The fate of the prisoner was in the hands of a jury. The possibility suggested by the defense made no appeal to men who had the unfortunate prisoner under their eye at every stage of the proceedings. The shifty eye the hang-dog look outweighed the plea of his counsel and the call for strict impartiality from the bench he was adjudged guilty of murder in the first degree and sentence called for this was the end and as she read these words the horror which overwhelmed her was infinitely greater than when she heard them uttered in that fatal courtroom for then she regarded him as guilty and deserving his fate and now she knew him to be innocent. Well, well, too much dwelling on this point would only unfit her for what lay before her on the morrow. She would read no more. Sleep were a better preparation for her second interview with the judge than this reconsideration of facts already known to their last detail. Alas, when her eyelids finally obeyed the dictates of her will, the first glimmering rays of dawn were beginning to scatter the gloom of her darkened chamber. End of chapter 9
Chapter Ten of Dark Hollow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carolyn. Dark Hollow by Anna Catherine Green. Chapter Ten. The Shadow. Bella was to be buried at four. As Judge Ostrander prepared to lock his gate behind the simple cottage, which was designed to grow into a vast crowd before it reached the cemetery, he was stopped by the sergeant who whispered in his ear, "'I thought your honour might like to know that the woman—you know the one I mean without my naming her—has been amusing herself this morning in a very peculiar manner. She broke down some branches in the ravine—small ones, of course— and would give no account of herself when one of my men asked her what she was up to. It may mean nothing, but I thought you would like to know. Have you found out who she is? No, sir. The man couldn't very well ask her to lift her veil, and at the tavern they have nothing to say about her. It's a small matter. I will see her myself today and find out what she wants from me. Meanwhile, Remember that I leave this house and grounds absolutely to your protection for the next three hours. I shall be known to be absent, so that a more careful watch than ever is necessary. Not a man, boy or child, is to climb the fence. May I rely on you? You may judge. On my return you can all go. I will guard my own property after today. You understand me, sergeant? Perfectly, your honour. This ended the colloquy. Spencer's folly, as the old ruin of the bluff was called in memory of the vanished magnificence which was once the talk of the county, presented a very different appearance to the eye in broad daylight from what it did at night, with the low moon sending its mellow rays through the great gap made in its walls by that ancient stroke of lightning even the enkindling beams of the westering sun striking level through the forest failed to adorn its broken walls and battered foundations to the judge approaching it from the highway it was as ugly a sight as the world contained he hated its airy desolation and all the litter of blackened bricks blocking up the sight of former feastings and reckless merriment and above all the incongruous aspect of the one gable still standing undemolished with the zigzag marks of vanished staircases outlined upon its mildewed walls but most of all he shrank from a sight of the one corner still intact where the ghosts of dead memories lingered making the whole place horrible to his eye and one to be shunned by all men how long it had been shunned by him he realized when he noticed the increased decay of the walls and the growth of the verdure encompassing the abominable place the cemetery from which he had come looked less lonesome to his eyes and far less ominous and for a passing instant as he contemplated the scene hideous with old memories and threatening new sorrows he envied bella his narrowed bed and honourable rest a tall figure and an impressive presence are not without their disadvantages this he felt as he left the highway and proceeded up the path which had once led through a double box hedge to the high pillared entrance he abhorred scandal and shrank with almost a woman's distaste from anything which savoured of the clandestine yet here he was about to meet on a spot open to the view of every passing vehicle a woman who if known to him was a mystery to every one else his expression showed the scorn with which he regarded his own compliance yet he knew that no instinct of threatened dignity no generous thought for her a selfish one for himself would turn him back from his interview till he had learned what she had to tell him and why she had so carefully exacted that he should hear her story in a spot overlooking the hollow it would be seen them both to shun there had originally been in the days of spencer's magnificence a lordly portico on the end of this approach girt by pillars of extraordinary height 
but no sign remained of pillar or doorway only a gap as i have said towards this gap he stepped feeling a strange reluctance in entering it but he had no choice he knew what he should see no he did not know what he should see for when he finally stepped in it was not an open view of the hollow which met his eyes but the purple-clad figure of mrs Averill with little peggy at her side he had not expected to see the child and standing as they were with their backs to him they presented a picture which for some reason to be found in the mysterious recesses of his disordered mind was exceedingly repellent to him indeed he was so stricken by it that he had actually made a move to withdraw when the exigency of the occasion returned upon him in full force and with a smothered oath he overcame his weakness and stepped firmly up into the ruins the noise he made should have caused deborah's tall and graceful figure to turn but the spell of her own thoughts was too great and he would have found himself compelled to utter the first word if the child who had heard him plainly enough had not dragged at the woman's hand and so woke her from her dream ah judge ostrander she exclaimed in a hasty but ungraceful greeting you are very punctual i was not looking for you yet then as she noted the gloom under which he was labouring she continued with real feeling indeed i appreciate the sacrifice you have made to my wishes it was asking a great deal of you to come here but i saw no other way of making my point clear come over here peggy and build me a little house out of these stones you don't mind the child do you judge she may offer diversion if your retreat is invaded the gesture of disapproval which he made was courteous but insincere he did mind the child but he could not explain why besides he must overcome such folly now she continued as she rejoined him on the place where he had taken his stand i will ask you to go back with me to the hour when john scoville left the tavern on that fatal day i am not now on oath but i might as well be for any slip i shall make in the exact truth i was making pies in the kitchen when some one came running in to say that reuther had strayed away from the front yard she was about the age of the little one over here and we never allowed her out for fear of her tumbling off the bluff so i set down the pie i was just putting in the oven and was about to run out after her when my husband called to me from the front and said he would go i didn't like his tone it was sullen and impatient but i knew he loved the child too well to see her suffer any danger and so i settled back to work and was satisfied enough till the pies were all in then i got uneasy and hearing nothing of either of them i started in this direction because they told me john had taken the other and here i found her sir right in the heart of these ruins she was playing with stones just as peggy dear is doing now greatly relieved i was taking her away when i thought i heard john calling stepping up to the edge just behind where you are standing sir yes there where you get such a broad outlook up and down the ravine i glanced in the direction from which i had heard his call i just wait a moment sir i want to know the exact time stopping she pulled out her watch and looked at it while he faltering up to the verge which he had pointed out followed her movement with strange intensity as she went on to say in explanation of her act the time is important on account of a certain demonstration i am anxious to make you will remember that i was expecting to see john having heard his voice in the ravine now if you will lean a little forward and look where i am pointing you will notice at the turn of the stream a spot of ground more open than the rest please keep your eye on that spot for it was there i saw at this very hour twelve years ago the shadow of an approaching figure and it is there you will presently see one similar if the boy i have tried to interest in this experiment does not fail me now now sir we should see his shadow before we see him oh i hope the underbrush and trees have not grown up too thick i tried to thin them out to-day are you watching sir he seemed to be but he dared not turn to look both figures leaned intent 
and in another moment she had gripped his arm and clung there did you see she whispered don't mind the boy it's the shadow i wanted you to notice did you observe anything marked about it she had drawn him back into the ruins they were standing in that one secluded corner under the ruinous gable and she was gazing up at him very earnestly tell me judge she entreated as he made no effort to answer with a hurried moistening of his lips he met her look and responded with a slight emphasis the boy held a stick i should say that he was whittling it ah her tone was triumphant that was what i told him to do did you see anything else no i do not understand this experiment or what you hope from it i will tell you the shadow which i saw at a moment very like this twelve years ago showed a man whittling a stick and wearing a cap with a decided peak in front my husband wore such a cap the only one i knew of in town what more did i need as proof that it was his shadow i saw and wasn't it judge ostrander i never thought differently till after the trial till after the earth closed over my poor husband's remains that was why i could say nothing in his defence why i did not believe him when he declared that he had left his stick behind him when he ran up the bluff after reuther the tree he pointed out as the one against which he had stood it was far behind the place where i saw his advancing shadow even the oath he made to me of his innocence at the last interview we held in prison did not impress me at the time as truthful but later when it was all over when the disgrace of his death and the necessity of seeking a home elsewhere drove me into selling the tavern and all its effects i found something which changed my mind in this regard and made me confident that i had done my husband a great injustice you found what do you mean by that what could you have found his peaked cap lying in a corner of the garret he had not worn it that day the judge stared she repeated her statement and with more emphasis he had not worn it that day for when he came back to be hustled off again by the crowd he was without hat of any kind and he never returned again to his home you know that judge i had seen the shadow of some other man approaching dark hollow whose i am in this town now to find out End of chapter ten Chapter eleven of Dark Hollow This is a Librivox recording. All Librivox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit Librivox.org. Recording by Carolyn Dark Hollow by Anna Catherine Green Chapter eleven I will think about it. Judge Ostrander was a man of keen perception, quick to grasp an idea, quick to form an opinion but his mind acted slowly to-night deborah scoville wondered at the blankness of his gaze and the slow way in which he seemed to take in this astounding fact at last he found voice and with it gave some evidence of his usual acumen madam a shadow is an uncertain foundation on which to build such an edifice as you plan how do you know that the fact you mention was coincident with the crime mr etheridge's body was not found till after dark a dozen men might have come down that path with or without sticks before he reached the bridge and fell a victim to the assault which laid him low i thought the time was pretty clearly settled by the hour he left your house the sun had not set when he turned your corner on his way home so several people said who saw him besides yes there is a besides i'm sure of it i saw the tall figure of a man whom i afterwards made sure was mr etheridge coming down factory road on his way to the bridge when i turned about to get reuther all of which you suppressed at the trial i was not questioned on this point sir madam he was standing very near to her now hemming her as it were into that decaying corner 
i should have a very much higher opinion of your candour if you told me the whole story i have sir his hands rose one to the right-hand wall the other to the left and remained there with their palms resting heavily against the rotting plaster she was more than ever hemmed in but though she felt a trifle frightened at his aspect which certainly was not usual she faced him without shrinking and in very evident surprise you went immediately home with the child after that glimpse you got of mr etheridge yes i had no reason in the world to suppose that anything was going to happen in the ravine below us of course i went straight on there were things to be done at home and you don't believe me sir his hands fell an indefinable change had come over his aspect he bowed and seemed about to utter an ironic apology she felt puzzled and unconsciously she began to think what was lacking in her statement something could she remember what something which she had expected something which as presiding judge over john's trial he had been made aware of and now recalled to render her story futile it couldn't be that little thing but yes it might be nothing is little where a great crime is concerned she smiled a dubious smile then said it seems too slight a fact to mention and indeed i had forgotten it till you pressed me but after we had passed the gates and were well out on the highway i found that reuther had left her little pail behind her here and we came back and got it did you mean that sir i meant nothing but i felt sure you had not told all you could about that fatal ten minutes you came back it is quite a walk from the road the man whose shadow you saw must have reached the bridge by this time what did you see then or hear nothing absolutely nothing judge i was intent on finding the baby's pail and having found it i hurried back home all the faster and tragedy was going on or was just completed in plain sight from this gap i have no doubt sir and if i had looked possibly john might have been saved the silence following this was broken by a crash and a little cry peggy's house had tumbled down this small incident was a relief. Both assumed more natural postures. "'So the shadow is your great and only point,' remarked the judge. "'It is sufficient for me.' "'Ah, perhaps.' "'But not enough for the public?' "'Hardly.' "'Not enough for you, either.' madam i have already told you that in my opinion john scoville was a guilty man and this fact with which i have just acquainted you has done nothing to alter this opinion i can only repeat what i have just said oh reuther oh oliver do not speak my son's name i am in no mood for it the boy and girl are two and can never become one i have other views for her she is an innocent victim and she has my sympathy you too madam though i consider you as following a will-o'-the-wisp which will only lead you hopelessly astray i shall not desist judge ostrander you are going to pursue this jack-o'-lanthorn i am determined to if you deny me aid and advice i shall seek another counsellor john's name must be vindicated obstinacy madam no conscience he gave her a look turned and glanced down at the child piling stone on stone and whimpering just a little when they fell watch that baby for a while he remarked and you will learn the lesson of most human endeavour madam i have a proposition to make you you cannot wish to remain at the inn nor can you be long happy separated from your daughter i have lost bela i do not know how nor would i be willing to replace him by another servant i need a housekeeper some one devoted to my interests and who will not ask me to change my habits too materially will you accept the position if i add as an inducement my desire to have reuther as an inmate of my home
this does not mean that i countenance or in any way anticipate her union with my son i do not but any other advantages she may desire she shall have i will not be strict with her judge ostrander deborah scoville was never more taken aback in her life the recluse opening his doors to two women the man of mystery flinging aside the reticences of years to harbour an innocence which he refused to let weigh against the claims of a son he has seen fit to banish from his heart and home you may take time to think of it he continued as he watched the confused emotions change from moment to moment the character of her mobile features i shall not have my affairs adjusted for such a change before a week if you accept i shall be very grateful if you decline i shall close up my two rear gates and go into solitary seclusion i can cook a meal if i have to and she saw that he would do it saw and wondered still more i shall have to write to reuther she murmured how soon do you want my decision in four days i am too disturbed to thank you judge should we have to keep the gates locked no but you would have to keep out unwelcome intruders and the rights of my library will have to be respected in all other regards i should wish under these new circumstances to live as other people live i have been very lonely these past twelve years i will think about it and you may make note of these two conditions oliver's name is not to be mentioned in my hearing and you and reuther are to be known by your real names you would yes madam no secrecy is to be maintained in future as to your identity or to my reasons for desiring you in my house i need a housekeeper and you please me that you have a past to forget and reuther a disappointment to overcome gives additional point to the arrangement her answer was i cannot take back what i have said about my determined purpose in repeating this she looked up at him askance he smiled she remembered that smile long after the interview was over and only its memory remained end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of dark hollow this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Dark Hollow by Anna Catherine Green Chapter 12 Sounds in the Night Dearest Mother, where could we go that disgrace would not follow us? Let us then accept the judge's offer. I am the more inclined to do this because of the possible hope that some day he may come to care for me and allow me to make life a little brighter for him the fact that for some mysterious reason he feels himself cut off from all intercourse with his son may prove a bond of sympathy between us i too am cut off from all companionship with oliver between us also a wall is raised do not mind that teardrop mamma it is the last kisses for my comforter come soon reuther over this letter deborah scoville sat for two hours then she rang for mrs yardley the maid who answered her summons surveyed her in amazement it was the first time that she had seen her uncovered face mrs yardley was not long in coming up mrs averill she began in a sort of fluster as she met her strange guest's quiet eye but she got no further that guest had a correction to make my name is not averill she protested you must excuse the temporary deception it is scoville I once occupied your present position in this house. Mrs. Yardley had heard all about the Scovilles, and while a flush rose to her cheeks, her eyes snapped with sudden interest. Ah! came in quick exclamation, followed, however, by an apologetic cough, and the somewhat forced and conventional remark, You find the place changed, no doubt? Very much so. And for the better, Mrs. Yardley. 
then with a straightforward meeting of the other's eye calculated to disarm whatever criticism the situation might evoke she quietly added you need no longer trouble yourself with serving me my meals in my room i will eat dinner in the public dining room today with the rest of the boarders i have no further reason for concealing who i am or what my future intentions are i am going to live with judge ostrander mrs yardley keep house for him myself and daughter his man is dead and he feels very helpless i hope that i shall be able to make him comfortable mrs yardley's face was a study in all her life she had never heard news that surprised her more in fact she was mentally aghast judge ostrander admitting any one into his home and this woman above all yet why not he certainly would have to have some one and this woman had always been known as a notable housekeeper in another moment she had accepted the situation like the very sensible woman she was and mrs scoville had the satisfaction of seeing the promise of real friendly support in the smile with which mrs yardley remarked it's a good thing for you and a very good thing for the judge it may shake him out of his habit of seclusion if it does you will be the city's benefactor good luck to you madam and you have a daughter you say after mrs yardley's departure mrs scoville as she now expected herself to be called sat for a long time brooding would her quest be facilitated or irretrievably hindered by her presence in the judge's house she had that yet to learn meanwhile there was one thing more to be accomplished she set about it that evening veiled but in black now she went into town getting down at the corner of colburn avenue and perry street she walked a short distance on perry then rang the bell of an attractive-looking house of moderate dimensions being admitted she asked to see mr black and for an hour sat in close conversation with him then she took a trolley car which carried her into the suburbs when she alighted it was unusually late for a woman to be out alone but she had very little physical fear and walked on steadily enough for a block or two till she came to a corner where a high fence loomed forbiddingly between her and a house so dark that it was impossible to distinguish between its chimneys and the encompassing trees whose swaying tops could be heard swishing about uneasily in the keen night air an eerie accompaniment this latter to the beating of deborah's heart already throbbing with anticipation and keyed to an unusual pitch by her own daring was she quite alone in the seemingly quiet street she could hear no one see no one a lamp burned in front of miss week's small house but the road it illumined i speak of the one running down to the ravine showed only darkened houses she had left the corner and was passing the gate of the ostrander homestead when she heard coming from some distant point within a low and peculiar sound which held her immovable for a moment and then sent her on shuddering it was the sound of hammering what is there in a rat-tat-tat in the dead of night which rouses the imagination and fills the mind with suggestions which we had rather not harbour when in the dark and alone deborah scoville was not superstitious but she had keen senses and mercurial spirits and was easily moved by suggestion hearing this sound and locating it where she did she remembered with a quick inner disturbance that the judge's house held a secret a secret of such import to its owner that the dying bella had sought to preserve it at the cost of his life oh she had heard all about that the gossip at claymore inn had been great and nothing had been spared her curiosity there was something in this house which it behooved the judge to secrete from sight yet more completely before her own and reuther's entrance and he was at work upon it now hammering with his own hand while other persons slept no wonder she edged her way along the fence with a shrinking yet persistent step she was circling her future home and that house held a mystery and yet like any other imaginative person under a stress of aroused feeling she might very easily be magnifying some commonplace act into one of terrifying possibilities 
one can hammer very innocently in his own house even at night when making preparations to receive fresh inmates after many years of household neglect she recognized her folly before reaching the adjoining field but she went on where the fence turned she turned there being no obstruction to her doing so this brought her into a wilderness of tangled grasses where free stepping was difficult as she groped her way along she had ample opportunity to hear again the intermittent sounds of the hammer and to note that they reached their maximum at a point where the l of the judge's study approached the fences rat tat tat rat tat tat she hated the sound even while she whispered to herself it's just some household matter he's at work upon rehanging pictures or putting up shelves it can be nothing else yet on laying her ear to the fence she felt her sinister fears return and with shrinking glances into a darkness which told her nothing she added in fearful murmur to herself what am i taking reuther into i wish i knew i wish i knew end of chapter twelve Chapter Thirteen of Dark Hollow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dark Hollow by Anna Catherine Green. Chapter Thirteen. A Bit of Steel. When are you going to Judge Ostrander's? Tomorrow. This is my last free day, so if there's anything for me to do, do tell me, Mr. Black, and let me get to work at once. There is nothing you can do. The matter is hopeless. You think so? There was misery in the tone, but the seasoned old lawyer, who had conducted her husband's defense, did not allow his sympathies to run away with his judgment. I certainly do, madam. I told you so the other night, and now, after a couple of days of thought on the subject, I am obliged to repeat my assertion. Your own convictions in the matter, and your story of the shadow and the peaked cap, may appeal to the public and assure you some sympathy, but for an entire reversal of its opinion you will need substantial and incontrovertible evidence. You must remember, you will pardon my frankness, that your husband's character failed to stand the test of inquiry. His principles were slack. His temper was violent. You have suffered from both and must know. A poor foundation I found it for his defense, and a poor one you will find it for the reversal of public opinion upon which you count without very strong proof that the crime for which he was punished was committed by another man. You think you have such proof? But it is meager, very meager. Find me something definite to go upon, and we will talk discouragement discouragement everywhere she complained yet i know john to have been innocent of this crime the lawyer raised his brows and toyed impatiently with his watch chain if her convictions found any echo in his own mind he gave no evidence of it doubtfully she eyed him what you want she observed at length with a sigh is the name of the man who sauntered down the ravine ahead of my husband i cannot give it to you now but I do not despair of learning it. Twelve years ago, madam, twelve years ago. I know, but I have too much confidence in my cause to be daunted even by so serious an obstacle as that. I shall yet put my finger on this man, but I do not say that it will be immediately. I have got to renew old acquaintances, revive old gossip, possibly, recall to life almost obliterated memories. Mr. Black, dropping his hand from his vest, gave her his first look of unqualified admiration. "'You ring true,' said he. "'I have met men qualified to lead a forlorn hope, but never before a woman. Allow me to express my regret that it is such a forlorn one.' Then, with a twinkle in his eye which bespoke a lighter mood, he remarked in a curiously casual tone, "'Talking of gossip.' there is but one person in town who is a complete repository of all that is said or known this side of colchester which was the next town 
I never knew her to forget anything, and I never knew her to be very far from the truth. She lives near Judge Ostrander, a quaint little body, not uninteresting to talk to, a regular character, in fact. Do you know what they say about her house? That everything on God's earth can be found in it. That you've but to name an object, and she will produce it. She's had strange opportunities for collecting odds and ends, and she's never neglected one of them. And yet her house is but a box. Miss Weeks is her name. I will remember it. Mrs. Scoville rose, and then she sat down again with the remark, I have a strange notion. It's a hard thing to explain, and you may not understand me, but I should like to see, if it still exists, the stick, my husband's stick with which this crime was committed. Do the police retain such things? Is there any possibility of my finding it laid away in some drawer at headquarters or on some dusty shelf? Mr. Black was again astonished. Was this callousness or a very deep and determined purpose? I don't know. I never go pottering about at headquarters. What do you want to see that for? What help can you get out of that? None, probably, but in the presence of defeat. You grasp at every hope. I dreamt of that stick last night. I was in an awful wilderness, all rocks, terrific gorges, and cloud-covered, unassailable peaks. A light, one ray and one only, shone on me through the darkness. Toward this ray I was driven through great gaps in the yawning rocks, and along narrow galleries, sloping above an unfathomable abyss. Hope lay beyond, rescue, light but a wall reared its black length between. I came upon it suddenly, a barrier mighty and impenetrable with its ends lost in obscurity. And the ray, the one long beam, it was still there. It shone directly upon me from an opening in this wall. It marked a gate, a gate for which I only lacked the key. Where should I find one to fit a lock so gigantic? Nowhere unless the something which I held which had been in my hands from the first, would be found to move its stubborn wards. I tried it, and it did. It did. I hear the squeak of those tremendous hinges now, and, Mr. Black, you must have guessed what that something was. My husband's stick, the bludgeon with whose shape I was so familiar twelve years ago. It is that, and that only, which will lead us to the light. Of this I feel quite sure. A short and ironical grunt answered her. Mr. Black was not always the pink of politeness, even in the presence of ladies. Most interesting, he commented sarcastically. The squeak you heard was probably the protest of the bed you were reclining on against such a misuse of the opportunities it offered you. A dream listened to as evidence in this office. You must have a woman's idea of the value of my time. Flushing with discomfiture, she attempted to apologize when he cut her short. Nevertheless, you shall see the stick, if it is still to be found. I will take you to police headquarters, if you will go heavily veiled. We don't want any recognition of you there yet. You will take me? The fact that I never go there may make my visit not unwelcome. I'll do it. Yes, I'll do it. Mr. Black, you are very good. How soon? Now, he answered, jumping up to get his hat. A woman who can take up a man's time with poetry and dreams might as well have the whole afternoon. Are you ready? Shall we go? All alacrity, in spite of the irony of his bow and smile, he stood at the door waiting for her to follow him. This she did slowly and with manifest hesitation. She did not understand the man. People often said of her that she did not understand her own charm. There was one little fact of which Mr. Black was ignorant, that the police had had their eye on the veiled lady at Claymore Inn for several days now, and knew who his companion was the instant they stepped into headquarters. In vain his plausible excuses for showing his lady friend the curiosities of the place. Her interest in the details of criminology was well understood by Sergeant Doolittle, though of course he had not sounded its full depths and could not know from any one but judge ostrander himself her grave reasons for steeping her mind again in the horrors of her husband's long since expiated crime and judge ostrander was the last man who would be likely to give him this information 
therefore when he saw the small mocking eye of the lawyer begin to roam over the shelves and beheld his jaw drop as it sometimes did when he sought to veil his purpose in an air of mild preoccupation he knew what the next request would be as well as if the low sounds which left mr black's lips at intervals had been words instead of inarticulate grunts he was therefore prepared when the question did come any memorial of the etheridge case nothing but a stick with blood marks on it that i'm afraid wouldn't be a very agreeable sight for a lady's eye she's proof the lawyer whispered in the officer's ear let's see the stick the sergeant considered this a very interesting experience quite a jolly break in the dull monotony of the day hunting up the stick he laid it in the lawyer's hands and then turned his eye upon the lady she had gone pale but it took her but an instant to regain her equanimity and hold out her own hand for the weapon with what purpose what did she expect to see in it which others had not seen many times she did not know herself she was simply following an impulse just as she had felt herself borne on by some irresistible force in her dream and so the three stood there the men's faces ironic inquisitive wondering at the woman's phlegm if not at her motive hers hidden behind her veil but bent forward over the weapon in an attitude of devouring interest thus for a long slow minute then she impulsively raised her head and beckoning the two men nearer she directed attention to a splintered portion of the handle and asked them what they saw there nothing just stick declared the sergeant the march you're looking for are higher up and you mr black he saw nothing either but stick but he was little less abrupt in his answer do you mean those roughnesses he asked that's where the stick was whittled you remember that he had been whittling at the stick who the words shot from her lips so violently that for a moment both men looked staggered by it then mr black with unaccustomed forbearance answered gently enough why scoville madam or so the prosecution congratulated itself upon having proved to the jury satisfaction it did not tally with scoville's story or with common sense i know you remember pardon me i mean that any one who read the report of the case will remember how i handled the matter in my speech but the prejudice in favor of the prosecution i will not say against the defense was too much for me and common sense the defender's declarations and my eloquence all went for nothing of course they produced the knife yes they produced the knife it was in his pocket yes have they that here no we haven't that here but you remember it remember it was it a new knife a whole one i mean with all its blades sharp and in good order yes i can say that i handled it several times then whose blade left that and again she pointed to the same place on the stick where her finger had fallen before i don't know what you mean the sergeant looked puzzled perhaps his eyesight was not very keen have you a magnifying glass there is something embedded in this wood try and find out what it is the sergeant with a queer look at mr black who returned it with interest went for a glass and when he had used it the stare he gave the heavily veiled woman drove mr black to reach out his own hand for the glass well he burst forth after a prolonged scrutiny there is something there the point of a knife blade the extreme point she emphasized it might easily escape the observation even of the most critical without such aid as is given by this glass no one thought of using a magnifying glass on this blurted out the sergeant the marks made by the knife were plain enough for all to see and that was all which seemed important mr black said nothing he was feeling a trifle cheap something which did not agree with his crusty nature not having seen mrs scoville for half an hour without her veil her influence over him was on the wane and he began to regret that he had laid himself open to this humiliation she saw that it would be left for her to wind up the interview and get out of the place without arousing too much attention with a self-possession which astonished both men knowing her immense interest in this matter she laid down the stick and with a gentle shrug of her shoulders remarked in an easy tone 
well it's curious the ins and outs of a crime i mean such a discovery ten years after the event i think you said ten years is very interesting then she sighed alas it's too late to benefit the one whose life it might have saved mr black shall we be going i have spent a most entertaining quarter of an hour mr black glanced from her to the sergeant before he joined her then with one of his sour smiles directed towards the former he said i wouldn't be talking about this sergeant it will do no good and may subject us to ridicule the sergeant none too well pleased nodded slightly seeing which she spoke up i don't know about that i should think it but proper reparation to the dead to let it be known that his own story of innocence has received this late confirmation but the lawyer continued to shake his head with a very sharp look at the sergeant if he could have his way he would have this matter stop just where it was alas he was not to have his way as he saw when at parting he essayed to make a final protest against the public as well as premature reopening of this old case she did not see her position as he did and wound up her plea by saying the public must lend their aid if we are to get the evidence we need to help us can we find the man who whittled that stick never but someone else may i'm going to give the men and women of this town a chance i'm too anxious to clear my husband's memory to shrink from any publicity you see i believe that the real culprit will yet be found the lawyer dropped argument when a woman speaks in that tone persuasion is worse than useless besides she had raised her veil strange but a sensitive countenance will do end of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of dark hollow this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org dark hollow by anna katherine green chapter fourteen all is clear this is my daughter judge ostrander reuther this is the judge the introduction took place at the outer gates whither the judge had gone to receive them reuther threw aside her veil and looked up into the face bent courteously towards her it had no look of oliver somehow she felt glad she could hardly have restrained herself if he had met her gaze with oliver's eyes they were fine eyes notwithstanding piercing by nature but just now misty with a feeling that took away all her fear he was going to like her she saw it in every trembling line of his countenance and at the thought a smile rose to her lips which if fleeting lent such an ethereal aspect to her beauty that he forgave oliver then and there for a love which never could be crowned but which henceforth could no longer be regarded by him as despicable with a courteous gesture he invited them in but stopping to lock one gate before leading them through the other mrs scoville had time to observe that since her last visit with its accompanying inroad of the populace the two openings which at this point gave access to the walk between the fences had been closed up with boards so rude and dingy that they must have come from some old lumber pile in attic or cellar the judge detected her looking at them i have cut off my nightly promenade said he with youth in the house more cheerful habits must prevail to-morrow i shall have my lawn cut and if i must walk after sundown i will walk there the two women exchanged glances perhaps their gloomy anticipations were not going to be realized but once within the house the judge showed embarrassment he was conscious of its unfitness for their fastidious taste and yet he had not known how to improve matters in his best days he had concerned himself very little with household affairs and for the last few years he had not given a thought to anything outside of his own rooms bella had done all and bella was pre-eminently a cook not a general house servant how would these women regard the disorder and the dust 
i have few comforts to offer said he opening a door at his right and then hastily closing it again this part of the house is as you see completely dismantled and not very clean but you shall have carte blanche to arrange to your liking one of these rooms for your sitting room and parlor there is furniture in the attic and you may buy freely whatever else is necessary i don't want to discourage little reuther as for your bedrooms he stopped hemmed a little and flushed a vivid red as he pointed up the dingy flight of uncarpeted stairs towards which he had led them they are above but it is with shame i admit that i have not gone above this floor for many years consequently i don't know how it looks up there or whether you can even find towels and things perhaps you will go up first mrs scoville i will stay here while you take a look i really couldn't have a strange cleaning woman here or any one who would make remarks have i counted too much on your good nature no not at all in fact you simply arouse all the housekeeping instincts within me i will be down in a minute reuther i leave you with a judge she ran lightly up the next instant they heard her sneeze then they caught the sound of a window rattling up followed by a streak of light falling slantwise across the dismal stairs the judge drew a breath of relief and led reuther towards a door at the end of the hall this is the way to the dining room and kitchen he explained i've been accustomed to having my meals served in my own room but after this i shall join you at table here he continued leading her up to the iron door is the entrance to my den you may knock here if you want me but there is a curtain beyond which no one lifts but myself you understand my dear and will excuse an old man's eccentricities she smiled rejoicing only in the caressing voice and in the yearning almost fatherly manner in which he surveyed her i quite understand said she and so will mother reuther he now observed with a strange intermixture of gentleness and authority there is one thing i wish to say to you at the very start i may grow to love you god knows that a little affection would be a welcome change in my life but i want you to know and know now that all the love in the world will not change my decision as to the impropriety of a match between you and my son oliver that settled there is no reason why all should not be clear between us all is clear faint and far off the words sounded though she was standing so near he could have laid his hand on her shoulder then she gave one sob as though in saying this she heard the last clod fall upon what would never see resurrection again in this life and lifting her head looked him straight in the eye with a decision and a sweetness which bowed his spirit and caused his head in turn to fall upon his breast what a father can do for a child i will do for you he murmured and led her back to her mother who was now coming downstairs a week and deborah scoville had evolved a home out of chaos that is within limits there was one door on that upper story which she had simply opened and shut nor had she entered the judge's rooms or even offered to do so the ban which had been laid upon her daughter she felt applied equally to herself that is for the present later there must be a change so particular a man as the judge would soon find himself too uncomfortable to endure the lack of those attentions which he had been used to in bella's day he had not even asked for clean sheets and sometimes she had found herself wondering with a strange shrinking of her heart if his bed was ever made or whether he had not been driven at times to lie down in his clothes she had some reason for these doubtful conclusions in her ramblings through the house she had come upon bella's room it was in a loft over the kitchen and she had been much amazed at its condition in some respects it looked as decent as she could expect but in the matter of bed and bedclothes it presented an aspect somewhat startling the clothes were there tossed in a heap on the floor but there was no bed in sight nor anything which could have served as such it had been dragged out evidences of this were everywhere dragged out and down the narrow twisted staircase which was the only medium of communication between the lower floor and this loft as she noted the marks made by its passage down the steps 
the unhappy vision rose before her of the judge immaculate in attire and unaccustomed of hand tugging at this bed and alternately pushing and pulling it by main strength down this contracted many-cornered staircase a smile half pitiful half self-scornful curved her lips as she remembered the rat-tat-tat she had heard on that dismal night when she clung listening to the fence and wondered now if it had not been the bumping of this cot sliding from step to step but no the repeated stroke of a hammer is unmistakable he had played the carpenter that night as well as the mover and with no visible results mystery still reigned in the house for all the charm and order she had brought into it a mystery which deeply interested her and which she yet hoped to solve notwithstanding its remoteness from the real problem of her existence end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of dark hollow this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by wendy almeida dark hollow by anna katherine green chapter fifteen the picture night and Deborah Scoville waiting anxiously for Reuther to sleep, that she might brood undisturbed over a new and disturbing event which for the whole day had shaken her out of her wonted poise and given, as it were, a new phase to her life in this house. Already had she stepped several times to her daughter's room and looked in, only to meet Reuther's unquiet eye turned towards hers in silent inquiry. Was her own uneasiness infectious? was the child determined to share her vigil she would wait a little longer this time and see their rooms were over the parlour and thus as far removed as possible from the judge's den in her own which was front she felt at perfect ease and it was without any fear of disturbing either him or reuther that she finally raised her window and allowed the cool wind to soothe her heated cheeks how calm the aspect of the lawn and its clustering shrubs dimly seen though they were through the leaves of the vines she had but partially clipped she felt the element of peace which comes with perfect quiet and was fain to forget for a while the terrors it so frequently conceals the moon which had been invisible up to this moment emerged from scurrying clouds as she quietly watched the scene and in an instant her peace was gone, and all the thronging difficulties of her position came rushing back upon her in full force, as all the details of the scene, so mercifully hidden just now, flashed again upon her vision. Perched as she was in a window overlooking the lane, she had but to lift her eyes from the double fence, that symbol of sad seclusion to light on the trees rising above that unspeakable ravine black with memories she felt strangely like forgetting to-night beyond how it stood out on the bluff it had never seemed to stand out more threateningly the bifurcated mass of dismal ruin from which men had turned their eyes these many years now but the moon loved it caressed it dallied with it lighting up its toppling chimney and empty staring gable there where the black streak could be seen she had stood with the judge in that struggle of wills which had left its scars upon them both to this very day there hidden but always seen by those who remembered the traditions of the place mouldered away the walls of that old closet where the timorous, God-stricken suicide had breathed out his soul. She had stood in it only the other day, penned from outsider's view by the judge's outstretched arms. Then she had no mind for bygone horrors. Her own tragedy weighed too heavily upon her. But to-night, as she gazed, fascinated, anxious to forget herself, anxious to indulge in any thought which would relieve her from dwelling on the question she must settle before she slept 
she allowed her wonder and her revulsion to have free course instead of ignoring she would recall the story of the place as it had been told her when she first came to settle in its neighborhood spencer's folly well it had been that and spencer's den of dissipation too there were great tales but it was not of these she was thinking but of the night of storm of the greatest storm of which any record remained in shelby when the wind tore down branches and toppled down chimneys when cattle were smitten in the field and men on the highway when the old bridge since replaced buckled up and sank in the roaring flood it could no longer span and the bluff towering overhead flared into flame and the house which was its glory was smitten apart by the descending bolt as by a titan sword and blazed like a beacon to the sky this was long before she herself had come to shelby but she had been told the story so often that it was quite as vivid to her as if she had been one of the innumerable men and women who had crowded the glistening swimming streets to view this spectacle of destruction the family had been gone for months and so no pity mingled with the excitement not till the following day did the awful nature of the event break in its full horror upon the town among the ruins in a closet which the flames had spared they found hunched up in one corner the body of a man in whose seared throat a wound appeared which had not been made by lightning or fire spencer spencer himself returned they knew not how to die of this self-inflicted wound in the dark corner of his grand but neglected dwelling and this was what made the horror of the place till the tragedy of the opposite hollow added crime to crime and the spot became outlawed to all sensitive citizens folly and madness and the vengeance of high heaven upon unhallowed walls spoke to her from that towering mass bathed though it was just now in liquid light under the impartial moon but as she continued to survey it the clouds came trooping up once more and the vision was wiped out and with it all memories save those of a nearer trouble a more pressing necessity withdrawing from the window she crept again to reuther's room and peered carefully in innocence was asleep at last not a movement disturbed the closed lids on the wax-like cheek even the breath came so softly that it hardly lifted the youthful breast repose the most perfect and in the form of all others the sweetest to a tender mother lay before her and touched her already yearning heart to tears lighting a candle and shielding it with her hand she gazed long and earnestly at reuther's sweet face yes she was right sorrow was slowly sapping the fountain of her darling's youth if reuther was to be saved hope must come soon with a sob and a prayer the mother left the room and locking herself into her own sat down at last to face the new perplexity the monstrous enigma which had come into her life it had followed a natural sequence from a proposal made by the judge that some attention should be given his long neglected rooms he had said on rising from the breakfast table and the words are more or less important i am really sorry to trouble you mrs scoville but if you have time this morning will you clean up my study before i leave the carriage is ordered for half-past nine the task was one she had long desired to perform and would have urged upon him daily had she dared but the limitations he set for its accomplishment struck her aghast do you mean that you wish to remain there while i work you will be choked judge no more than i have been for the last two days you may enter any time and going in he left the door open behind him he will lock it when he goes out she commented to herself i had better hasten giving reuther the rest of the work to do she presently appeared before him with pail and broom and a pile of fresh linen 
nothing more commonplace could be imagined but to her if not to him there underlay this especial act of ordinary housewifery a possible enlightenment on a subject which had held the whole community in a state of curiosity for years she was going to enter the room which had been barred from public sight by poor bella's dying body she was going to see or had he only meant that she was to have her way with the library the room where she had already been and much of which she remembered the doubt gave a tremulous eagerness to her step and caused her eye to wander immediately to that forbidden corner soon as she had stepped over the threshold the bedroom door was open proof that she was expected to enter there meanwhile she felt the eye of the judge upon her and endeavoured to preserve a perfect composure and to sink the curious and inquiring woman in the diligent housekeeper but she could not quite two facts of which she immediately became cognizant prevented this first the great room before her presented a bare floor whereas on her first visit it had been very decently if not cheerfully covered by a huge carpet rug secondly the judge's chair which had once looked immovable had been dragged forward into such a position that he could keep his own eye on the bedroom door manifestly she was not to be allowed to pursue her duties unwatched certainly she had to take more than one look at the everyday implements she carried to retain that balance of judgment which should prevent her from becoming the dupe of her own expectations i do not expect you to clean up here as thoroughly as you have your own rooms upstairs he remarked as she passed him you haven't the time or i the patience for too many strokes of the broom and mrs scoville he called out as she slipped through the doorway leave the door open and keep away as much as possible from the side of the room where i have nailed up the curtain i had rather not have that touched she turned with a smile and nodded she felt that she had been set to work with a string tied round her feet not touch the curtain why that was the one thing in the room she wanted to touch for in it she not only saw the carpet which had been taken up from the floor of the study but a possible screen behind which anything might lurk even his redoubtable secret or had it another and much simpler explanation might it not have been hung there merely as a shield to the window the room must have a window and there was none to be seen elsewhere it would be like him to shut out light and air she would ask there is no window she observed looking back at the judge no was his short reply slowly she set down her pail one thing was settled it was bella's cot she saw before her a cot without any sheets these had been left behind in the dead negro's room and the judge had been sleeping just as she had feared wrapped in a rug and with uncovered pillow this pillow was his own it had not been brought down with the bed she hastily slipped a cover on it and without calling any further attention to her act began to make up the bed conscious that the papers he made a feint of reading were but a cover for his watchfulness she moved about in a matter-of-fact way and did not spare him the clouds of dust which presently rose before her broom she could have managed it more deftly would have done so at another time but it was her express intention just now to make him move back out of her way if only to give her an opportunity to disturb by a backward stroke of her broom the folds of the carpet rug and learn if she could what lay hidden behind it but the judge was impervious to discomfort he coughed and shook his head but did not budge an inch before she had begun to put things in order the clock struck the half hour oh she protested with a pleading glance his way i'm not half done there's another day to follow he dryly remarked rising and taking a key from his pocket the act expressed his wishes 
and she was proceeding to carry out her things when a quick sliding noise from the wall she was passing drew her attention and caused her to spring forward in an involuntary effort to catch a picture which had slipped its cord and was falling to the floor a shout from the judge of stand aside let me come reached her too late she had grasped and lifted the picture and seen but first let me explain this picture was not like the others hanging about it was a veiled one from some motive of precaution or characteristic desire for concealment on the part of the judge it had been closely wrapped about in heavy brown paper before being hung and in the encounter which ensued between the falling picture and the spear of an image standing on a table underneath this paper had received a slit through which deborah had been given a glimpse of the canvas beneath the shock of what she saw would have unnerved a less courageous woman it was a highly finished portrait of oliver in his youth with a broad band of black painted directly across the eyes end of chapter 15chapter 16 of dark hollow this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by wendy almeida dark hollow by anna katherine green chapter 16 don't don't in recalling this startling moment Deborah wondered as much at her own aplomb as at that of Judge Ostrander. Not only had she succeeded in suppressing all recognition of what had thus been discovered to her, but had carried her powers of self-repression so far as to offer, and with good grace, too, to assist him in rehanging the picture. This perfection of acting had its full reward. With equal composure he excused her from the task, and adding some expression of regret at his well-known carelessness in not looking better after his effects bowed her from the room with only a slight increase of his usual courteous reserve but later when thought came and with it a certain recollections what significance the incident acquired in her mind and what a long line of terrors it brought in its train it was no casual act this defacing of a son's well-loved features it had a meaning a dark and desperate meaning nor was the study wall the natural home of this picture an unfaded square which she had noted on the wallpaper of the inner room showed where its original place had been there in full view of the broken-hearted father when he woke and in darksome watchfulness while he slept it had played its heavy part in his long torment a galling reminder of what it was to answer this question to face this new view of oliver and the bearing it had on the relations she had hoped to establish between him and reuther that she had waited for the house to be silent and her child asleep if the defacing marks she had seen meant that the cause of separation between father and son lay in some past fault of oliver himself serious enough for such a symbol to be necessary to reconcile the judge to their divided lives she should know it and know it soon the night should not pass without that review of the past by which alone she could now judge oliver ostrander she had spoken of him as noble she had forced herself to believe him so and in profession and in many of his actions he had been so but had she ever been wholly pleased with him to go back to their first meeting what impression had he made upon her then had it been altogether favourable and such as would be natural in one of his repute hardly but then the shock of her presentation to one who had possibly seen her under other and shameful conditions had been great 
and her judgment could scarcely have full play while her whole attention was absorbed in watching for some hint of recognition on his part but when this apprehension had vanished when quite assured that he had failed to see in the widowed mrs averill the wife of the man who had died a felon's death in shelby had her spirits risen and her eyes cleared to his great merits as she had heard them extolled by people of worth and intellectual standing alas no there had been something in his look a lack of spontaneity which had not fitted in with her expectations and in the months which followed when as reuther's suitor she saw him often and intimately how had she regarded him then more leniently of course in her gratification at prospects so far beyond any she had a right to expect for her child she had taken less note of this successful man's defects peculiarities of conversation and manner which had seemed to bespeak a soul far from confident in its hopes resolved themselves into the uneasy moods of a man who had a home he never visited a father he never saw but had she been really justified in this easy view of things if the break between his father and himself was the result of nothing deeper than a difference of temperament tastes or even opinions why should he have shrunk with such morbid distaste from all allusions to that father was it natural she may have looked upon it as being so in the heyday of her hopes and when she had a secret herself to hide but could she so degrade her judgment now and what of his conduct towards reuther had that been all her mother heart could ask of a man of his seemingly high instincts she had assured his father in her first memorable interview with him that it had been perfectly honourable and above all reproach and so it had been as far as mere words went but words are not all it is the tender look the manly bearing the tone which springs from the heart which tells in great crises and these had all been lacking generous as he attempted to show himself there was nothing in his bearing to match that of reuther as she took her quiet leave of him and entered upon a fate so much bitterer for her than for him this lack of grace in him had not passed unnoted by her even at the time but being herself so greatly in fault she had ascribed it to the recoil of a proud man from the dread of social humiliation but it took another aspect under the strong light just thrown upon his early life by her discovery in the room below nothing but some act unforgivable and unforgettable would account for that black mark drawn between a father's eyes and his son's face no bar sinister could tell a stronger tale but this was no bar sinister rather the deliberate stigmatizing of one yet loved but banned for a reason which was little short of here her conclusion stopped she would not allow her imagination to carry her any farther unhappy mother just as she saw something like a prospect of releasing her long-dead husband from the odium of an unjust sentence to be shaken by this new doubt as to the story and character of the man for whose union with her beloved child she was so anxiously struggling should it not make her pause should she not show wisdom in giving a different meaning from any she had hitherto done to that stern and inexorable dictum of the father that no marriage between the two could or should ever be considered it was a question for which no ready answer seemed possible in her present mood better to await the time when some move had to be made or some definite decision reached now she must rest rest and not think have any of us ever made the like acknowledgment and then tried to sleep in half an hour mrs scoville was again upon her feet this time with a determination which ignored the hour and welcomed night as though it were broad noonday there was a room on this upper floor into which neither she nor reuther had ever stepped 
she had once looked in but that was all to-night because she could not sleep because she must not think she was resolved to enter it oliver's room left as he had left it years before what might it not tell of a past concerning which she longed to be reassured the father had laid no restrictions upon her in giving her this floor for her use rights which he ignored she could afford to appropriate dressing sufficiently for warmth she lit a candle put out the light in her own room and started down the hall if she paused on reaching the threshold of this long closed room it was but natural the clock on reuther's mantel had sent its three clear strokes through the house as her hand fell on the knob and to her fearing heart and now well-awakened imagination these strokes had sounded in her ear like a don't don't the silence so gruesome now that this shrill echo had ceased was poor preparation for her task yet would she have welcomed any sound the least which could have been heard oh, no that were a worse alternative than silence and relieved of that momentary obsession consequent upon an undertaking of doubtful outcome she pushed the door fully open and entered a smother of dust an odor of decay a lack of all order in the room's arrangements and furnishings even a general disarray hallowed if not affected by time for all this she was prepared but not for the wild confusion the inconceivable litter and all the other signs she saw about her of a boy's mad packing and reckless departure here her imagination so lively at times had failed her and as her eye became accustomed to the semi-obscurity and she noted the heaps of mouldering clothing lying amid overturned chairs and trampled draperies she felt her heart grow cold with a nameless dread she could only hope to counteract by quick and impulsive action but what action was it for her to touch to rearrange to render clean and orderly this place of unknown memories she shrank with inconceivable distaste from the very idea of such meddling and though she saw and noted all she did not put out so much as a finger towards any object there till there was an inner door and this some impulse drove her to open a small closet stood revealed empty but for one article when she saw this article she gave a great gasp then she uttered a low pshaw and with a shrug of the shoulders drew back and flung to the door but she opened it again she had to one cannot live in hideous doubt without an effort to allay it she must look at that small black article again look at it with candle in hand see for herself that her fears were without foundation that a shadow had made the outline on the wall which she found herself laughing there was nothing else to do she with thoughts like these she reuther's mother verily the early hours of morning were unsuited for any such work as this she would go back to her own room and bed but she only went as far as the bureau where she had left the candlestick which having seized she returned to the closet and slowly reluctantly reopened the door before her on the wall hung a cap and it was no shadow which gave it that look like her husband's the broad peak was there she had not been mistaken it was the duplicate of the one she had picked up in the attic of the claymore inn when that inn was simply a tavern well and what if it was such was her thought a moment later she would take down the cap set it before her and look at it till her brain grew clear of its follies but after she had it in her hand she found herself looking anywhere but at the cap she stared at the floor the walls about the desk she had mechanically approached 
she even noticed the books lying about on the shelves before her and took down one or two to glance at their title pages in a blind curiosity she could not account for the next minute then she found herself looking into a drawer half drawn out and filled with all sorts of heterogeneous articles sealing wax a roll of pins a penholder a knife a knife why should she recoil again at that nothing could be more ordinary than to find a knife in the desk drawer of a young man the fact was not worth a thought yet before she knew it her fingers were creeping towards this knife had picked it up from among the other scattered articles had closed upon it let it drop again only to seize hold of it yet more determinedly and carry it straight to the light who spoke had anyone spoken was there any sound in the air at all she heard none yet the sense of sound was in her ear as though it had been and passed when the glance she threw about her came back to her outstretched hand she knew that the cry if cry it were had been within and that the echoes of the room had remained undisturbed the knife was lying open on her palm and from one of the blades the end had been nipped just enough of it to match was she mad she thought so for a moment then she laid down the knife close against the cap and contemplated them both for more minutes than she ever reckoned and the stillness which had been profound became deeper yet not even reuther's clock sounded its small note the candle fluttering low in its socket roused her at last from her abstraction catching up the two articles which had so enthralled her she restored the one to the closet the other to the drawer and with swift but silent step regained her own room where she buried her head in her pillow weeping and praying until the morning light breaking in upon her grief awoke her to the obligations of her position and the necessity of silence concerning all the experiences of this night end of chapter 16 chapter 17 of dark hollow this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Recording by Michelle Eaton Dark Hollow by Anna Catherine Green Chapter 17 Unwelcome Truths Silence Yes, silence was the one and only refuge remaining to her. Yet, after a few days, the constant self-restraint which it entailed ate like a canker into her peace, and undermined a strength which she had always considered inexhaustible. Reuther began to notice her pallor, and the judge to look grave. She was forced to complain of a cold, and in this she was truthful enough, to account for her alternations of feverish impulse and deadly lassitude. The trouble she had suppressed was having its quiet revenge. Should she continue to lie inert and breathless under the threatening hand of fate, or risk precipitating the doom she sought to evade? by proceeding with inquiries upon the result of which she could no longer calculate. She recalled the many mistakes made by those who had based their conclusions upon circumstantial evidence, her husband's conviction, in fact, and made up her mind to brave everything by having this matter out with Mr. Black. Then the pendulum swung back, and she found that she could not do this because, deep down in her heart, there burrowed a monstrous doubt. How born or how cherished she would not question, which Mr. Black, with an avidity she could not combat, would at once detect and pounce upon. But there was no medium course. Could she not learn from some other source where Oliver had been on the night of that old-time murder? Miss Weeks was a near neighbour and saw everything. Miss Weeks never forgot. To Miss Weeks she would go, with instructions to Ruth are calculated to keep that diligent child absorbed and busy in her absence she started out upon her quest she had reached the first gate passed it and was on the point of opening the second one when she saw on the walk before her a small slip of brown paper lifting it she perceived upon it an almost illegible scrawl which she made out to read thus for mrs scoville 
do not go wandering all over the town for clues look closer home and below you remember the old saying about jumping from the frying pan into the fire let your daughter be warned it is better to be singed than consumed warned reuther better be singed than consumed what madness was this how singed and how consumed then because deborah's mind was quick it all flashed upon her bowing her in spirit to the ground reuther had been singed by the knowledge of her father's ignominy she would be consumed if inquiry were carried further and this ignominy transferred to the proper culprit consumed there was but one person whose disgrace could consume reuther oliver alone could be meant the doubts she had tried to suppress from her own mind were shared by others others the discovery overpowered her and she caught herself crying aloud in utter self-abandonment i will not go to miss weeks i will take reuther and fly to some wilderness so remote and obscure that we can never be found yet in five minutes she was crossing the road her face composed her manner genial her tongue ready for any encounter the truth must be hers at all hazards if it could be found here then here she would seek it her long struggle with fate had brought to the fore every latent power she possessed one stroke on the tiny brass knocker old-fashioned and quaint like everything else in this dollhouse brought miss weeks small and animated figure to the door she had seen mrs scoville coming and was ready with her greeting a dog from the big house across the way would have been welcome there the eager little seamstress had never forgotten her hour in the library with a half unconscious judge mrs scoville she exclaimed fluttering and leading the way into the best room how very kind you are to give me this chance for making my apologies you know we have met before have we mrs scoville did not remember but she smiled her best smile and was gratified to note the look of admiration with which miss weeks surveyed her more than tasty dress before she raised her eye to meet the smile to whose indefinable charm so many had succumbed it is a long time since i lived here deborah proceeded as soon as she saw that she had this woman too in her net the friends i had then i scarcely hoped to have now my trouble was of the kind which isolates one completely i am glad to have you acknowledge an old acquaintance it makes me feel less lonely in my new life mrs scoville i am only too happy it was bravely said for the little woman was in a state of marked embarrassment could it be that her visitor had not recognised her as the person who had accosted her on that memorable morning she first entered judge ostrander's forbidden gates i have been told thus deborah easily proceeded that for a small house yours contains the most wonderful assortment of interesting objects where did you ever get them my father was a collector on a very small scale of course and my mother had a passion for hoarding which prevented anything from going out of this house after it had once come into it and a great many strange things have come into it there have even been bets made as to the finding or not finding of a given object under this roof pardon me perhaps i bore you not at all it's very interesting but what about the bets oh just this one day two men were chaffing each other in one of the hotel lobbies and the conversation turning upon what this house held one of them wagered that he knew of something i could not fish out of my attic and when the other asked what he said an aeroplane why he didn't say a locomotive i don't know but he said an aeroplane and the other taking him up they came here together and put me the question straight mrs scoville you may not believe it but my good friend won that bet years ago when people were just beginning to talk about air sailing machines my brother who was visiting me amused his leisure hours in putting together something he called a flyer and what is more he went up in it too but he came down so rapidly that he kept quite still about it and it fell to me to lug the broken thing in so when these gentlemen asked to see an aeroplane i took them into a lean-to where i store my least desirable things and there pointed out a mass of wings and bits of tangled wire saying as dramatically as i could there she is and they first stared then laughed and when one complained that's a ruin not an aeroplane i answered with all the demureness possible and what is any aeroplane but a ruin in prospect this has reached the ruin stage that's all so the bet was paid and my reputation sustained 
Don't you find it a little amusing? I do indeed, smiled Deborah. Now, if I wanted to make the test, I should take another course from these men. I should not pick out something strange or big or unlikely. I should choose some everyday object, some little matter. She paused as if to think. What little matter? asked the other complacently. My husband once had a cap, mused Mrs. Scoville thoughtfully. It had an astonishingly broad peak in front. Have you a cap like that? Miss Weeks' eyes opened. She stared in some consternation at Mrs. Scoville, who hastened to say, You wonder that I can mention my husband. Perhaps you will not be surprised when I tell you that in my eyes he is a martyr and quite guiltless of the crime for which he was punished. You think that? There was real surprise in the manner of the questioner. Mrs. Scoville's brow cleared. She was pleased at this proof that her affairs had not yet reached the point of general gossip. Miss Weeks, I am a mother. I have a young and lovely daughter. Can I look in her innocent eyes and believe her father to have so forgotten his responsibilities as to overshadow her life with crime? No, I will not believe it. Circumstances were in favour of his conviction, but he never lifted the stick which struck down Algernon Etheridge. Miss Weeks, who had sat quite still during the utterance of these remarks, fidgeted about their clothes, with what appeared to the speaker a sudden and quite welcome relief. Oh, she murmured, and said no more. It was not a topic she found easy of discussion. Let us go back to the cap, suggested Deborah, with another of her fascinating smiles. Are you going to show me one such as I have described? Let me see. A man's cap with an extra broad peak. Mrs. Scoville, I fear that you have caught me. There are caps hanging up in various closets, but I don't remember any with a peak beyond the ordinary. Yet they are worn. You have seen such. A red spot sprang out on the faded cheek of the woman as she answered impulsively, Oh yes, young Mr. Oliver Ostrander used to wear one. I wish I had asked him for it, she pursued naively. I should not have had to acknowledge defeat at your very first inquiry. Oh, you needn't care about that, laughed Deborah, in rather a tone for her. She had made her point, but was rather more frightened than pleased at her success. There must be a thousand articles you naturally would lack. I could name... Don't, don't, the little woman put in breathlessly. I have many odd things, but of course not everything. For instance... But here she caught the sight of the other's abstracted eye and dropped the subject. The sadness which now spread over the very interesting countenance of her visitor offered her an excuse for the introduction of a far more momentous topic, one she had burned to introduce, but had not known how. Mrs. Scoville, I hear that Judge Ostrander has got your daughter a piano. That is really a wonderful thing for him to do. Not that he is so close with his money, but that he has always been so set against all gaiety and companionship. I suppose you did not know the shock it would be to him when you asked Bella to let you into the gates. No, I didn't know, but it is all right now. The judge seems to welcome the change. Miss Weeks, did you know Algernon Etheridge well enough to tell me if he was as good and irreproachable a man as they all say? He was a good man, but he had a dreadfully obstinate streak in his disposition and very set ideas. I have heard that he and the judge used to argue over a point for hours, and he was most always wrong. For instance, he was wrong about Oliver. Oliver? Judge Ostrander's son, you know. Mr. Etheridge wanted him to study for a professorship, but the boy was determined to go into journalism, and you see what a success he has made of it. As a professor, he would probably have been a failure. Was this difference of opinion on the calling he should pursue the cause of Oliver's leaving home in the way he did? Continued Deborah, conscious of walking on very thin ice. But Miss Weeks rather welcomed than resented this curiosity. Indeed, she was never tired of enlarging upon the Ostranders. It was, therefore, with a very encouraging alacrity, she responded. I have never thought so. The judge would not quarrel with Oliver on so small a point as that. My idea is, though I never talk of it much, that they had a great quarrel over Mr. Etheridge. Oliver never liked the old student. I've watched them and I've seen. He hated his coming to the house so much. He hated the way his father singled him out and deferred to him and made him the confidant of all his troubles. When they went on their walks, Oliver always hung back, and more than once I have seen him make a grimace of distaste when his father urged him forward. 
He was only a boy, I know, but his dislikes meant something, and if it ever happened that he spoke out his whole mind, you may be sure that some very bitter words passed. Was this meant as an innuendo? Could it be that she shared the very serious doubts of Deborah's anonymous correspondent? Impossible to tell. Such nervous, fussy little bodies often possess minds of unexpected subtlety. Deborah gave up all hope of understanding her, and accepting her statements at their face value, effusively remarked, You must have a very superior mind to draw such conclusions from the little you have seen. I have heard many explanations given for the breach you name, but never any so reasonable. A flash from the spinster's wary eye, then a burst of courage and the quick retort. And what explanation does Oliver himself give? You ought to know, Mrs. Scoville. The attack was as sudden as it was unexpected. Deborah flushed and trimmed her sails for this new tack and insinuating gently. Then you have heard, waited for the enlightenment these words were likely to evoke. It came quickly enough. That he expected to marry your daughter. Oh yes, Mrs. Scoville, it's the common talk here now. I hope you don't mind my mentioning it. Deborah's head went up. She faced the other fairly, with a look born of mother passion, and mother passion only. Reuther is blameless in this matter, she protested. She was brought up in ignorance of what I felt sure would prove a handicap and misery to her. She loves Oliver, as she will never love any other man. But when she was told her real name, and understood fully what that name carries with it, she declined to saddle him with her shame. That's her story, Miss Weeks one that hardly fits her appearance, which is very delicate. And let me add, having once accepted her father's name, she refuses to be known by any other. I have brought her to Shelby, where to our own surprise, and Reuther's great happiness, we have been taken in by Judge Ostrander, an act of kindness for which we are very grateful. Miss Weeks got up, took down one of her rarest treasures from an old etagere standing in one corner, and laid it in Mrs. Scoville's hand. For your daughter, she declared. Noble girl, I hope she will be happy. The mother was touched, but not quite satisfied yet, of the giver's real feelings towards Oliver. She was not willing to conclude the interview until she understood her small hostess better. She therefore looked admiringly at the vase. It was really choice, and after thanking its donor warmly, proceeded to remark, There is but one thing that will ever make Reuther happy, and that she cannot have unless a miracle occurs. Oliver, suggested the other, with a curious wan little smile. Deborah nodded. And what miracle? Oh, I do not wonder you pause. This is not the day of miracles. But if my belief in my husband could be shared, if by some fortuitous chance I shall be enabled to clear his name, might not love and loyalty be left to do the rest? Wouldn't the judge's objections in that case be removed? What do you think, Miss Weeks? The warmth, the abandon, the confidence she expressed in this final question were indescribable. Miss Weeks' conventional mannerisms melted before it. She could no more withstand the witchery of this woman's tone and manner than if she had been a man subdued by the charm of sex. But nothing, not even her newly awakened sympathy for this agreeable woman, could make her untruthful. She might believe in the miracle of a reversal of judgment in the case of a falsely condemned criminal but not of an Ostrander accepting humiliation, even at the hands of love. She felt that in justice to this new friendship, she should say so. Do you ask me? she began. Then I feel that I must admit to you that the Ostrander pride is proverbial. Oliver may think he would be happy if he married your daughter under these changed conditions, but I should be fearful of the reaction which would certainly follow when he found that old shames are not so easily outlived. There is temper in the family, though you would never think it to hear the judge speak, and if your daughter is delicate... Is it of her you are thinking? interrupted Deborah, with a new tone in her voice. Not altogether. You see, I knew Oliver first, and are you fond of him? Fond is a big word, but I cannot help having some feeling for the boy. I have seen grow up from a babe in arms to a healthy, brilliant manhood, and having this feeling... There, we will say no more about it. The little woman's attitude and the voice were almost prayerful. You have judgment enough for two. Besides, the miracle has not happened, she interjected, with a smile which seemed to say it never would be. Deborah sighed. Whether or not it was quite an honest expression of her feeling, we will not inquire. 
She was there for a definite purpose, and her way to it was as yet far from plain. All that she had really learned was this, that it was she, and not Miss Weeks, who was playing a part, and that whatever her inquiries, she need have no fear of rousing suspicion against Oliver, in a mind already dominated by a belief in John Scoville's guilt. The negative with which she followed up this sigh was consequently one of sorrowful acceptance. She made haste, however, to qualify it with the remark, but I have not given up all hope. My cause is too promising. True, I may not succeed in marrying Reuther into the Ostrander family, even if it should be my good lot to clear her father's name, but my efforts would have one good result, as precious, perhaps more precious than the one I name. She would no longer have to regard that father as guilty of a criminal act. If such relief can be hers, she should have it. But how am I to proceed? I know as well as any one how impossible the task must prove, unless I can light upon fresh evidence. And where am I to get that? Only from some new witness. Miss Weeks' polite smile took on an expression of indulgence. This roused Deborah's pride, and hesitating no longer, she anxiously remarked, I have sometimes thought that Oliver Ostrander might be that witness. He certainly was in the ravine the night Algernon Etheridge was struck down. Had she been an experienced actress of years, she could not have thrown into this question a greater lack of all innuendo. Miss Weeks, already under her fascination, heard the tone, but never thought to notice the quick rise and fall of her visitor's uneasy bosom, and so unwarned, responded with all due frankness. I know he was, but how will that help you? He had no testimony to give in relation to this crime, or he would have given it. That is true. The admission fell mechanically from Deborah's lips. She was not conscious, even, of making it. She was struggling with the shock of the simple statement, confirming her own fears that Oliver had actually been in the ravine at the hour of Etheridge's murder. Not even a boy would hide knowledge of that kind, she stumblingly continued. Then, as her emotion choked her into silence, she sat with piteous eyes, searching Miss Weeks' face, till she had recovered her voice when she added this vital question. How did you know that Oliver was in the ravine that night? I only guessed it. Well, it was in this way. I do not often keep my eye on my neighbours. Oh no, Miss Weeks. But that night I chanced to be looking over the way just at the minute Mr. Etheridge came out, and something I saw in his manner, and in that of the judge who had followed him to the door, and in that of Oliver, who, cap on head, was leaning towards them from a window over the porch, made me think that a controversy was going on between the two old people of which Oliver was the subject. This naturally interested me, and I watched them long enough to see Oliver suddenly raise his fist and shake it at old Etheridge, then, in great rage, slam down the window and disappear inside. The next minute, and before the two below had done talking, I caught another glimpse of him as he dashed around the corner of the house on his way to the ravine. And Mr. Etheridge... Oh, he left soon after. I watched him as he went by, his long cloak flapping in the wind. Little did I think he would never pass my window again. So interested were they both, the one in telling to new and sympathetic ears the small experiences of her life, the other in listening for the chance phrase or the unconscious admission which would fix the suspicion already struggling into strong life within her breast, that neither for the moment realised the strangeness of the situation or that it was in connection with a crime for which the husband of one of them had suffered. They were raking up this past and gossiping over its petty details. Possibly recollection returned to them both when Mrs. Scoville sighed and said, It couldn't have been very long after you saw him that Mr. Etheridge was struck. Only some twenty minutes. It takes just that long for a man to walk from this corner to the bridge. And you never heard where Oliver went. It was never talked about at the time. Later, when some hint got out of his having been in the ravine that night, he said he had gone up the ravine, not down it, and we all believed him, madam. Of course, of course, what a discriminating mind you have, Miss Weeks, and what a wonderful memory, to think after all these years you can recall that Oliver had a cap on his head when he looked out of the window at his father and Mr. Etheridge. If you were asked, I have no doubt you could tell its very colour. Was it the peaked one? the like of which you haven't in your marvellous collection? Yes, I could swear to it. And Miss Weeks gave a little laugh, 
which sounded incongruous enough to Deborah, in whose heart at that moment a leaf was turned upon the past, which left the future hopelessly blank. "'Must you go?' Deborah had risen mechanically. "'Don't, I beg, till you have relieved my mind about Judge Ostrander. I don't suppose that there is really anything behind that door of his which it would alarm anyone to see.' Then Deborah understood Miss Weeks, but she was ready for her. "'I've never seen anything of the sort,' she said and I make up his bed in that very room every morning. Oh, and Miss Weeks drew a deep breath. No article of immense value such as that rare old bit of real satsuma in the cabinet over there? No, answered Deborah, with all the patience she could muster. Judge Ostrander seems very simple in his taste. I doubt if he would know satsuma if he saw it. Miss Weeks sighed. Yes, he has never expressed the least wish to look over my shelves. "'So the double fence means nothing.' "'A whim,' ejaculated Deborah, making quietly for the door. "'The judge likes to walk at night when quite through with his work, "'and he doesn't like his ways to be noted, but he prefers the lawn now. "'I hear his step out there every night.' "'Well, it's something to know that he leads a more normal life than formerly,' "'sighed the little lady, as she prepared to usher her guest out. "'Come again, Mrs. Scoville, and if I may, I will drop in and see you some day.' Deborah accorded her permission and made her final adieu. She felt as if a hand, which had been stealing up her chest, had suddenly gripped her throat, choking her. She had found the man who had cast that fatal shadow down the ravine twelve years before. End of chapter 17 Recording by Michelle Eaton Chapter 18 of Dark Hollow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Eaton. Dark Hollow by Anna Catherine Green. Chapter 18 Reflections. Deborah re entered the judge's house a stricken woman. Evading Reuther, she ran upstairs, taking off her things mechanically on the way. She must have an hour alone. She must learn her first lesson in self-control and justifiable duplicity before she came under her daughter's eyes. She must. Here, she reached her room door and was about to enter, when at a sudden thought she paused and let her eyes wander down the hall till they settled on another door, the one she had closed behind her the night before, with the deep resolve never to open it again except under compulsion. Had the compulsion arisen? Evidently, for a few minutes later she was standing in one of the dim corners of Oliver's musty room, reopening a book which she had taken down from the shelves on her former visit. She remembered it from its torn back, and the fact that it was an algebra. Turning to the fly-leaf, she looked again at the names and schoolboy phrases she had seen scribbled all over its surface, for the one which she remembered as, I hate algebra. It had not been a very clear written algebra, and she would never have given this interpretation to the scrawl had she been in a better mood. Now another thought had come to her, and she wanted to see the word again. Was she glad or sorry to have yielded to this impulse, when by a closer inspection she perceived that the word was not algebra at all, but Algernon? I hate A. Etheridge. I hate A. E. I hate Algernon E all over the page, and here and there on other pages, sometimes in characters so rubbed and faint as to be almost unreadable, and again so pressed into the paper by a vicious pencil point as to have broken their way through to the leaf underneath, the work of an ill-conditioned schoolboy. But this hate dated back many years, paler than ever, and with hands trembling almost to the point of incapacity, she put the book back and flew to her own room, the prey of thoughts bitter, almost to madness. It was the second time in her life that she had been called upon to go through this precise torture. She remembered the hour only too well, when first it was made known to her that one in closest relation to herself was suspected of a hideous crime, and now, with her mind cleared towards him and readjusted to new developments, this crushing experience of seeing equal indications of guilt in another, almost as dear and almost as closely knit into her thoughts and future expectations as John had ever been. Can one endure a repetition of such horror? She had never gauged her strength, but it did not seem possible. 
besides of the two blows this seemed the heaviest and the most revolting then only her own happiness and honour were involved now it was reuther's and the fortitude which sustained her through the ignominy of her own trouble failed her at the prospect of reuther's and again the two cases were not equal her husband had had traits which in a manner had prepared her for the ready suspicion of people but oliver was a man of reputation and kindly heart and yet in the course of time this had come and the question once agitating her as to whether reuther was a fit mate for him had now evolved itself into this was he a fit mate for her she had rather have died nay have had reuther die than to find herself forced to weigh and decide so momentous a question for however she might feel about it not a single illusion remained as to whose hand had made use of john scoville's stick to strike down algernon etheridge how could she have when she came to piece the whole story together and weigh the facts she had accumulated against oliver with those which had proved so fatal to her husband first the uncontrolled temper of the lad hints of which she was daily receiving secondly his absolute if unreasonable hatred of the man thus brutally assailed she knew what such hatred was and how it eats into an undeveloped mind she had gone through its agonies herself when she was a young girl and knew its every stage with jealousy and personal distaste for a start it was easy to trace the revolt of this boyish heart from the intrusive ever-present mentor who not only shared his father's affections but made use of them to influence that father against the career he had chosen in favour of one he not only disliked but for which he lacked all aptitude she saw it all from the moment his pencil dug into the paper these tell-tale words i hate old e to that awful and final one when the detested student fell in the woods and his reign over the judgment as well as over the heart of judge ostrander was at an end in hate bitter boiling long repressed hate was found the motive for an act so out of harmony with the condition and upbringing of a lad like oliver she need look for no other but motive goes for little if not supported by evidence was it possible with this new theory for a basis to reconstruct the story of this crime without encountering the contradiction of some well-known fact she would see first this matter of the bludgeon left as her husband declared leaning against the old oak in the bottom of the ravine all knew the tree and just where it stood if oliver in his eagerness to head off heatheridge at the bridge had rushed straight down into the gully from ostrander lane he would almost strike this tree in his descent the diagram sketched on page one hundred and eighty five will make this plain what more natural then than for him to catch up the stick he saw there even if his mind had not been deliberately set on violence a weapon is a weapon and an angry man feels easier with something of the kind in hand armed then in this unexpected way but evidently not yet decided upon crime or why his nervous whittling of the stick he turned towards the bridge following the meandering of the stream which in time led him across the bare spot where she had seen the shadow that it was his shadow no one could doubt who knew all the circumstances and that she should have leant just long enough from the ruins to mark the shadow and take it for her husband's and not long enough to see the man himself and so detect her error was one of those anomalies of crime which make for judicial errors john scurrying away through the thicket towards claymore oliver threading his way down the ravine and she hurrying away from the ruin above her with her lost reuther in hand such was the situation at this critical moment afterwards when she came back for the child's bucket some power had withheld her from looking again into the ravine or she might have been witness to the meeting at the bridge and so been saved the misery and shame of believing as long as she did that the man who intercepted algernon etheridge at that place was her unhappy husband the knife with the broken point which she had come upon in her search among the lad's discarded effects proved only too conclusively that it was his hand which had whittled the end of the bludgeon for the bit of steel left in the wood and the bit lost from the knife were to her exact eye of the same size and an undoubted fit oliver's remorse the judge's discovery of his guilt a discovery which may have been soon but probably was late so late that the penalty of the doing had already been paid by the innocent can only be guessed from the terrible sequel a son dismissed a desolated home in which the father lived as a recluse how the mystery cleared as she looked at it the house barred from guests the double fence 
where hidden from all eyes the wretched father might walk his dreary round when night forbade him rest or memory became a whip of scorpions to lash him into fury or revolt the stairs never passed how could he look upon rooms where his wife had dreamed the golden dreams of motherhood and the boy passed his days of innocent youth ay and his own closed-up room guarded by bella from intrusion as long as breath remained to animate his sinking body what was its secret why oliver's portrait had this been seen marked as it was for all men's reprobation nothing could have stemmed inquiry and inquiry was to be dreaded as judge ostrander's own act had shown not till he had made his clumsy attempt to cover this memorial of love and guilt and rehanging it thus hidden where it would attract less attention had she been admitted to his room alas alas that he had not destroyed it then and there that clinging to habits old as his grief and the remorse which had undoubtedly devoured him for the part he had played in this case of perverted justice he had trusted to a sheet of paper to cover what nothing on earth could cover once justice were aroused or the wrath of god awakened deborah shuddered ay the mystery had cleared but only to enshroud her spirits anew and make her long with all her bursting heart and shuddering soul that death had been her portion before ever she had essayed to lift the veil held down so tightly by these two remorseful men but was her fault irremediable the only unanswerable connection between this old crime and oliver lay in the evidence she had herself collected as she had every intention of suppressing this evidence and as she had small dread of any one else digging out the facts to which she only possessed a clue might she not hope that any suspicions raised by her inquiries would fall like a house of cards when she withdrew her hand from the toppling structure she would make her first effort and see mr black had heard her complaint he should be the first to learn that the encouragement she had received was so small that she had decided to accept her present good luck without further query and not hark back to a past which most people had buried End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of dark hollow this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by michelle eaton dark hollow by anna katherine green chapter nineteen allanson black you began it as women begin most things without thought and a due weighing of consequences and now you propose to drop it in some freakish manner isn't that it deborah scover lifted her eyes in manifest distress and fixed them deprecatingly upon her interrogator she did not like his tone which was dry and suspiciously sarcastic and she did not like his attitude which was formal and totally devoid of all sympathy instinctively she pushed her veil still further from her features as she deprecatingly replied you are but echoing your sex in criticising mine as impulsive and you are quite within your rights in doing this women are impulsive they are even freakish but it is given to one now and then to recognise this fact and acknowledge it i hope i am of this number i hope that i have the judgment to see when i have committed a mistake and to stop short before i make myself ridiculous the lawyer smiled a tight-lipped acrid sort of smile which nevertheless expressed as much admiration as he had ever allowed himself to show judgment eh he echoed you stop because your judgment tells you that you are on the point of making a fool of yourself no other reason eh is not that the best which can be given a hard-headed clear-eyed lawyer like yourself would you have me go on with no real evidence to back my claims rouse up this town to reconsider his case when i have nothing to talk about but my husband's oath and a shadow i cannot verify then miss weeks neighbourliness failed in point she was not as interesting as you had a right to expect from my recommendation miss weeks is a very chatty and agreeable woman but she cannot tell what she does not know mr black smiled the woman delighted him the admiration which he had hitherto felt for her person and for the character which could so develop through misery and reproach as to make her in twelve short years the exponent of all that was most attractive and bewitching in woman seemed likely to extend to her mind sagacious eh and cautious eh he was hardly prepared for such perfection and let the transient lighting up of his features speak for him till he was ready to say 
you find the judge very agreeable now that you know him better yes mr black but what has that got to do with the point at issue and she smiled but not just in his manner nor with quite as little effect much he growled it might make it easier for you to reconcile yourself to the existing order of things i am reconciled to them simply from necessity was her gentle response nothing is more precious to me than reuther's happiness i should but endanger it further by raising false hopes that is why i have come to cry halt madam i commend your decision it is that of a wise and considerate woman your child's happiness is of course of paramount importance to you but why should you characterise your hopes as false just when there seems to be some justification for them her eyes widened and she regarded him with a simulation of surprise which interested without imposing upon him i do not understand you she said have you come upon some clue have you heard something which i have not the smile with which he seasoned his reply was of a very different nature from that which he had previously bestowed upon her it prepared her possibly for the shock of his words i hardly think so said he if i do not mistake we have been the recipients of the same communications she started to her feet but sat again instantly pray explain yourself she urged who has been writing to you and what have they written she added presuming a little upon her fascinations as a woman to win an honest response must i speak first if it was a tilt it was between even forces it would be gentlemanly in you to do so but i am not of a gentlemanly temper i do with no other said she but with what a glance and in what a tone a man may hold out long and if a lawyer and a bachelor more than long but there is a point at which he succumbs mr black had reached that point smoothing his brow and allowing a more kindly expression to creep into his regard he took two or three crushed and folded papers from a drawer beside him and holding them none too plainly in sight remarked very quietly but with legal firmness do not let us play about the bush any longer you have announced your intention of making no further attempt to discover the man who in your eyes merited the doom accorded to john scoville your only reason for this if you are the woman i think you lies in your fear of giving further opportunity to the misguided rancour of an irresponsible writer of anonymous epistles am i not right madam beaten beaten by a direct assault because she possessed the weaknesses as well as the pluck of a woman she could control the language of her lips but not their quivering she could meet his eye with steady assurance but she could not keep the pallor from her cheeks or subdue the evidences of her heart's turmoil her pitiful glance acknowledged her defeat which she already saw mirrored in his eyes taking it for an answer he said gently enough that we may understand each other at once i will mention the person who has been made the subject of these attacks he don't speak the name she prayed leaning forward and laying her gloved hand upon his sleeve it is not necessary the whole thing is an outrage of course he echoed with some of his natural brusqueness and the rank is folly but to some follies we have to pay attention and i fear that we shall have to pay attention to this one if only for your daughter reuther's sake you cannot wish her to become the butt of these scandalous attempts no no the words escaped her before she realized that in their utterance she had given up irretrievably her secret you consider them scandalous most scandalous she emphatically returned with a vivacity and seeming candour such as he had seldom seen equalled even on the witness stand his admiration was quite evident it did not prevent him however from asking quite abruptly in what shape and by what means did this communication reach you i found it lying on the walk between the gates the same by which judge ostrander leaves the house yes came in faint reply i see that you share my fears if one such scrap can be thrown over the fence why shouldn't another be men who indulge themselves in writing anonymous accusations seldom limit themselves to one effusion i will stake my word that the judge has found more than one on his lawn she could not have responded if she would her mouth was dry her tongue half paralysed what was coming the glint in the lawyer's eye forewarned her that something scarcely in consonance with her hopes and wishes might be expected the judge has seen and read these barefaced insinuations against his son and has not turned this whole town topsy-turvy what are we to think of that a lion does not stop to meditate he springs an archibald ostrander has the nature of a lion 
there is nothing of the fox or even of the tiger in him mrs scoville this is a very serious matter i do not wonder that you are a trifle overwhelmed by the results of your ill-considered investigations does the town know has the thing become a scandal a byword miss weeks gave no proof of ever having heard one word not to be foreseen business that is good news you relieve me perhaps it is not a general topic as yet then shortly and with lawyer-like directness show me the letter which has disturbed all your plans i haven't it here you didn't bring it no mr black why should i i had no premonition that i should ever be induced to show it to any one least of all to you look over these do they look at all familiar she glanced down at the crumpled sheets and half sheets he had spread out before her they were similar in appearance to the one she had picked up on the judge's grounds but the language was more forcible as witness these when a man is trusted to defend another on trial for his life he is supposed to know his business how come john scoville to hang without a thought being given to the man who hated a etheridge like poison i could name a certain chap who more than once in the old days boasted that he'd like to kill the fellow and it wasn't scoville or any one of his low-down stamp either a high and mighty name shouldn't shield a man who sent a poor unfriended wretch to his death in order to save his own bacon horrible murmured deborah drawing back in terror of her own emotion it's the work of some implacable enemy taking advantage of the situation i have created mr black this man must be found and made to see that no one will believe not even scoville's widow there you needn't go any further with that admonished the lawyer i will manage him but first we must make sure to rightly locate this enemy of the ostranders you do detect some resemblance between this writing and the specimen you have at home they are very much alike you believe one person wrote them i do have you any idea who this person is no why should i no suspicion not the least in the world i ask because of this he explained picking out another letter and smilingly holding it out towards her she read it with flushed cheeks listen to the lady you can't listen to any one nicer what she wants she can get there's a witness you never saw or heard of a witness they had never heard of what witness scarcely could she lift her eyes from the paper yet there was a possibility of course that this statement was a lie stuff isn't it muttered the lawyer never mind we'll soon have hold of the writer his face had taken on a much more serious aspect and she could no longer complain of his indifference or even of his sarcasm you will give me another opportunity of talking with you on this matter pursued he if you do not come here you may expect to see me at judge ostrander's i do not quite like the position into which you have been thrown by these absurd insinuations from some unknown person who may be thinking to do you a service but who you must feel is very far from being your friend it may even lead to your losing the home which has been so fortunately opened for you if this occurs you may count on my friendship mrs scoville i may have failed you once but i will not fail you twice surprised almost touched she held out her hand with a cordial thank you in which emotion struggled with her desire to preserve an appearance of complete confidence in judge ostrander and incidentally in his son then being on her feet by this time she turned to go anxious to escape further embarrassment from a perspicacity she no longer possessed the courage to meet the lawyer appeared to acquiesce in the movement of departure but when he saw her about to vanish through the door some impulse of compunction as real as it was surprising led him to call her back and seat her once more in the chair she had so lately left i cannot let you go he said until you understand that these insinuations from a self-called witness would not be worth our attention if there were not a few facts to give colour to his wild claims oliver ostrander was in that ravine connecting with dark hollow very near the time of the onslaught of mr etheridge and he certainly hated the man and wanted him out of the way the whole town knows that with one exception you know that exception i think so she acceded taking a fresh grip upon her emotions that this was anything more than a coincidence has never been questioned he was not even summoned as a witness with the judge's high reputation in mind i do not think a single person could have been found in those days to suggest any possible connection between this boy and a crime so obviously premeditated 
but people's minds change with time and events and oliver ostrander's name uttered in this connection to-day would not occasion the same shock to the community as it would have done then you understand me mrs scoville you allude to the unexplained separation between himself and father and not to any failure on his part to sustain the reputation of his family oh he has made a good position for himself and earned universal consideration but that doesn't weigh against the prejudices of people roused by such eccentricities as have distinguished the conduct of these two men alas she murmured frightened to the soul for the first time both by his manner and his words you know and i know he went on with a grimness possibly suggested by his subject that no mere whim lies back of such a preposterous seclusion as that of judge ostrander behind his double fence sons do not cut loose from fathers or fathers from sons without good cause you can see then that the peculiarities of their mutual history form but a poor foundation for any light refutation of this scandal should it reach the public mind judge ostrander knows this and you know that he knows this hence your distress have i not read your mind madam no one can read my mind any more than they can read judge ostrander's she avowed in a last desperate attempt to preserve her secret you may think you have done so but what assurance can you have of the fact you are strong in their defence said he and you will need to be if the matter ever comes up the shadows from dark hollow reach far and engulf all they fall upon mr black she had re-risen the better to face him you want something from me a promise or a condition no said he this is my affair only as it affects you i simply wish to warn you of what you might have to face and what judge ostrander will have to face here i drop the lawyer and speak only as a man if he is not ready to give a more consistent explanation of the curious facts i have mentioned i cannot warn him mr black you of course not nobody can warn him possibly no one should warn him but i have warned you and now as a last word let us hope that no warning is necessary and that we shall soon see the last of these calumniating letters and everything readjusted once more on a firm and natural basis judge ostrander's action in reopening his house in the manner and for the purpose he has has predisposed many in his favour it may before we know it make the past almost forgotten meanwhile you will make an attempt to discover the author of these anonymous attacks to save you from annoyance obliged to make an acknowledgment of the courtesy if not kindness prompting these words mrs scoville expressed her gratitude and took farewell in a way which did not seem to be at all displeasing to the crusty lawyer but when she found herself once more in the streets her anxiety and suspense took on a new phase what was at the bottom of mr black's contradictory assertions sympathy with her as he would have her believe or a secret feeling of animosity towards the man he openly professed to admire end of chapter nineteen recording by michelle eaton chapter twenty of dark hollow this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by michelle eaton dark hollow by anna katherine green chapter twenty what had made the change reuther sit up here close by mother and let me talk to you for a little while yes mother oh yes mother deborah felt the beloved head pressed close to her shoulder and two soft arms fall about her neck are you very unhappy is my little one pining too much for the old days a closer pressure of the head a more vehement clasp of the encircling arms but no words you have seemed brighter lately i have heard you sing now and then as if the joy of youth was not quite absent from your heart is that true or were you merely trying to cheer your mother i am afraid i was trying to cheer the judge came in low whisper to her ear when i hear his step in the study that monotonous tramp tramp which we both dread i feel such an ache here such a desire to comfort him that i try the one little means i have to divert him from his thoughts he must be so lonely without reuther you forgot how many years have passed since he had a companion a man becomes used to loneliness a judge with heavy cases on his mind must think and think very closely you know oh mamma 
It's not of his cases our judge is thinking when he walks like that. I know him too well, love him too well, not to feel the trouble in his step. I may be wrong, but all the sympathy and understanding I may not give to Oliver I devote to his father, and when he walks like that he seems to drag my heart after him. Mamma, mamma, do not blame me. I have just as much affection for you, and I suffer just as keenly when I see you unhappy. And, mamma, are you sure that you are quite happy today? You look as if something had happened to trouble you, something more than usual, I mean. They were sitting in the dark, with just the light of the stars shining through the upper panes of the one unshaded window. Deborah, therefore, had little to fear from her daughter's eye, only from the sensitiveness of her touch and the quickness of her ear. Alas, in this delicately organised girl, these were both attuned to the nicest discrimination, and before the mother could speak, Reuther had started up, crying. Oh, how your heart beats! Something has happened, darling mother, something which... Hush, Reuther, it is only this. When I came to Shelby, it was with a hope that I might some day smooth the way to your happiness. But it was only a wild dream, Reuther, and the hour has come for me to tell you so. What joys are left us must come in other ways. Love unblessed must be put aside resolutely and forever. She felt the shudder pass through the slender form which had thrown itself again at her side, but when the young girl spoke it was with unexpected bravery and calm. I have long ago done that, Mamma. I've had no hopes from the first. The look with which Oliver accepted my refusal to go on with the ceremony was one of gratitude, Mother. I can never forget that. Relief struggled with grief. Would you have me cherish any further illusions after that? Mrs. Scoville was silent. So, after all, Reuther had not been so blind on that day as she had always feared. Oliver has faults. Oh, let me talk about him just for once, darling mother. The poor stricken child babbled on. His temper is violent, or so he has often told me, coming and going like a gust of... No, mamma, don't make me stop. If he has faults, he has good traits too. He was always gentle with me, and if that faraway look you did not like would come at times and take him, as it were, out of our world, such a sweet awakening would follow, when he realised that I was waiting for his spirit to come back, that I never minded the mystery, in my joy at the comfort which my love gave him. My child, my child! Mother, I can soothe the father, but I can no longer soothe Oliver. That is my saddest thought. It makes me wish sometimes that he would find another loving heart on which he could lean without any self-reproach. I should soon learn to bear it. It would so assure his future and rid me of the fear that he may fail to hold the place he has won by such hard work and persistence. A moment's silence. Then at last appeal on the part of the mother. Reuther, have I ever been harsh to you? No, no. Then you will not think me unkind or even untender if I say that every loving thought you give now to Oliver is hurtful both to yourself and to me. Don't indulge in them, my darling. Put your heart into work or into music, and your mother will bless you. Won't it help you to know this, Reuther? Your mother, who has had her griefs, will bless you. Mother, mother. That night, at a later hour, Deborah struggled with a great temptation. The cat which hung in Oliver's closet, the knife which lay in the drawer of Oliver's desk, were to her mind positive proofs of his actual connection with the crime she now wished to see buried for all time in her husband's grave. The threat of that unknown inditer of mysterious letters, I know a witness, had sunk deep into her mind. A witness of what? Of anything which the discovery of these articles might substantiate? If so, what peril remained in their continued preservation, when an effort on her part might so easily destroy them? Sleep, long a stranger to her pillow, forsook her entirely as she faced this question and realised the gain in peace which might be hers if cap and knife were gone. Why then did she allow them to remain? The one in the closet, the other in the drawer, because she could not help herself. Instinct was against her meddling with these possible proofs of crime. But this triumph of conscience cost her dear. The next morning found her pale, almost as pale as Reuther. Was that why the judge surveyed her so intently as she poured out the coffee, and seemed, more than once, 
on the point of addressing her particularly as she went through the usual routine of tidying up his room. She asked herself this question more than once, and found it answered every time she hurried by the mirror. Certainly she showed a remarkable pallor. Knowing its cause herself, she did not invite his inquiries, and another day passed. With the following morning she felt strong enough to open the conversation which had now become necessary for her peace of mind. She waited till the moment when, her work all done, she was about to leave his presence, pausing till she caught his eye, which seemed a little loath, she thought, to look her way. She observed, with perhaps unnecessary distinctness, "'I hope that everything is to your mind, Judge Ostrander. I should be sorry not to make you as comfortable as is possible under the circumstances.' Roused a little suddenly, perhaps, from thoughts quite disconnected with those of material comfort, he nodded with the abstraction of one who recognises that some sort of acknowledgement is expected from him. Then, seeing her still waiting, added politely, "'I am very well looked after, if that is what you mean, Mrs. Scoville. Bella could not do any better if he ever did as well.' "'I am glad,' she replied, thinking with what humour this would have struck her once. "'I—I I ask because, having nothing on my mind but housekeeping, I desire to remedy anything which is not in accordance with your exact wishes. His attention was caught, and by the very phrase she desired. Nothing on your mind but housekeeping, he repeated. I thought you had something else of a very particular nature with which to occupy yourself. I had, but I have been advised against pursuing it. The folly was too great. Who advised you? The words came short and sharp, just as they must have come in those old days when he confronted his antagonists at the bar. Mr. Black, he was my husband's counsel, you remember. He says that I should only have my trouble for my pains, and I have come to agree with him. Reuther must content herself with the happiness of living under this roof, and I with the hope of contributing to your comfort. Had she impressed him? Had she played her part with success? Dare she lift her eye and meet the gaze she felt concentrated upon her? No, he must speak first, she must have some clue to the effect she had produced before she risked his penetration by a direct look. She had to wait longer than her beating heart desired. He had his own agitation to master, and possibly his own doubts. This was not the fiery, determined woman he had encountered amid the ruins of Spencer's folly. What had made the change? Black's discouraging advice? Hardly. Why should she take from that hard-faced lawyer what she had not been willing to take from himself. There must have been some other influencing cause. His look, his attitude, his voice, betrayed his hesitations as he finally remarked, Black is a man of excellent counsel, but he is hard as stone and not of the sort whose munitions I should expect to have weight with one like you. What did he put in the balance? Or what have others put in the balance to send your passionate intentions flying up to the beam? I should be glad to hear. Should she tell him? She had a momentary impulse that way. Then, the irrevocableness of such a move frightened her, and, pale with dismay at what she felt to be a narrow escape from a grave error of judgment, she answered with just enough truth for her to hope that the modicum of falsehood accompanying it would escape his attention. What has changed my intentions? My experience here, Judge Ostrander, with every day I pass under this roof, I realise more and more the mistake I made in supposing that any change in circumstances would make a union between our two children proper or feasible. Headstrong as I am by nature, I have still some sense of the fitness of things, and it is that sense awakened by a better knowledge of what the Ostrander name stands for, which has outweighed my hopes and mad intentions. I am sorry that I ever troubled you with them. The words were ambiguous, startlingly so she felt, but... In hope that they would strike him otherwise, she found courage at last to raise her eyes in search of what lay in his. Nothing, or so she thought at first, beyond the glint of a natural interest. Then her mind changed, and she felt that it would take one much better acquainted with his mood than herself to read to its depths a gaze so sombre and inscrutable. His answer, coming after a moment of decided suspense, only deepened this impression. It was to this effect. Madam, we have said our say on this subject. If you have come to see the matter as I see it, I can but congratulate you upon your good sense and express the hope that it will continue to prevail. Reuther is worthy of the best. 
he stopped abruptly reuther is a girl after my own heart he gently supplemented with a glance towards his papers lying in a bundle at his elbow and she shall not suffer because of this disappointment to her girlish hopes tell her so with my love it was a plain dismissal mrs scoville took it as such and quietly left the room as she did so she was approached by reuther who handed her a letter which had just been delivered it was from mr black and read thus we have found the rogue and have succeeded in inducing him to leave town he's a man in the bill-sticking business and he owns to a grievance against the person we know deborah's sleep that night was without dreams end of chapter twenty recording by michelle eaton chapter twenty one of dark hollow this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by michelle eaton dark hollow by anna katherine green chapter twenty one in the courtroom about this time the restless pacing of the judge in his study at night became more frequent and lasted longer in vain reuther played her most cheerful airs and sang her sweetest songs the monotonous tramp kept up with a regularity nothing could break he's worried by the big case now being tried before him deborah would say when reuther's eyes grew wide and misty in her sympathetic trouble and there was no improbability in the plea for it was a case of much moment and of great local interest a man was on trial for his life and the circumstances of the case were such that the feeling called forth was unusually bitter so much so indeed that every word uttered by the counsel and every decision made by the judge were discussed from one end of the county to the other and in shelby if nowhere else took precedence of all other topics though it was a presidential year and party sympathies ran high the more thoughtful spirits were inclined to believe in the innocence of the prisoner but the lower elements of the town moved by class prejudice were bitterly antagonistic to his cause and loud for his conviction did the judge realise his position and the effect made upon the populace by his very evident leaning towards this dissipated but well-connected young man accused of a crime so brutal that he must either have been the sport of most malicious circumstances or a degenerate of the worst type the time of judge ostrander's office was nearly up and his future continuance on the bench might very easily depend upon his attitude at the present hearing yet he without apparent recognition of this fact showed without any hesitancy or possibly without self-consciousness the sympathy he felt for the man at the bar and ruled accordingly almost without variation no wonder he paced the floor as the proceedings drew towards its close and the inevitable hour approached when a verdict must be rendered mrs scoville reading his heart by the light of her recent discoveries understood as nobody else the workings of his conscious and passion of sympathy which this unhappy father must have for misguided youth she began to fear for his health and count the days till this ordeal was over in other regards quiet had come to them all and less tempestuous fears could the judge but weather the possible conviction of this man and restrain himself from a disclosure of his own suffering more cheerful days might be in store for them for no further missives were to be seen on the lawn nor had anything occurred for days to recall to deborah's mind the move she had made towards re-establishing her husband's innocence a week passed and the community was all in agog in anticipation of the judge's charge in the case just mentioned it was to be given at noon and mrs scoville conscious that he had not slept an hour the night before having crept down more than once to listen if his step had ceased approached him as he prepared to leave the house for the courtroom and anxiously asked if he were quite well oh yes i'm well he responded sharply looking about for reuther the young girl was standing a little behind him with his gloves in her hand a custom she had fallen into in her desire to have his last look and fond good morning come here child said he in a way to make her heart beat and as he took the gloves from her hand he stooped and kissed her on the forehead something he had never done before 
Let me see you smile, said he. It's a memory I like to take with me into the courtroom. But when, in her pure delight at his caress, and the fatherly feeling which gave a tremor to his simple request, she lifted her face with that angelic look of hers, which was far sweeter and far more moving than any smile, he turned away abruptly, as though he had been more hurt than comforted, and strode out of the house without another word. Deborah's hand went to her heart, in the dark corner whither she had withdrawn herself, and when she turned again towards the spot where Ruth had stood, it was in some fear, lest she had betrayed her understanding of this deeply tried father's passionate pain. But Ruther was no longer there. She had fled quickly away, with the memory of what was to make this day a less dreary one for her. Morning passed and the noon came, bringing Deborah an increased uneasiness. When lunch was over and Ruther sat down to her piano, the feeling had grown into an obsession, which soon resolved itself into a definite fear. What if an attack such as I once saw should come upon him while he sits upon the bench? Why have I not thought of this before? Oh, God, these evil days, when will they be over? She found herself so restless that she decided upon going out. Donning her quietest gown and veil, she looked in on Ruther and expressed her intention, then slipped out of the front door, hardly knowing whither her feet would carry her. They did not carry her far, not at this moment at least. On the walk outside she met Miss Weeks, hurrying towards her from the corner, stumbling in her excitement, and so weakened in body or spirit, that she caught at the unresponsive fence for the support which its smooth surface refused to give her. At sight of Deborah's figure, she paused and threw up her hands. "'Oh, Mrs. Scoville, such a dreadful thing!' she cried. "'Look here!' And opening one of her hands, she showed a few torn scraps of paper, whose familiarity made Deborah's blood run cold. "'On the bridge!' gasped the little lady, leaning against the fence for support. "'Pasted on the railing of the bridge. I should never have seen it, nor looked at it, if it hadn't been that I—' "'Don't tell me here,' urged Deborah. "'Let's go over to your house. See, there are people coming.' The little lady yielded to the other's constraining hand, and together they crossed the street. Once in the house, Deborah allowed her full apprehension to show itself. What were the words? What was on the paper? Anything about... The little woman's look of horror stopped her. It's a lie, an awful, abominable lie. But think of such a lie being pasted up on that dreadful bridge for anyone to see. After twelve years, Mrs. Scoville, after... But her indignation changed suddenly into suspicion, and eyeing her visitor with sudden disfavour, she cried, This is your work, madam. Your inquiries and your talk of John Scoville's innocence has sent wagging all the villainous tongues in town, and I remember something else, how you came smirking into this very room one day with your talk about caps and Oliver Ostrander's doings on the day when Algernon Etheridge was murdered. You were in search of information, I see, information against the best, the brightest. Well, why don't you speak? I'll give you the chance if you want it. Don't stand looking at me like that. I'm not used to it, Mrs. Scoville. I'm a peaceable woman, and I'm not used to it. Miss Weeks. Ah, the oil of that golden speech on troubled waters. What was its charm? What message did it carry from Deborah's warm, true heart that its influence should be so miraculous? Miss Weeks, you have forgotten my interest in Oliver Ostrander. He was my daughter's lover. He was my own ideal of a gifted, kind-hearted, if somewhat mysterious young man. No calumny uttered against him can awaken in you half the sorrow and indignation it does in me. Let me see those lines or what there is left of them, so that I may share your feelings. They must be dreadful. They are more than dreadful. I don't know how I had strength to pull these pieces off. I couldn't have done it if they'd been quite dry. But what do you want to see them for? I'd have left them there if I'd been willing to have them seen. They are for the kitchen fire. Wait a moment, and then we will talk. But Deborah had no mind to let these pieces escape her eye. Sick as she felt at heart, she exerted herself to win the little woman's confidence, and when Deborah exerted herself, even under such adverse conditions as these, she seldom failed to succeed. Nor did she fail now. At the end of fifteen minutes, she had the torn bits of paper arranged in their proper position and was reading these words. 
the scene of oliver's crime nothing could be more explicit nothing more damaging as the glances of the two women met it would be difficult to tell on which face distress hung out the whiter flag the beginning of the end was deborah's thought if after mr black's efforts a charge like this is found posted up in the public ways the ruin of the ostranders is determined upon and nothing we can do can stop it in five minutes more she had said good-bye to miss weeks and was on her way to the courthouse this building occupied one end of a large paved square in the busiest part of the town as deborah approached it she was still further alarmed by finding this square full of people standing in groups or walking impatiently up and down with their eyes fixed on the courthouse doors the case which had agitated the whole country for days was now in the hands of the jury and a verdict was momentarily expected so much for appearances outside within there was the uneasy hum the anxious look the subdued movement which marks a universal suspense announcement had been made that the jury had reached their verdict and counsel were resuming their places and the judge his seat those who had eyes only for the latter and these were many noticed a change in him he looked older by years than when he delivered his charge not the prisoner himself gave greater evidence of the effect which this hour of waiting had had upon a heart whose covered griefs were consciously or unconsciously revealing themselves to the public eye he did not wish this man sentenced this was shown by his charge, the most one-sided one he had given in all his career. Yet the man awaiting verdict had small claim to his consideration, none. In fact, save that he was young and well-connected, facts in his favour with which the people who had packed the courthouse that day had little sympathy, as their cold looks proved. To Deborah, who had succeeded in getting a seat in a remote and inconspicuous corner, these looks conveyed a spirit of so much threat that she gazed about her in wonder that so few saw where the real tragedy in this room lay but the jury is now seated and the clatter of moving feet which but for a moment before filled the great room sinks as if under a charm and silence that awesome precursor of doom lay in all its weight upon every ear and heart as the clerk advancing with the cry order in the court put his momentous question gentlemen of the jury are you ready with your verdict a hush then the clear voice of the foreman we are how do you find guilty or not guilty another hesitation did the foreman feel the threat lurking in the air about him if so he failed to show it in his tones as he uttered the words which released the prisoner not guilty a growl from the crowd almost like that of a beast stirring its lair then a quick cessation of all hubbub as every one turned to the judge to whose one-sided charge they attributed this release again he was a changed man with the delivery of this verdict he had regained his natural poise and never had he looked more authoritative or more preeminently the dominating spirit of the court than in the few following moments in which he expressed the thanks of the court to the jury and dismissed the prisoner and yet though each person there from the disappointed prosecutor to the least aggressive spectator appeared to feel the influence of a presence and voice difficult to duplicate on the bench of this country deborah experienced in her quiet corner no alleviation of the fear which had brought her into this forbidding spot and held her breathless through all of these formalities for the end was not yet through all the turmoil of noisy departure and the drifting out into the square of a vast dissatisfied throng she had caught the flash of a bit of paper how introduced into this moving mass of people no one ever knew passing from hand to hand towards the solitary figure of the judge who had not as yet left his seat she knew no one better what this meant an instinct bade her cry out and bid those thoughtless hands to cease their work and let this letter drop but her discretion still held and subduing the mad impulse she watched with dilating eyes and heaving breast the slow passage of this fatal note through the now rapidly thinning crowd its delay as it reached the open space between the last row of seats and the judge's bench and its final delivery by some officious hand who thrust it upon his notice just as he was rising to leave the picture he made in that instant of hesitation never left her mind 
to the end of her days she will carry a vision of his tall form imposing in his judicial robes and with the majesty of his office still upon him fingering this envelope in sight of such persons as still lingered in his part of the room nemesis was lowering its black wings over his devoted head and with feelings which left her dazed and transfixed in silent terror deborah saw his finger tear its way through the envelope and his eyes fall frowningly on the paper he drew out then the people's counsel and the counsel for the defence and such clerks and hangers-on as still lingered in the upper end of the room experienced a decided sensation the judge who a moment before had towered above them all in melancholy but impressive dignity shrunk with one gasp into feebleness and sank back stricken if not unconscious into his chair was it a stroke or just one of his attacks of which all had heard was he aware of his own condition and the disturbance it caused or was he on the contrary dead to his own misery and oblivious of the rush which was made from all sides to his assistance even deborah could not tell and was forced to sit quiet in her corner waiting for the parting of the group which hid the judge from her sight it happened suddenly and showed her the same figure she had seen once before a man with faculties suspended but not impaired facing them all with open gaze but absolutely dead for the moment to his own condition and to the world about but horrible as this was what she saw going on behind him was infinitely worse a man had caught up the bit of paper judge ostrander had let fall from his hand and was opening his lips to read it to the curious people surrounding him she tried to stop him she forced a cry to her lips which should have rung through the room but which died away on the air unheard the terror which had paralysed her limbs had choked her voice but her ears remained true low as he spoke no trumpet call could have made its meaning clearer to deborah scoville than did these words we know why you favour criminals twelve years is a long time but not long enough to make wise men forget end of chapter twenty one recording by Michelle Eaton. Chapter twenty two of Dark Hollow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Eaton. Dark Hollow by Anna Catherine Green. Chapter twenty two before the gates had she not caught the words themselves she would have recognised their import from the blighting effect they produced upon the persons grouped within hearing schooled as most of them were to face with minds secure and tempers quite unruffled the countless surprises of a courtroom they paled at the insinuation conveyed in these two sentences and with scarcely the interchange of a glance or word drew aside in a silence which no man seemed inclined to break as for the people still huddled in the doorway, they rushed away helter-skelter into the street, there to proclaim the judge's condition and its probable cause, an event which to many quite eclipsed in interest the more ordinary one which had just released to freedom a man seemingly doomed. Few persons were now left in the great room, and Deborah, embarrassed to find that she was the only woman present, was on the point of escaping from her corner, when she perceived a movement take place in the rigid form from which she had not yet withdrawn her eyes and regarding judge ostrander more attentively she caught the gleam of his suspicious eye as it glanced this way and that to see if his lapse of consciousness had been noticed by those about him would the man still in possession of the paper whose contents had brought about this attack understand these evidences of apprehension yes and what is more he seems to take such means as offers to hide from the judge all knowledge of the fact that any other eyes than his own have read those invidious words with unexpected address he waits for the judge to turn his head aside when with a quick and dexterous movement he so launches the paper from his hand that it falls softly and without flurry within an inch of the judicial seat then he goes back to his papers this suggestion at once so marked and so delicate did not fail of its effect upon those about wherever the judge looked he saw abstracted faces and busy hands and taking heart at not finding himself watched he started to rise then memory came blasting overwhelming memory of the letter he had been reading 
and rousing with a start he looked down at his hand then at the floor before him and seeing the letter lying there picked it up with a secret sidelong glance to right and left which sank deep into the heart of the still watchful deborah if those about him saw they made no motion not an eye looked round and not a head turned as he straightened himself and proceeded to leave the room only deborah noted how his steps faltered and how little he was to be trusted to find his way unguided to the door it lay to the right and he was going left now he stumbles isn't there any one to yes she is not the sole one on watch the same man who had read aloud the note and then dropped it within his reach had stepped after him and kindly if artfully turned him towards the proper place of exit as the two disappear deborah wakes from her trance and finding herself alone amongst the seats hurries to quit her corner and leave the building the glare the noise of the square as she dashes down into it seems for the moment unendurable the pushing panting mass of men and women of which she has now become a part closes about her and for the moment she can see nothing but faces faces with working mouths and blazing eyes a medley of antagonistic expression all directed against herself or so she felt in the heat of her self-consciousness but after the first recoil she knew that no such universal recognition could be hers that she was merely a new and inconsiderable atom caught in a wave of feeling which engulfed all it met that this mob was not raised from the stones to overwhelm her but him and that if she flew it should be to his aid and not to save herself but how was she to reach him he would not come out by the main entrance that she knew where look for him then suddenly she remembered and using some of her strength of which she had good measure and more of that address to which i had already alluded she began to worm herself along through this astounding collection of people much too large already for the ordinary force of police to handle to that corner of the building where a small door opened upon a rear street she remembered it from those old days when she had once entered this courthouse as a witness but alas others knew it also and thick as the crowd was in front it was even thicker here and far more tumultuous word had gone about that the father of oliver ostrander had been given his lesson at last and the curiosity of the populace had risen to fever heat in their anxiety to see how the proud ostrander would bear himself in his precipitate downfall they had crowded there to see and they would see were he to shirk the ordeal were he to wait for the square to be cleared but they knew him too well to fear this he will come nay he is coming now and coming alone no other figure looms so grandly in a doorway nor is there any other face in shelby whose pallor could strike so coldly to the heart or rouse such conflicting emotions he was evidently not prepared to see his path quite so heavily marked out for him by the gaping throng but after one look he assumed some show of his old commanding presence and advanced bravely down the steps a wing some and silencing all until he had reached his carriage step and the protection of the officers on guard then a hoot rose from some far-off quarter of the square and he turned short about and the people saw his face despair had seized it and if any one there desired vengeance he had it the knell of active life had been rung for this man he would never remount the courthouse steps or face again a respectful jury as for deborah she had shrunk out of sight at his approach but as soon as he had ridden off she looked eagerly for a taxicab to carry her in his wake she could not let him ride that mile alone she was still fearful for him though the mass of people about her was rapidly dissolving away and the streets growing clear but an apprehension still greater because more personal seized her when she found herself behind him on the long road several minutes had been lost in obtaining a taxicab and she feared that she would be unable to overtake him before he reached his own gates this would be to subject reuther to a shock which the poor child had little strength to meet she could not escape the truth long soon very soon she would have to be told that the man who stood so high in her esteem was now regarded as a common criminal but she must be prepared for the awful news she must be within reach of her mother's arms when the blow fell destroying her past as well as her future were minutes really so long the house really so far away deborah gazes eagerly forward there is very little traffic in the streets to-day and the road ahead looks clear too clear 
she cannot even see the dust raised by the judge's rapidly disappearing carriage can he have arrived home already no or the carriage would be coming back and not a vehicle is in view her anxiety increases she has reached the road debouching towards the bridge has crossed it is drawing near nearer when what is this men women coming from the right coming from the left running out of houses flocking from every side street filling up the road a lesser mob than that from which she had just escaped but still a mob and all making for one point the judge's house and he she can see his carriage now held up for a moment by the crowd it has broken through and is rolling quickly towards ostrander lane but the mob is following and she is yet far behind shouting to the chauffeur to hasten the insistent honk honk of the cab adds its raucous note to the turmoil they have dashed through one group they are dashing through another naught can withstand an onrushing automobile she catches glimpses of raised arms threatening retaliation of eager stolid uncertain and furious faces and her breath held back during that one instant of wild passage rushes pantingly forth again ostrander lane is within sight if only they can reach it if only they can cross it but they cannot without sowing death in their track no scattered groups here the mob fills the corner it is packed close as a wall brought up against it the motor necessarily comes to a standstill balked no not yet opening the door deborah leaps to the ground and in one instant finds herself but a moat in this seethe of humanity in vain her efforts she cannot move arm or limb the gate is but a few paces off but all hope of reaching it is futile she can only hold herself still and listen as all around are listening but to what to nothing it is expectation which holds them all silent she will have to wait until the crowd sways apart allowing her to ah there some heads are moving now she catches one glimpse ahead of her and sees what does she see the noble but shrunk figure of the judge drawn up before his gate his lips are moving but no sound issues from them and while those about are waiting for his words they peer with an insolence barely dashed by awe at his white head and his high fence and now at the gate swerving gently inward under the hand of someone whose figure is invisible but no words coming a change passes like a stroke of lightning over the surging mass someone shouts out coward another traitor and the lifted head falls the moving lips cease from their efforts and in place of the great personality which filled their eyes a moment before they see a man entrapped waking to the horror of a sudden death in life for which no visions of the day no dreams of the night had been able to prepare him it was a sight to waken pity not derision but these people had gathered here in a bitter mood and their rancour had but scented the prey calls of oliver and such threats as you saved him at a poor man's expense but we'll have him yet we'll have him yet began to rise about him followed by endless repetitions of the name from near and far oliver 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 his own lips seemed to re-echo the word then like a lion baited beyond his patience the judge lifted his head and faced them all with a fiery intensity which for the moment made him a terrible figure to contemplate let no one utter that name to me here shot from his lips in tones of unspeakable menace and power spare me that name or the curse of my ruined life be upon you i can bear no more to-day thrilled by his aspect cowering under his denunciation emphasized as it was by a terrifying gesture the people pressing closest about him drew back and left the passage open to the gate he took it with a bound and would have entered but that from the outskirts of the crowd where his voice had not reached the cry arose again of oliver oliver the sons of the rich go free but ours have to hang at which he turned his head about gave them one stare and fell back against the door it yielded and a woman's arms received him the gentle reuther in that hour of dire extremity showed herself stronger than her mother who had fallen in a faint amid the crowd end of chapter twenty two recording by michelle eaton Chapter Twenty Three of Dark Hollow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Dark Hollow by Anna Catherine Green. Chapter 23 The Misfortunes of My House. To one who swoons but seldom, the moment of returning consciousness is often fraught with great pain and sometimes with unimaginable horror. It was such to Deborah the pain and horror holding her till her eyes accustomed to realities again saw in the angel face which floated before her vision amid a swarm of demon masks the sweet and solicitous countenance of reuther as she took this in she took in other facts also that there were no demons no strangers even about her that she and her child were comparatively alone in their own little parlor and that Reuther's sweet face wore a look of lofty courage which reminded her of something she could not at the moment grasp, but which was so beautiful. At that instant her full memory came, and, uttering a low cry, she started up, and struggling to her feet, confronted her child, this time with a look full of agonized inquiry. Reuther seemed to understand her, for, taking her mother's hand in hers, she softly said, I knew you were not seriously ill, only frightened by the crowd and their senseless shoutings. Don't think of it any more, dear mother. The people are dispersing now, and you will soon be quite restored and ready to smile with us at an attack so groundless it is little short of absurd. Astounded at such tranquillity, where she had expected anguish, if not stark unreason, doubting her eyes, her ears, for this was no longer her delicate suffering Reuther to be shielded from all unhappy knowledge, but a woman, as strong, if not as wise to the situation, as herself. She scrutinized the child closely, then turned her gaze slowly about the room, and started in painful surprise as she perceived standing, in the space behind her, the tall figure of Judge Ostrander. He and she must face him the man whom she by her blind and untimely efforts to regain happiness for reuther had brought to this woeful pass the ordeal was too bitter for her broken spirit and shrinking aside she covered her face with her hands like one who stands detected in a guilty act pardon she entreated forgetting reuther's presence in her consciousness of the misery she had brought upon her benefactor i never meant I never dreamed oh no apologies was this the judge speaking the tone was an admonitory not a suffering one it was not even that of a man humiliated or distressed you have had an unfortunate experience but that is over now and so must your distress be then as in her astonishment she dropped her hands and looked up he added very quietly your daughter has been much disturbed about you but not at all about oliver or his good name she knows my son too well, and so do you and I, to be long affected by the virulent outcries of a mob seeking for an object upon which to expend their spleen. Swaying yet in body and mind, quite unable in the turmoil of her spirits to reconcile the strong and steady man with the crushed and despairing figure she had so lately beheld, shrinking under the insults of the crowd deborah was glad to sit silent under this open rebuke and listen to reuther's ingenious declarations though she knew that they brought no conviction and distilled no real comfort either to his mind or hers yes mother darling the young girl was saying these people have not seen oliver in years but we have and nothing they can say nothing that any one can say but himself could ever shake my belief in him as a man incapable of a really wicked act he might be capable of striking a sudden blow most men are under great provocation but to conceal such a fact to live for years enjoying the respect of all who knew him with the knowledge festering in his heart of another having suffered for his crime that that would be impossible to oliver ostrander some words ring in the heart long after their echo has left the ear impossible deborah stole a look at the judge but he was gazing at reuther where he well might gaze if his sinking heart craved support or his abashed mind sought to lose itself in the enthusiasm of this pure soul with its loving uncalculating instincts am i not right mother ah must she answer that 
tell the judge who is as confident of oliver as i am myself that you are confident too that you could no more believe him capable of this abominable act than you could believe it of my father i will tell the judge stammered the unhappy mother judge she briefly declared as she rose with the help of her daughter's arm my mind agrees with yours in this matter what you think i think and that was all she could say as she fell again into her seat the judge turned to reuther leave your mother for a little while he urged with that rare gentleness he always showed her let her rest here a few minutes longer alone with me yes reuther murmured deborah seeing no way of avoiding this inevitable interview i'm feeling better every minute i will come soon the young girl's eye faltered from one to the other and then settled with a strange and imploring look upon her mother had her clear intelligence pierced at last to the core of that mother's misery had she seen what deborah would have spared her at the cost of her own life it would seem so for when the mother with great effort began some conciliatory speech the young girl smiled with a certain sad patience and turning towards judge ostrander said as she softly withdrew you have been very kind to allow me to mention a name and discuss a subject you have expressly forbidden i want to show my gratitude judge ostrander by never referring to it again without your permission that you know my mind here her head rose with a sort of lofty pride which lent a dazzling quality to her usually quiet beauty and that i know yours is quite enough for me a noble girl a mate for the best fell from the judge's lips after a silence disturbed only by the faint far-off murmur of a slowly dispersing throng deborah made no answer she could not yet trust her courage or her voice the judge who was standing near concentrated his look upon her features still she made no effort to meet his eye he did not speak and the silence grew appalling to break it he stepped away and took a glance out of the window there was nothing to be seen there the fence hid all but he continued to look the shadows from his soul settling deeper and deeper upon his countenance as each heavy moment dragged by when he finally turned it was with a powerful effort which communicated itself to her and forced her long bowed head to rise and her troubled mind to disclose itself you wish to express your displeasure and hesitate on account of reuther she faltered you need not we are quite prepared to leave your house if our presence reminds you too much of the calamity i have brought upon you by my inconsiderate revival of a past that you had every reason to believe buried his reply was uttered with great courtesy madam said he i have never had a thought from the first moment of your coming of any change in the arrangements we then entered into nor is the demonstration we have just witnessed a calamity of sufficient importance to again divide this household to connect my high-minded son with a crime for which he had no motive and from which he could reap no benefit is if you will pardon my plain speaking at a moment so critical even greater folly than to exculpate after all these years the man whom a conscientious jury found guilty only a mob could so indulge itself individuals will not dare she thought of the letter which had been passed up to him in court and surveyed him with an astonishment she made no effort to conceal never had she felt at a greater disadvantage with him never had she understood him less was this attempt at unconcern so pitiably transparent to her made in an endeavor to probe her mind or to deceive his own in her anxiety to determine she hesitatingly remarked not the man who writes those anonymous letters letters involuntarily his hand flew to one of his inner pockets yes you have found them have you not lying about the grounds no he looked startled explain yourself said he what letters not such as again his hand went to his pocket but shrunk hastily back as she pulled out a crumpled bit of paper and began to smooth it out for his perusal what have you there he cried such a letter as i speak of judge ostrander i picked it up from the walk a day or so ago perhaps you have come upon the like no 
why should i he had started back but his eye falling involuntarily upon the words she had spread out before him he rapidly read them and aghast at their import glanced from the paper to her face and back again crying he means oliver we have an enemy mrs scoville an enemy do you know here he leaned forward and plunged his eye now burning with many passions into hers who this enemy is yes softly as the word came it seemed to infuriate him seizing her by the arm he was about to launch against her the whole weight of his aroused nature when she said simply he is a common bill poster i took pains to find this out i was as interested as you could be to discover the author of such an outrage a bill poster yes judge ostrander what is his name i do not know i only know that he is resolved upon making you trouble it was he who incited this riot he did it by circulating anonymous missives and by forgive me for telling you this affixing scrawls of the same ambiguous character on fences and on walls and even on on here terror tied her tongue for his hand had closed about her arm in a forceful grip and the fire in the eye holding hers was a consuming one the rails of of bridges ah the cry was involuntary but not so the steady settling of the lips which followed it and the determined poise of his body as he waited for her next word miss weeks the little lady opposite saw the latter and tore it off but the mischief had already spread oh strike me send me from your house he gave no token of hearing her why is this man my enemy he asked i do not know any such person as you describe nor i she answered more quietly a bill poster well he has done his worst i shall think no more about him and the burning eye grew mild and the working lip calm again with a determination too devoid of sarcasm to be false it was a change for which deborah was in no wise prepared she showed her amazement as ingeniously as a child and he observing it remarked in a different tone from any he had used yet you do not look well you are still suffering from the distress and confusion into which this wretched swoon has thrown you or can it be that you are not yet convinced of our wisdom in ignoring this diabolical attack upon one whose reputation is as dear to us as our own if that is so and i see that it is let me remind you of a fact which cannot be new to you if it is to others of happier memories that no accusation of this kind however plausible and this is not plausible can hold its own for a day without evidence to back it and there is no evidence against my son in this ancient matter of my friend etheridge's violent death save the one coincidence known to many that he chanced to be somewhere in the ravine at that accursed hour a petty point upon which to hang this late and elaborate insult of suspicion and his voice rang out in a laugh but not as it would have rung or as deborah thought it would have rung had his mind been as free as his words when it had quite ceased deborah threw off the last remnant of physical as well as moral weakness and deliberately rose to her feet she believed she understood him now and she respected the effort he was making and would have seconded it gladly had she dared but she did not dare if he were really as ignorant as he appeared of the extent of the peril threatening oliver's good name if he had cheated himself during these long years into supposing that the secret which had undermined his own happiness was an unshared one and that his own conduct since that hour he had characterized as accursed had given no point to the charges that had just been hurled against his son then he ought to be undeceived and that right speedily evidence did exist connecting oliver with this crime evidence as sure nay yet surer than that raised against her husband and no man's laughter no not even his father's least of all his father's could cover up the fact or avail against the revelations which must follow now that the scent was on honoring as she did the man before her understanding both his misery and the courage he displayed in this superhuman effort to hide his own convictions she gathered up all her resources and with a resolution no less brave than his said firmly you are too respected in this town judge ostrander for any collection of people however thoughtless or vile 
to so follow the lead of a low-down miscreant as to greet you to your face with these damaging assertions unless they thought they had evidence and good evidence too with which to back these assertions it was the hurling of an arrow poisoned at the point the launching of a bomb into the very citadel of his security had he burst into outbreak gripped her again or fiercely shown her to the door she would not have been astonished indeed she was prepared for some such result but it did not come on the contrary his answer was almost mild though tinged for the first time with a touch of that biting sarcasm for which he had once been famous if they had not thought he repeated if you had said if they had not known then i might indeed have smelt danger people think strange things perhaps you think them too i the moment was critical she saw now that he was sounding her had been sounding her from the first should she let everything go and let him know her mind or should she continue to conceal it in either course lay danger if not to herself and reuther then to himself and oliver she decided for the truth subterfuge had had its day the menace of the future called for the strongest weapons which lie at the hand of man she therefore answered yes i have been thinking and this is the result you must either explain publicly and quite satisfactorily to the people of this town the mystery of your long separation from oliver and the life you have since led in this trebly barred house or accept the opprobrium of such accusations as we have listened to to-day there is no middle course judge ostrander i who have loved oliver almost like a son who have a daughter who not only loves him but regards him as a perfect model of noble manhood tell you so though it breaks my heart to do it i cannot see you both fall headlong to destruction for lack of understanding the nearness or the depth of the precipice you are approaching so the ejaculation came after a moment of intense silence a silence during which she seemed to discern the sturdiness of years drop slowly away from him so that is the explanation which people give to my desire for retirement and a life of contemplation well he slowly added with a halting utterance of one to whom each word is an effort i can see some justification for their conclusions now i have been too self-centred and too short-sighted to recognize my own folly i might have known that anything out of the common course rouses a curiosity which supplies its own explanation at any cost to propriety or respect i have courted my own doom i am the victim of my own mistake but he continued with a flash of his old fire which made him a dignified figure again i am not going to cringe because i have lost ground in the first skirmish i come of fighting blood oliver's reputation shall not suffer long whatever i may have done in my parental confidence to endanger it i have not spent ten years at the bar and fifteen on the bench for nothing let the people look to it I will stand by my own he had as completely forgotten her as if she had never existed john scoville his widow even the child bowed under troubles not unlike his own had faded alike from his consciousness but the generous deborah felt no resentment at the determination which would only press her and hers deeper into contumely she had seen the father in the man for the first time and her whole heart went out in passionate sympathy which blinded her to everything but her present duty alas that it should be so hard a one alas that instead of encouraging him she must point out the one weakness of his cause which he did not or would not see that is his own conviction of his absent son's guilt as typified by the line he had deliberately smeared across oliver's pictured countenance the task seemed so difficult the first step so blind that she did not know how to begin and stood staring at him with interest and dread struggling for mastery in her heavily laboring breast did he perceive this or was it the silence which drew his attention to her condition and the evil still threatening him whichever it was the light vanished from his face as he surveyed her and it was with a return of his old manner 
that he finally observed you are keeping something from me some fancy discovery some clue as they call it to what you may consider my dear boy's guilt with a deep breath she woke from her trance of indecision and letting forth the full passion of her nature she cried out in her anguish i have but one answer for that judge ostrander look into your own heart question your own conscience i have seen what reveals it i she stopped appalled rage such as she had never even divined spoke from every feature he was no longer the wretched but calmly reasoning man but a creature hardly human and when he spoke it was in a frenzy which swept everything before it you have seen he shouted you have broken your promise you have touched what you were forbidden to touch you have not so she broke in softly but very firmly i have touched nothing that i was told not to nor have i broken any promise i simply saw more than i was expected to i suppose of the picture which fell the day you first allowed me to enter your study is that true it is true they were whispering now drawing a deep breath he gathered up his faculties upon such accidents he muttered hang the fate and honor of men and you have gossiped about this picture he again vociferated with sudden and unrestrained violence told reuther told others no the denial was peremptory not to be disbelieved what i have learned i have kept religiously to myself alas she half moaned half cried that i should feel the necessity madam he was searching her eyes searching her very soul as men seldom search the mind of another you believe in the truth of these calumnies that have just been shouted in our ears you believe what they say of oliver you with every prejudice in his favor with every desire to recognize his worth you who have shown yourself ready to drop your husband's cause though you consider it an honest one when you saw what havoc it would entail to my boy's repute you believe and on what evidence he broke in because of the picture yes and the coincidence of his presence in the ravine yes but these are puerile reasons he was speaking peremptorily now and with all the weight of a master mind and you are not the woman to be satisfied with anything puerile there is something back of all this something you have not imparted what is that something tell tell oliver was a mere boy in those days and a very passionate one he hated etheridge the obtrusive mentor who came between him and yourself hated yes hated yes there is proof of his hate yes judge he did not ask where possibly he knew and because he did not ask she did not tell him holding on to her secret in a vague hope that so much at least might never see light i knew the boy shrank sometimes from algernon's company the judge admitted after another glance at her face but that means nothing in a boy full of his own affairs what else have you against him speak up i can bear it all he handled the stick that that oliver yes never now you have gone mad madam i would be willing to end my days in an asylum if that would disprove this fact but madam what proof what reason can you have for an assertion so monstrous you remember the shadow i saw which was not that of john scoville the person who made that shadow was whittling a stick that was a trick of oliver's i have heard that he even whittled furniture good god the judge panoply was pierced at last they tried to prove as you will remember that it was john who thus disfigured the bludgeon he always carried with pride but the argument was a sorry one and in itself would have broken down the prosecution had he been a man of better repute now those few chips taken from the handle of this weapon will carry a different significance for in my folly i asked to see this stick which still exists at police headquarters and there in the wood i detected and pointed out a trifle of steel which never came from the unbroken blades of the knife taken from john's pocket fallen was the proud head now and fallen the great man's aspect if he spoke it was to utter a low oliver oliver the pathos of it the heart-rending wonder in the tone brought the tears to deborah's eyes and made her last words very difficult but the one great thing which gives to these facts 
their really dangerous point is the mystery you have made of your life and of this so-called hermitage if you can clear that up you can afford to ignore the rest the misfortunes of my house was his sole response the misfortunes of my house end of chapter 23 Chapter Twenty Four of Dark Hollow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dark Hollow by Anna Catherine Green. Chapter Twenty Four. One secret less. Suddenly he faced Deborah again. The crisis of feeling had passed and he looked almost cold you have had advisers said he who are they i have talked with mr black the judge's brows met well you were wise said he then shortly what is his attitude feeling that her position was fast becoming intolerable she falteringly replied friendly to you and oliver but even without all the reasons which move me sharing my convictions he has told you so not directly but there was no misjudging his opinion of the necessity you were under to explain the mysteries of your life and it was yesterday we talked not today like words thrown into a void these slow lingering half uttered phrases seemed to awaken an echo which rung not only in his inmost being but in hers not till in both natures silence had settled again the silence of despair not peace did he speak when he did it was simply to breathe her name deborah startled for it had always before been madam she looked up to find him standing very near her and with his hand held out i am going through deep waters said he am i to have your support oh judge ostrander how can you doubt it she cried dropping her hand into his and her eyes swimming with tears but what can i do if i remain here i will be questioned if i fly but possibly that is what you want for me to go to disappear to take reuther and sink out of all men's sight forever if this is your wish i am ready to do it gladly will we be gone now at once this very night if you say so his disclaimer was peremptory no not that i ask no such sacrifice neither would it avail there is but one thing which can reinstate oliver and myself in the confidence and regard of these people cannot you guess it madam i mean your own restored conviction that the sentence passed upon john scoville was a just one once satisfied of this your temperament is such that you would be our advocate whether you wish to or not your very silence would be eloquent convince me i am willing to have you judge ostrander but how can you do so a shadow stands between my wishes and the belief you mention the shadow cast by oliver as he made his way towards the bridge with my husband's bludgeon in his hand did you see him strike the blow were there any opportune shadows to betray what happened between the instant of let us say oliver's approach and the fall of my friend much can happen in a minute and this matter is one of minutes granted that the shadow you saw was that of oliver and the stick he carried was the one under which algernon succumbed what is to hinder the following from having occurred the stick which oliver may have caught up in an absent frame of mind becomes burdensome he has broken his knife against the knot in the handle and he is provoked flinging the bludgeon down he hurries up the embankment and so on into town john scoville lurking in the bushes sees his stick fall and regains it at or near the time algernon etheridge steps into sight at the end of the bridge beyond dark hollow etheridge carries a watch greatly desired by the man who finds himself thus armed the place is quiet the impulse to possess himself of this watch is sudden and irresistible and the stick falls on etheridge's head is there anything impossible or even improbable about all this scoville had a heart open to crime oliver not this i knew when i sat upon the bench at his trial and now you shall know it too come 
I have something to show you. He turned towards the door, and mechanically she followed. Her thoughts were all in a whirl. She did not know what to make of him or of herself. The rooted dread of weeks was stirring in its soil. This suggestion of the transference of the stick from hand to hand was not impossible. Only Scoville had sworn to her, and that too upon their child's head, that he had not struck this blow. And she had believed him after finding the cap. And she believed him now. Yes, against her will, she believed him now. Why? And again, why? They had crossed the hall, and he was taking the turn to his room. Enter, said he, lifting the curtain. Involuntarily she recoiled, not from him, but from the revelation she felt to be awaiting her in this place of unguessed mystery. Looking back into the space behind her, she caught a fleeting glimpse of Reuther hovering on a distant threshold. Leaving the judge, without even a murmured word of apology, she ran to the child, embraced her, and promised to join her soon and then satisfied with the comfort thus gained she returned quickly to where the judge still awaited her with his hand on the curtain forgive me said she and meeting with no reply stood trembling while he unlocked the door and ushered her in a new leaf in the history of this old crime was about to be turned once within the room he became his courteous self once more be seated he begged indicating a chair in the half gloom as she took it, the room sprang into sudden light. He had pulled the string which regulated the curtains over the glazed panes in the ceiling. And then as quickly all was gloom again, he had let the string escape from his hand. Half-light is better, he muttered in vague apology. It was a weird beginning to an interview whose object was as yet incomprehensible to her. One minute a blinding glimpse of the room, whose details were so varied that many of them still remained unknown to her. The next, everything swept again into shadow, through which the tall form of the genius of the place loomed with melancholy suggestion. She was relieved when he spoke. Mrs. Scoville, not Deborah now, have you any confidence in Oliver's word? She did not reply at once. Too much depended upon a simple yes or no. Her first instinctive cry would have been yes, but if Oliver had been guilty, and yet held back his dreadful secret all these years, how could she believe his word when his whole life had been a lie? Has there ever been anything in his conversation, as you knew it in Detroit, to make you hesitate to reply? The judge persisted, as she continued speechless. No, nothing. I had every confidence in his assertions. I should have yet if it were not for this horror forget it for a moment recall his effect upon you as a man a prospective son-in-law for you meant him to marry reuther i trusted him i would trust him in many ways yet would you trust him enough to believe that he would tell you the truth if you asked him point-blank whether his hands were clean of crime yes the word came in a whisper but there was no wavering in it she had felt the conviction dart like an arrow through her mind that Oliver might slay a man in his hate, might even conceal his guilt for years, but that he could not lie about it when brought face to face with an accuser like herself. Then I will let you read something he wrote at my request these many years ago. An experience, the tale of one awful night, the horrors of which, locked within his mind and mine, have never been revealed to a third person. That you should share our secret now is not only necessary, but fitting. It becomes the widow of John Scoville to know what sort of a man she persists in regarding innocent. Wait here for me. With a quick step he wound his way among the various encumbering pieces of furniture to the door opening into his bedroom. A breathless moment ensued, during which he heard his key turn in the lock followed by the repeating sound of his footsteps, as he wended his way inside to a point she could only guess at from her knowledge of the room, to be a dresser in one of the corners. Here he lingered so long that, without any conscious volition of her own, almost in spite of her volition, which would have kept her where she was, she found herself on her feet, and then moving step by step more cautiously than he, in and out of huddling chairs and cluttering tables, 
till she came to a standstill before the reflection in some mirror no doubt of the judge's tall form bending not over the dresser as she had supposed but before a cupboard in the wall a cupboard she had never seen in a wall she had never seen but now recognized for the one hitherto concealed by the great carpet rug he had a roll of paper in his hand which he bundled together as he dropped the curtain back into place and then stopped to smooth it out over the floor with the precision of long habit all this she saw in the mirror as though she had been at his back in the other room but when she beheld him turn then panic seized her and she started breathlessly for the spot where he had left her glad that there was so little light and praying that he might be deaf to her steps which gently as they fell sounded portentously loud in her own ears she had reached her chair but she had not had time to reseat herself when she beheld him approaching with the bundle of loose sheets clutched in his hand i want you to sit here and read said he laying the manuscript down on a small table near the wall under a gas jet which he immediately lighted i'm going back to my own desk if you want to speak you may i shall not be working and she heard his footsteps retreating again in and out among the furniture till he reached his own chair and sat before his own table this ended all sound in the room except the beating of her own heart which had become tumultuous how could she sit there and read words with the blood pounding in her veins and her eyes half blind with terror and excitement it was only the necessity of the case which made it possible she knew that she would never be released from that spot until she had read what had been placed before her thank god the manuscript was legible oliver's handwriting possessed the clearness of print she had begun to read before she knew it and having begun she never paused till she reached the end i was fifteen it was my birthday and i had my own ideas of how i wanted to spend it my hobby was modeling my father had no sympathy with this hobby to him it was a waste of time better spent in study or such sports as would fit me for study but he had never absolutely forbidden me to exercise my talent in this way and when on the day i mention i had a few hours of freedom i decided to begin a piece of work of which i had long dreamed this was the remodeling in clay of an exquisite statue which had greatly aroused my admiration this statue stood in a forbidden place it was one of the art treasures of the great house on the bluff commonly called spencer's folly i had seen this marble once when dining there with father and was so impressed by its beauty that it haunted me night and day standing out white and wonderful in my imagination against backgrounds of endless variation to copy its lovely lines to caress with a creative hand those curves of beauty instinct as i then felt with soul became my one overmastering desire a desire which soon deepened into purpose the boy of fifteen would attempt the impossible i procured my clay and then awaited my opportunity it came as i have said on my birthday there was no one living in the house at this time mr spencer had gone west for the winter the servants had been dismissed and the place was closed only that morning i had heard one of his boon companions say oh jack's done for he's found a pretty widow in the sierras and there's no knowing now when we'll drink his health again in spencer's folly a statement which wakened but one picture in my mind and that was a long stretch of empty rooms teeming with art treasures amid which one gem rose supreme the gem which through his reckless carelessness i now proposed to make my own if loving fingers and the responsive clay would allow it what to every other person in town would have seen an insuperable obstacle to this undertaking was no obstacle to me i knew how to get in one day in my restless wandering about a place which had something of the nature of a shrine to me i had noticed that one of the windows a swinging one overlooking the ravine moved as the wind took it either the lock had given way or it had not been properly fastened if i could only bring myself to disregard the narrowness of the ledge separating the house from the precipice beneath i felt that i could reach this window and sever the vines sufficiently for my body to press in 
and this I did that night, finding, just as I had expected, that once a little force was brought to bear upon the sash, it yielded easily, offering a free passage to the delights within. In all this I experienced little fear, but once inside I began to realize the hazard of my adventure. As hanging at full length from the casement, I meditated on the drop I must take into what my dazed eyes looked like an absolute void. This taxed my courage, but after a moment of sheer fright I let myself go. I had to, and immediately found myself standing upright in a space so narrow I could touch the walls on either side. It was a closet I had entered, opening, as I soon discovered, into the huge dining hall where I had once sat beside my father at the one formal meal of my life. I remembered that room. It had made a great impression upon me, and some light finding its way through the panes of uncurtained glass which topped each of the three windows overlooking the ravine. I soon was able to find the door leading into the drawing-room. I had brought a small lantern in my bag, slung to my shoulders, but I had not hitherto dared to use it on account of the transparency of the panes I have mentioned. But once in the perfectly dark recesses of the room beyond, I drew it out, and without the least fear of detection, boldly turned it upon the small alcove where stood the object of my adoration. It was another instance of the reckless confidence of youth. I was on the verge of one of the most appalling adventures which could befall a man, and yet no premonition disturbed the ecstasy with which I knelt before the glimmering marble and unrolled my bundle of wet clay. I was not a complete fool. I only meant to attempt a miniature copy, but my presumption led me to expect it to be like, yes, like, oh, I never doubted it. But when, after a few minutes of rapturous contemplation of the proportions which have been the despair of all lesser adepts than the great sculptor who conceived them, I began my work, oh, then I began to realize a little the nature of the task I had undertaken, and to ask myself whether if I stayed all night I could finish it to my mind. It was during one of these moments of hesitation that I heard the first growl of distant thunder but it made little impression upon me, and I returned to my work with renewed glow, renewed hope. I felt so secure in my shell of darkness, with only the one small beam lighting up my model and my own fingers busy with the yielding clay. But the thunder growled again, and my head rose, this time in real alarm. Not because of that far-off struggle of the elements, with which I had nothing to do and hardly sensed, but because of a nearer sound, an indistinguishable yet strangely perturbing sound, suggesting a step. No, it was a voice, or if not a voice, some equally sure token of an approaching presence on the porch in front. Someone going by on the road two hundred feet away must have caught the gleam of my lantern through some unperceived crack in the parlour shutters. In another minute, I should hear a shout at the window, or perhaps the pounding of a heavy hand on the front door. I hated the interruption, but otherwise I was but little disturbed. Whoever it was, he could not by any chance find his way in. Nevertheless, I discreetly closed the shutter of my lantern, and began groping my way back to my own place of exit. I had reached the dining-room door, when the blood suddenly stopped in my veins. Another sound had reached my ear an unmistakable one this time, the rattling of a key in its lock. A man, two men, were entering by the great front door. They came in on a swoop of wind which seemed to carry everything before it. I heard a loud laugh, coarsened by drink, and the tipsy exclamation of a voice I knew. There, shut the door, can't you, before it's blown from its hinges. You'll find everything jolly here wine, light, solitude in which to finish our game, and a roaring good opportunity to sleep afterwards. No servants, no porters, not a soul to disturb us. This is my house, and it's a corker. I might be away for a year, and here there was a crackling of a match. I've only to use my night key to find everything a man wants right to my hand. The answer I failed to catch. I was simply paralyzed by terror. Should their way lay through the drawing-room? My clay? My tools were all lying there, and my unfinished model. Mr. Spencer was not an unkind man, but he was very drunk, and I had heard that whiskey makes a brute of the most good-natured. 
he would trample on my work perhaps he would destroy my tools and then hunt the house till he found me i did not know what to expect meantime lights began to flame up the room where i stood was no longer a safe refuge and creeping like a cat i began to move towards the closet door suddenly i made a dart for it the two men trampling heavily on the marble floor of the hall were coming my way i could hear their rude talk rude to me though one of them called himself a gentleman as the door of the room opened to admit them i succeeded in shutting that of the closet into which i had flung myself or almost so i did not dare to latch it for they were already in the room and might hear me this is the spot for us came in spencer's most jovial tones big table whiskey handy cards right here in my pocket wait till i strike a light but the lightning anticipated him as he spoke the walls which surrounded me the walls which surrounded them leaped into glaring view and i heard the second voice cry out i don't like that let's wait till the storm is over i can't play with such candles as those flaring about us damn it you won't know what candles you're playing by when once you see the pile i've got ready for you i'm in for a big bout you have ten dollars and i have a thousand i'll play you for that ten if in the meantime you get my thousand why it'll be because you're the better man i don't like it i say there see a flood of white light had engulfed the house my closet with its whitewashed walls flared about me like the mouth of a furnace see yourself came the careless retort and with the words a gas jet shot up then too then all the room contained how's that what's a flash more or less now i heard no answer only the slap of the cards as they were flung onto the table then the clatter of a key as it was turned in some distant lock and the quick question rum or whiskey irish or scotch whiskey and irish good but you'll drink it alone the bottles were brought forward as they sat down one on each side of the dusty mahogany table the man facing me was spencer the other sat with his back my way but i could now and then catch a glimpse of his profile as he started at some flash or lifted his head in terror of the thunderclaps we'll play till the hands point to three announced spencer taking out his watch and laying it down where both could see do you agree to that unless i win and your funds go a begging before the hour i agree the tone was harsh it was almost smothered the man was staring at the watch there was a strange set look to his figure a pausing as a thought of sinister thought i should now say then i never stopped to characterize it it was followed too quickly by a loud laugh and a sudden grab at the cards you'll win i feel it in my bones came in encouraging tones from the rich man if you do here the storm lulled and his voice sank to an encouraging whisper you can buy the old tavern up the road it's going for a song and then we'll be neighbors and can play play thunder a terrific peal it shook the house it shook my boyish heart but it no longer had the power to move the two gamesters the fever of play had reached its height and i heard nothing more from their lips but such phrases as belonged to the game why didn't i take advantage of their absorption to fly the sill above my head was within easy reach the sash was open and no sound that i could make would reach them in this hurly-burly of a storm why then with all this invitation to escape did i remain crouched in my dark retreat with eyes fixed on the narrow crack before me which under some impulse of movement in the walls about had widened sufficiently for me to see all that i have related i do not know unless i was hypnotized by the glare of expression on those men's faces i remember that it was my first glimpse of the human continence under the sway of wicked and absorbing passions hitherto my dreams had all been of beauty of lovely shapes or noble figures cast in heroic mould henceforth these ideal groups must visit my imagination mixed with the bulging eyes of greed and the contortions of hate masking their hideousness under false smiles or hiding them behind the motions of riotous jollity i was horrified i was sickened and i was frightened to the very soul but the fascination of the spectacle held me i watched the men and i watched the play and soon i forgot the tempest also or remembered it only when my small retreat flared into sudden whiteness or some gust heavier than the rest 
toppled the bricks from the chimneys above us and sent them crashing down upon the rain-soaked roof. The stranger was winning. I saw the heap of bills beside him grow and grow, while that of his opponent dwindled. I saw the latter smile, smile softly at each toss of his losings across the board, but there was no mirth in his smile, nor was there any common satisfaction in the way the other's hand closed over his gains. He will have it all, I thought. The Claymore Tavern will soon change owners. And I was holding my breath over the final stake, when suddenly the house gave a lurch, resettled, then lurched again. The tempest had become a hurricane, and with its first swoop a change took place in the stranger's luck. The bills which had all gone one way began slowly to recross the board, first singly, then in handfuls. They fell within Spencer's grasp, and the smile with which he hailed their return was not the smile with which he had seen them go, but a steady grin such as I beheld on the faces of sculptured demons. It frightened me, that smile. I could see nothing else. But when, at another crashing peal, I ducked my head, I found on lifting it that my eyes sought instinctively the rigid back of the stranger instead of the open face of Spencer. The passion of the winner was nothing to that of the loser, and from this moment on I saw but one figure, and thrilled to the one hope that an opportunity would soon come for me to see the face of the man whose back told such a tale of fury and suspense. But it remained fixed on Spencer and the cards. The roof might fall. He was past heeding. A bill or two only lay now at his elbow and I could perceive the further stiffening of his already rigid muscles as he dealt out the cards. Suddenly hard upon a rattling peal, which seemed to unite heaven and earth, I heard shouted out, Half past two! The game stops at three! Damn your greedy eyes! came back in a growl. Then all was still, fearfully still, both in the atmosphere outside and in that within, during which I caught sight of the stranger's hand moving slowly around to his back and returning as slowly forward, all under cover of the table-top and a stack of half-empty bottles. I was inexperienced. I knew nothing of the habits or the ways of such men as these. But the alarm of innocence in the face of untold, unsuspected, but intuitively felt evil, seized me at this stealthy movement. I tried to rise, tried to shriek, but could not, for events rushed upon us quicker than I could speak or move. I can buy the Claymore Tavern, can I? Well, I'm going to, rang out into the air, as the speaker leaped to his feet. Take that, you cheat, and that, and that, and the shots rang out, one, two, three. Spencer was dead in his folly. I had seen him rise, throw up his hands, and then fall in a heap among the cards and glasses. Silence. Not even heaven spoke. Then the man who stood there alone turned slightly and I saw his face. I have seen it many times since. I have seen it at Claymore Tavern, distorted up to this moment by a thousand emotions, all evil ones. It was calm now, with the realization of his act, and I could make no mistake as to his identity. Later I will mention his name. Glancing first at his victim and then at the pistol still smoking in his hand, he put the weapon back in his pocket and began gathering up the money for which he had just damned his soul. To get it all, he had to move an arm of the body sprawling along the board. But he did not appear to mind. When every bill was in his pockets, he reached out his hand for the watch. And then I saw him smile. He smiled as he shut the case. He smiled as he plunged it in after the bills. There was gloating in this smile. He seemed to have got what he wanted more than when he fingered the bills. I was stiff with horror. I was not conscious of noting these details, but I saw them every one. Small things make an impression when the mind is numb under the effects of a great blow. Next moment I woke to a realization of myself and all the danger of my own position. He was scanning very carefully the room about him. His eyes were traveling slowly very slowly but certainly in my direction i saw them pause concentrate their glances and fix them straight and full upon mine not that he saw me the crack through which we were peering each in our several ways was too narrow for that but the crack itself that was what he saw and the promise it gave of some room beyond i was a creature frozen 
but when he suddenly turned away instead of plunging toward me with his still smoking pistol i had the instinct to make a leap for the window over my head and clutch madly at its narrow sill in a wild attempt at escape but the effort ended precipitately terror had got me by the hair and terror made me look back the crack had widened still further and what i now saw through it glued me to the wall and held me there transfixed with dangling feet and starting eyeballs he was coming towards me a straining panting figure half carrying half dragging the dead man who flopped aside from his arms god what was i to do now how to meet those cold indifferent eyes filled only with thoughts of his own safety and see them flare again with murderous impulse and that impulse directed towards myself i couldn't meet them i couldn't stay but how fly when not a muscle responded i had to stay hanging from the sill and praying praying till my senses blurred and i knew nothing till on a sudden they cleared again and i woke to the blessed realization that the door had been pushed against my slender figure hiding it completely from his sight and that this door was now closed again and this time tightly and i was safe safe the relief sent the perspiration in a reek from every pore but the icy revulsion came quickly as i drew up my knees to get a better purchase on the sill heaven's torch was suddenly lit up and the closet became a pit of dazzling whiteness amid which i saw the blot of that dead body with its head propped against the wall and eyes remember i was but fifteen the legs were hunched up and almost touched mine i could feel them though there was no contact pushing me forcing me from my frail support would it lighten again would i have to see no any risk first the window i no longer thought of it it was too remote too difficult the door the door there was my way the only way which would rid me instantly of any proximity to this hideous object i flung myself at it found the knob turned it and yelled aloud my foot had brushed against him i knew the difference and it sent me palpitating over the threshold but no further love of life had returned with my escape from that awful prison house and i halted in the semi-darkness into which i had plunged thanking heaven for the thunder peal which had drowned my loud cry for i was not yet safe he was still there he had turned out all lights but one but this was sufficient to show me his tall figure straining up to put out this last jet another instant and darkness enveloped the whole place he had not seen me and was going i could hear the sound of his feet as he went stumbling in his zigzag course towards the door then every sound both on his part and on mine was lost in a swoop of downfalling rain and i remember nothing more till out of the blankness before me he started again into view within the open doorway where in the glare of what he called heaven's candles he stood poising himself to meet the gale which seemed ready to catch him up and whirl him with other inconsequent things into the void of nothingness then darkness settled again and i was left alone with murder all the innocence of my youth gone and my soul a very charnel house i had to re-enter that closet i had to take the only means of escape preferred but i went through it as we go through the horrors of nightmare my muscles obeyed my volition but my sensibilities were no longer active how i managed to draw myself up to that slippery sill all reeking now with rain or save myself from falling to my death in the whirling blast that carried everything about me into the ravine below i do not know i simply did it and escaped all lightning flash and falling limb and the lasso of swirling winds to find myself at last lying my full length along the bridge amid a shock of elements such as nature seldom sports with here i clung for i was breathless waiting with head buried in my arm for the rain to abate before i attempted a further escape from the place which held such horror for me but no abatement came and feeling the bridge shaking under me almost to cracking i began to crawl inch by inch along its gaping boards till i reached its middle there god stopped me for with a clangor as of rending worlds a bolt hot from the zenith sped down upon the bluff behind me throwing me down again upon my face and engulfing sense and understanding for one wild moment 
Then I sprang upright, and with a yell of terror sped across the rocking boards beneath me to the road, no longer battling with my desire to look back, no longer asking myself when and how that dead man would be found, no longer even asking my own duty in the case, for Spencer's folly was on fire, and the crime I had just seen perpetrated there would soon be a crime stricken from the sight of men forever. In the flare of its tremendous burning, I found my way up through the forest road to my home and into my father's presence. He, like everybody else, was up that night, and already alarmed at my continued absence. Spencer's folly is on fire, I cried, as he cast dismayed eyes at my pallid and dripping figure. If you go to the door you can see it. But I told him nothing more. Perhaps other boys of my age can understand my silence. I not only did not tell my father, but I told nobody even after the discovery of Spencer's charred body in the closet so miraculously preserved. With every day that passed, it became harder to part with this baleful secret. I felt it corroding my thoughts and destroying my spirits, and yet I kept still. Only my taste for modeling was gone. I have never touched clay since. Claymore Tavern did change owners. When I heard that a man by the name of Scoville had bought it, I went over to see Scoville. He was the man. Then I began to ask myself what I ought to do with my knowledge, and the more I asked myself this question, and the more I brooded over the matter, the less did I feel like taking not the public, but my father, into my confidence. I had never doubted his love for me, but I had always stood in great awe of his reproof, and I did not know where I was to find courage to tell him all the details of this adventure. There is one thing I did do, however. I made certain inquiries here and there, and soon satisfied myself as to how Scoville had been able to come into town, commit this horrid deed, and escape, without anyone but myself being the wiser. Spencer and he had come from the west, en route to New York, without any intention of stopping off in Shelby. But once involved in play, they got so interested that when within a few miles of the town, Spencer proposed that they should leave the train and finish the game in his own house. Whether circumstances aided them, or Spencer took some extraordinary precautions against being recognized, will never be known. But certain it is that he escaped all observation at the station and even upon the road. When Scoville returned alone, the storm had reached such a height that the roads were deserted and he being an entire stranger here at that time, naturally attracted no attention, and so was able to slip away on the next train with just the drawback of buying a new ticket. I, a boy of fifteen, trespassing where I did not belong, was the only living witness of what had happened on this night of dreadful storm in the house which was now a ruin. I realized the unpleasantness of the position in which this put me, but not its responsibility. Scoville, ignorant that any other breast than his own held the secret of that hour of fierce temptation and murder naturally scented no danger and rejoiced without stint in his new acquisition what evil might i not draw down upon myself by disturbing him in it at this late day if i were going to do anything i should have done it at first so i reasoned and let the matter slide i became interested in school and study and the years passed and I had almost forgotten the occurrence when suddenly the full remembrance came back upon me with a rush. A man, my father's friend, was found murdered in sight of the spot of old-time horror, and Scoville was accused of the act. I was older now, and saw my fault in all its enormity. I was guilty of that crime, or so I felt in the first heat of my sorrow and despair. I may even have said so, in dreams, or in some of my self-absorbed broodings. Though I certainly had not lifted the stick against Mr. Etheridge, I had left the hand free which did, and this was a sufficient occasion for remorse, or so I truly felt. I was so affected by the thought that even my father, with his own weight of troubles, noticed my careworn face, and asked me for an explanation. But I held him off until the verdict was reached, and then I told him. I had not liked his looks for some time. They seemed to convey some doubt of the justice of this man's sentence, and I felt that if he had such doubts, 
they might be eased by this certainty of Scoville's murderous tendencies and unquestionable greed. And they were. But as Scoville was already doomed, we decided it was unnecessary to make public his past offenses. However, with an eye upon future contingencies, my father exacted from me in writing this full account of my adventure, which with all the solemnity of an oath I here declare to be the true story of what befell me in the house called Spencer's Folly, on the night of awful storm, September 11th, 1895. Oliver Ostrander. Witnesses to above signature, Archibald Ostrander, Bella Jefferson. Shelby, November 7th, 1898.